Section 14 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. Lincoln at Niagara. Secures a patent for an invention. Abandons politics and decides to devote himself to the law. It was late in September when Lincoln started westward from his campaigning in New England. He stopped in Albany, New York, and in company with Thurlow Weed, called on Fillmore, then candidate for vice president. From Albany he went to Niagara. Mr. Herndon once asked him what made the deepest impression on him when he stood before the falls. The thing that struck me most forcibly when I saw the falls, he responded, was where in the world did all that water come from the memory of niagara remained with him and aroused many speculations among various notes for lectures which nicolay and hay found among mr lincoln's papers after his death and published in his complete works is a fragment on niagara which shows how deeply his mind was stirred by the majesty of that mighty wonder niagara falls by what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon niagara falls there is no mystery about the thing itself every effect is just as any intelligent man knowing the causes would anticipate without seeing it if the water moving onward in a great river reaches a point where there is a perpendicular jog of a hundred feet in descent in the bottom of the river it is plain the water will have a violent and continuous plunge at that point it is also plain the water thus plunging will foam and roar and send up a mist continuously in which last during sunshine there will be perpetual rainbows the mere physical of niagara falls is only this yet this is really a very small part of that world's wonder its power to excite reflection and emotion is its great charm the geologist will demonstrate that the plunge or fall was once at lake ontario and has worn its way back to its present position he will ascertain how fast it is wearing now and so get a basis for determining how long it has been wearing back from lake ontario and finally demonstrate by it that this world is at least fourteen thousand years old a philosopher of a slightly different turn will say niagara falls is only the lip of the basin out of which pours all the surplus water which rains down on two or three hundred thousand square miles of the earth's surface he will estimate with approximate accuracy that five hundred thousand tons of water fall with their full weight a distance of a hundred feet each minute thus exerting a force equal to the lifting of the same weight through the same space in the same time but still there is more it calls up the indefinite past when columbus first sought this continent when christ suffered on the cross when moses led israel through the red sea nay even when adam first came from the hand of his maker then as now niagara was roaring here the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of america have gazed on niagara as ours do now contemporary with the first race of men and older than the first man niagara is strong and fresh to-day as ten thousand years ago the mammoth and mastodon so long dead that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that they ever lived have gazed on niagara in that long long time never still for a single moment never dried never froze never slept never rested in his trip westward to springfield from niagara there occurred an incident which started lincoln's mind on a new line of thought one which all that fall divided it with politics it happened that the boat by which he made part of the trip stranded in shallow water the devices employed to float her interested lincoln much he no doubt recalled the days when on the ohio the mississippi and the sangamon he had seen his own or neighbor's boats stuck on a sandbar for hours even days was there no way that these vexatious delays could be prevented in shallow streams he set himself resolutely at the task of inventing a practical device for getting boats over shoals when he reached springfield he began to build a model representing his idea 
he showed the deepest interest in the work and mr herndon says he would sometimes bring the model into his office and while whittling on it would talk of its merits and the revolution it was going to work on the western rivers when lincoln returned to washington he took the model with him and through mr z c robbins a lawyer of washington secured a patent he walked into my office one morning with a model of a western steamboat under his arm says mr robbins after a friendly greeting he placed his model on my office table and proceeded to explain the principles embodied therein that he believed to be his own invention and which if new he desired to secure by letters patent during my former residence in st louis i had made myself thoroughly familiar with everything appertaining to the construction and equipment of the flat-bottomed steamboats that were adapted to the shallow rivers of our western and southern states and therefore i was able speedily to come to the conclusion that mr lincoln's proposed improvements of that class of vessels was new and patentable and i so informed him thereupon he instructed me to prepare the necessary drawings and papers and prosecute an application for a patent for his invention at the united states patent office i complied with his instructions and in due course of proceedings procured for him a patent that fully covered all the distinguishing features of his improved steamboat the identical model that mr lincoln brought to my office can now be seen in the united states patent office but it was only his leisure which lincoln spent in the fall of eighteen forty eight on his invention all through october and the first days of november he was speaking up and down the state for taylor his zeal was rewarded in november by the election of the whig ticket and a few weeks later he went back to washington for the final session of the thirtieth congress he went back resolved to do something regarding slavery he seems to have seen but two things at that moment which could constitutionally be done the first was to allow the slaveholder no more ground than he had to accomplish this he continued to vote for the wilmot proviso the second was to abolish slavery in the district of columbia over ten years before in eighteen thirty seven lincoln had declared in the assembly of illinois that the congress of the united states had the power under the constitution to abolish slavery in the district of columbia but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district when he went to washington in eighteen forty seven he found a condition of things which made him feel that congress ought to exercise the power it had there had existed for years in the city a slave market a sort of negro livery stable where droves of negroes were collected temporarily kept and finally taken to southern markets precisely like droves of horses lincoln said in describing it in later years and this frightful place was in view from the windows of the capitol morally and intellectually shocked and irritated by this spectacle lincoln brooded over it until now in the second session of his term he decided to ask that congress exercise the power he had affirmed ten years before belonged to it and on january sixteenth eighteen forty nine he drew up and presented a bill to abolish slavery in the district of columbia with the consent of the voters of the district and with compensation to owners the bill caused a noise in the house but came to naught as indeed at that date any similar bill was bound to do it showed however more plainly than anything lincoln had done so far in congress his fearlessness when his convictions were aroused the inauguration of taylor on march fourth eighteen forty nine ended lincoln's congressional career the principal turnabout is fair play which he had insisted on in eighteen forty six when working for the nomination for himself he regarded as quite as applicable now it was not because he did not desire to return to congress i made the declaration that i would not be a candidate again he wrote herndon in january eighteen forty eight more from a wish to deal fairly with others to keep peace among our friends and to keep the district from going to the enemy than from any cause personal to myself so that if it should so happen that nobody else wishes to be elected i could not refuse the people the right of sending me again but to enter myself as a competitor of others or to authorize any one so to enter me is what my word and honor forbid 
and yet he was not willing to leave public life the term in congress had only increased his fondness for politics it had given him a touch of that fever for public office from which so few men who have served in congress ever entirely recover the whigs owed much to him and there was a general disposition to gratify any reasonable ambition he might have i believe that so far as the whigs in congress are concerned i could have the general land office almost by common consent he wrote speed but then sweet and don morrison and browning and cyrus edwards all want it and what is worse while i think i could easily take it myself i fear i shall have trouble to get it for any other man in illinois although he feared his efforts would be useless he pledged his support to his friend cyrus edwards while lincoln was looking after edwards interests a candidate appeared who was most objectionable to the whigs general justin butterfield lincoln did all he could to defeat butterfield save the one thing necessary ask the position for himself this he would not do until he learned that edwards had no chance then he applied but it was too late butterfield had secured the office while lincoln had been holding back when edwards found that lincoln had finally applied for the place he accused him of treachery lincoln was deeply hurt by the suspicion the better part of one's life consists of his friendships he wrote to judge gillespie and of them mine with mr edwards was one of the most cherished i have not been false to it at a word i could have had the office any time before the department was committed to mr butterfield at least mr ewing and the president say as much that word i forbore to speak partly for other reasons but chiefly for mr edwards's sake losing the office that he might gain it i was always for him but to lose his friendship by the effort for him would oppress me very much were i not sustained by the utmost consciousness of rectitude i first determined to be an applicant unconditionally on the second of june and i did so then upon being informed by a telegraphic dispatch that the question was narrowed down to mr b and myself and that the cabinet had postponed the appointment three weeks for my benefit not doubting that mr edwards was wholly out of the question i nevertheless would not then have become an applicant had i supposed he would thereby be brought to suspect me of treachery to him two or three days afterwards a conversation with levi davis convinced me mr edwards was dissatisfied but i was then too far in to get out his own letter written on the twenty fifth of april after i had fully informed him of all that had passed up to within a few days of that time gave assurance that i had that entire confidence from him which i felt my uniform and strong friendship for him entitled me to among other things it says whatever course your judgment may dictate as proper to be pursued shall never be accepted by me i also had had a letter from washington saying chambers of the republic had brought a rumor there that mr e had declined in my favor which rumor i judged came from mr e himself as i had not then breathed of his letter to any living creature in saying i had never before the second of june determined to be an applicant unconditionally i mean to admit that before then i had said substantially i would take the office rather than it should be lost to the state or given to one in the state whom the whigs did not want but i aver that in every instance in which i spoke of myself i intended to keep and now believe i did keep mr e above myself mr edwards first suspicion was that i had allowed baker to overreach me as his friend in behalf of don morrison i know this was a mistake and the result has proved it i understand his view now is that if i had gone to open war with baker i could have ridden him down and had the thing all my own way i believe no such thing with baker and some strong man from the military tract and elsewhere for morrison and we and some strong men from the wabash and elsewhere for mr e it was not possible for either to succeed i believed this in march and i know it now the only thing which gave either any chance was the very thing baker and i proposed an adjustment with themselves you may wish to know how butterfield finally beat me 
i cannot tell you particulars now but will when i see you in the meantime let it be understood that i am not greatly dissatisfied i wish the office had been so bestowed as to encourage our friends in future contests and i regret exceedingly mr edwards feelings towards me these two things away i should have no regrets at least i think i would not it was not until eleven years later that edwards forgave lincoln then at judge gillespie's request he promised to bury the hatchet with lincoln and to enter the campaign for him lincoln declared that he had no regrets about the way the general land office went but if he had not his whig friends in washington had they determined to do something for him and in the summer of eighteen forty nine summoned him to the capital to urge him to accept the governorship of oregon the territory would soon be a state it was believed and lincoln would then undoubtedly be chosen to represent it in the united states senate unquestionably a splendid political prospect was thus opened many of lincoln's friends advised him to accept his wife however disliked the idea of life in the far west and on her account he refused the place the events of the summer of eighteen forty nine seemed to lincoln to end his political career he had no time to brood over his situation however the necessity of earning a livelihood was too imperative his financial obligations were in fact considerable the old debt for the new salem store still hung over him he had a growing family and his father and mother who were still living in coles county whither they had moved in eighteen thirty one were dependent upon him for many of the necessaries as well as all the comforts of their lives at intervals ever since he had left home he had helped them now by saving their land from the foreclosing of a mortgage now by paying their doctor's bills now by adding to the cheerfulness of their home he was equally kind to his other relatives visiting them and aiding them in various ways among these relatives were two cousins abraham and mordecai the sons of his uncle mordecai lincoln who lived in hancock county in his congressional district at quincy also in his district lived with his family a brother of his mother joseph hanks lincoln never went to quincy without going to see his uncle joseph and uncle joe's jake as he called one of his cousins on these occasions writes one of the latter's family mr j m hanks of florence colorado mirth and jollity abounded for mr lincoln indulged his bent of story-telling to the utmost until a late hour his half-brother john johnston he aided for many years his help did not always take the form of money johnston was shiftless and always in debt and consequently restless and discontented in eighteen fifty one he was determined to borrow money or sell his farm and move to missouri he proposed to mr lincoln that he lend him eighty dollars mr lincoln answered what i propose is that you shall go to work tooth and nail for somebody who will give you money for it i now promise you that for every dollar you will between this and the first of may get for your own labor either in money or as your own indebtedness i will then give you one other dollar in this i do not mean you shall go off to st louis or the lead mines or the gold mines in california but i mean for you to go at it for the best wages you can get close to home in coles county now if you will do this you will soon be out of debt and what is better you will have a habit that will keep you from getting in debt again but if i should now clear you out of debt next year you would be just as deep in as ever you say you would almost give your place in heaven for seventy or eighty dollars then you value your place in heaven very cheap for i am sure you can with the offer i make get the seventy or eighty dollars for four or five months work a few months later lincoln wrote johnston in regard to his contemplated move to missouri what can you do in missouri better than here is the land any richer can you there any more than here raise corn and wheat and oats without work will anybody there any more than here do your work for you if you intend to go to work there is no better place than right where you are if you do not intend to go to work you cannot get along anywhere squirming and crawling about from place to place can do no good 
you have raised no crop this year and what you really want is to sell the land get the money and spend it part with the land you have and my life upon it you will never own a spot big enough to bury you in half you will get for the land you will spend in moving to missouri and the other half you will eat drink and wear out and no foot of land will be bought now i feel it my duty to have no hand in such a piece of foolery all this plain advice did not prevent johnston trying to sell a small piece of land on which mr lincoln had paid the mortgage in order to secure it to his stepmother during her life when mr lincoln received this proposition he replied your proposal about selling the east forty acres of land is all that i want or could claim for myself but i am not satisfied with it on mother's account i want her to have her living and i feel that it is my duty to some extent to see that she is not wronged she had a right of dower that is the use of one-third for life in the other two forties but it seems she has already let you take that hook and line she now has the use of the whole east forty as long as she lives and if it be sold of course she is entitled to the interest on all the money it brings as long as she lives but you propose to sell it for three hundred dollars take one hundred away with you and leave her two hundred at eight per cent making her the enormous sum of sixteen dollars a year now if you are satisfied with treating her in that way i am not it is true that you are to have that forty for two hundred dollars at mother's death but you are not to have it before i am confident that land can be made to produce for mother at at least thirty dollars a year and i cannot to oblige any living person consent that she be put on an allowance of sixteen dollars a year it was these obligations which made lincoln resume at once the practice of the law he decided to remain in springfield although he had an opportunity to go in with a well-established chicago lawyer for many reasons life in springfield was satisfactory to him he had bought a home there in eighteen forty four and was deeply attached to it there too he was surrounded by scores of friends who had known him since his first appearance in the town and to many of whom he was related by marriage and he had the good will of the community in short he was a part of springfield the very children knew him for there was not one of them for whom he had not done some kind deed my first strong impression of mr lincoln says a lady of springfield was made by one of his kind deeds i was going with a little friend for my first trip alone on the railroad cars it was an epoch of my life i had planned for it and dreamed of it for weeks the day i was to go came but as the hour of the train approached the hackman through some neglect failed to call for my trunk as the minutes went on i realized in a panic of grief that i should miss the train i was standing by the gate my hat and gloves on sobbing as if my heart would break when mr lincoln came by why what's the matter he asked and i poured out all my story how big's the trunk there's still time if it isn't too big and he pushed through the gate and up to the door my mother and i took him up to my room where my little old-fashioned trunk stood locked and tied oh ho he cried wipe your eyes and come on quick and before i knew what he was going to do he had shouldered the trunk was downstairs and striding out of the yard down the street he went fast as his long legs could carry him i trotting behind drying my tears as i went we reached the station in time mr lincoln put me on the train kissed me good-bye and told me to have a good time it was just like him this sensitiveness to a child's wants made mr lincoln a most indulgent father he continually carried his boys about with him and their pranks even when they approached rebellion seemed to be an endless delight to him like most boys they loved to run away and the neighbors of the lincolns tell many tales of mr lincoln's captures of the culprits one of the prettiest of all these is a story told of an escape willie once made when three or four years old from the hands of his mother who was giving him a tubbing he scampered out of the door without the vestige of a garment on him flew up the street slipped under a fence into a great green field and took across it 
mr lincoln was sitting on the porch and discovered the pink and white runaway as he was cutting across the greensward he stood up laughing aloud while the mother entreated him to go in pursuit then he started in chase halfway across the field he caught the child and gathering him up in his long arms he covered his rosy form with kisses then mounting him on his back the chubby legs around his neck he rode him back to his mother and his tub it was a frequent custom with lincoln this of carrying his children on his shoulders he rarely went down street that he did not have one of his younger boys mounted on his shoulder while another hung to the tail of his long coat the antics of the boys with their father and the species of tyranny they exercised over him are still subjects of talk in springfield mr roland diller who was a neighbor of mr lincoln tells one of the best of the stories he was called to the door one day by hearing a great noise of children crying and there was mr lincoln striding by with the boys both of whom were wailing aloud why mr lincoln what's the matter with the boys he asked just what's the matter with the whole world lincoln replied i've got three walnuts and each wants two another of lincoln's springfield acquaintances the rev mr alcott of elgin illinois tells of seeing him coming away from church unusually early one sunday morning the sermon could not have been more than halfway through says mr alcott tad was slung across his left arm like a pair of saddlebags and mr lincoln was striding along with long and deliberate steps toward his home on one of the street corners he encountered a group of his fellow townsmen mr lincoln anticipated the question which was about to be put by the group and taking his figure of speech from practices with which they were only too familiar said gentlemen i entered this colt but he kicked around so i had to withdraw him there was no institution in springfield in which lincoln had not taken an active interest in the first years of his residence and now that he had decided to remain in the town he resumed all his old relations from the daily visits to the drug stores on the public square which were the recognized rendezvous of springfield politicians and lawyers to his weekly attendance at the first presbyterian church that he was as regular in his attendance on the latter as on the former all his old neighbors testify in fact lincoln all his life went regularly to church the serious attention which he gave the sermons he heard is shown in a well-authenticated story of a visit he made in eighteen thirty seven with a company of friends to a camp meeting held six miles west of springfield at the salem church the sermon on this occasion was preached by one of the most vigorous and original individuals in the pulpit of that day the rev dr peter akers in this discourse was a remarkable and prophetic passage long remembered by those who heard it the speaker prophesied the downfall of castes the end of tyrannies and the crushing out of slavery as lincoln and his friends returned home there was a long discussion of the sermon it was the most instructive sermon and he is the most impressive preacher i have ever heard lincoln said it is wonderful that god has given such power to men i firmly believe his interpretation of prophecy so far as i understand it and especially about the breaking down of civil and religious tyrannies and odd as it may seem when he described those changes and revolutions i was deeply impressed that i should be somehow strangely mixed up with them if lincoln was not at this period a man of strictly orthodox beliefs he certainly was if we accept his own words profoundly religious in the letters which passed between lincoln and speed in eighteen forty one and eighteen forty two when the two men were doubting their own hearts and wrestling with their disillusions and forebodings lincoln frequently expressed the idea to speed that the almighty had sent their suffering for a special purpose when speed finally acknowledged himself happily married lincoln wrote to him i always was superstitious i believe god made me one of the instruments of bringing your fanny and you together which union i have no doubt he had foreordained then referring to his own troubled heart he added whatever he designs he will do for me yet stand still and see the salvation of the lord is my text just now <laughs> 
only a few months after lincoln decided to settle permanently in springfield his father thomas lincoln fell dangerously ill lincoln in writing to john johnston his half-brother said i sincerely hope father may recover his health but at all events tell him to remember to call upon and confide in our great and good and merciful maker who will not turn away from him in any extremity he notes the fall of a sparrow and numbers the hairs of our heads and he will not forget the dying man who puts his trust in him lincoln's return to the law was characterized by a marked change in his habits he gave much more attention to study than he ever had before his colleagues in springfield and on the circuit noticed this change after court closed in the town on the circuit and the lawyers were gathered in the bar-room or on the veranda of the tavern telling stories and chaffing one another lincoln would join them though often but for a few minutes he would tell a story as he passed and while they were laughing at its climax would slip away to his room to study frequently this work was carried on far into the night placing a candle on a chair at the head of the bed says mr herndon he would study for hours i have known him to study in this position until two o'clock in the morning meanwhile i and the others who chanced to occupy the same room would be safely and soundly asleep although he worked so late he was in the habit of rising earlier than his brothers of the bar says judge weldon on such occasions he was wont to sit by the fire having uncovered the coals and muse ponder and soliloquize but it was not only the law that occupied him he began a serious course of general education studying mathematics astronomy poetry as regularly as a schoolboy who had lessons to recite in the winter of eighteen forty nine fifty he even joined a club of a dozen gentlemen of springfield who had begun the study of german the meetings of the class being held in his office much of lincoln's devotion to study at this period was due to his desire to bring himself in general culture up to the men whom he had been meeting in the east no man ever realized his own deficiencies in knowledge and experience more deeply than abraham lincoln nor made a braver struggle to correct them he often acknowledged to his friends the consciousness he had of his own limitations in the simplest matters of life mr h c whitney one of his old friends gives a pathetic example of this once on the circuit his friends missed him after supper when he returned someone asked him where he had been well i have been to a little show up at the academy he said he sat before the fire says mr whitney and narrated all the sights of that most primitive of county shows given chiefly to school children next night he was missing again the show was still in town and he stole in as before and entertained us with a description of new sights a magic lantern electrical machine etc i told him i had seen all these sights at school yes he said sadly i now have an advantage over you for the first time in my life seeing these things which are of course common to those who had what i did not a chance at an education when they were young it was to make up for the chance at an education which he did not have in youth that abraham lincoln at forty years of age after having earned the reputation of being one of the ablest politicians in illinois spent his leisure End of section 14. Section 15 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15. Lincoln on the Circuit. His Humor and Persuasiveness. His Manner of Preparing Cases, Examining Witnesses, and Addressing Juries when in eighteen forty nine lincoln decided to abandon politics finally and to devote himself to the law he had been practicing for thirteen years in spite of the many interruptions electioneering and office-holding had caused he was well established rejoining his partner herndon the firm of lincoln and herndon had only been a name during lincoln's term in washington he took up the law with a singleness of purpose which had never before characterized his practice lincoln's headquarters were in springfield but his practice was itinerant 
the arrangements for the administration of justice in illinois in the early days were suited to the conditions of the country the state being divided into judicial circuits including more or less territory according to the population to each circuit a judge was appointed who each spring and fall travelled from county seat to county seat to hold court with the judge travelled a certain number of the best-known lawyers of the district each lawyer had of course a permanent office in one of the county seats and often at several of the others he had partners usually young men of little experience for whom he acted as a counsel in special cases this peripatetic court prevailed in illinois until the beginning of the fifties but for many years after when the towns had grown so large that a clever lawyer might have enough to do in his own county a few lawyers lincoln among them who from long association felt that the circuit was their natural habitat refused to leave it the circuit which lincoln travelled was known as the eighth judicial circuit it included fifteen counties in eighteen forty five though the territory has since been divided into more it was about one hundred and fifty miles long as by many broad there were no railroads in the eighth circuit until about eighteen fifty four and the court travelled on horseback or in carriages lincoln had no horse in the early days of his practice it was his habit then to borrow one or to join in a company of a half dozen or more in hiring a three-seated spring wagon later he owned a turnout of his own which figures in nearly all the traditions of the eighth circuit the horse being described as pokey and the buggy as rattling there was much that was irritating and uncomfortable in the circuit riding of the illinois court but there was more which was amusing to a temperament like lincoln's the freedom the long days in the open air the unexpected if trivial adventures the meeting with wayfarers and settlers all was an entertainment to him he found humor and human interest on the route where his companions saw nothing but commonplaces he saw the ludicrous in an assemblage of fowls says h c whitney one of his fellow itinerants in a man spading his garden in a clothesline full of clothes in a group of boys in a lot of pigs rooting at a mill door in a mother duck teaching her brood to swim in everything and anything the sympathetic observations of these long rides furnished humorous settings for some of his best stories if frequently on these trips he fell into sombre reveries and rode with head bent ignoring his companions generally he took part in all the frolicking which went on joining in practical jokes singing noisily with the rest sometimes even playing a jew's harp when the county seat was reached the bench and bar quickly settled themselves in the town tavern it was usually a large two-story house with big rooms and long verandas there was little exclusiveness possible in these hostelries ordinarily judge and lawyer slept two in a bed and three or four beds in a room they ate at the common table with jurors witnesses prisoners out on bail travelling peddlers teamsters and labourers the only attempt at classification on the landlord's part was seating the lawyers in a group at the head of the table most of them accepted this distinction complacently lincoln however seemed to be indifferent to it one day when he had come in and seated himself at the foot with the fourth estate the landlord called to him you're in the wrong place mr lincoln come up here have you anything better to eat up there joe he inquired quizzically if not i'll stay here the accommodations of the taverns were often unsatisfactory the food poorly cooked the beds hard lincoln accepted everything with uncomplaining good nature though his companions habitually growled at the hardships of the life it was not only repugnance to criticism which might hurt others it was the indifference of one whose thoughts were always busy with problems apart from physical comfort who had little notion of the so-called refinements of life and almost no sense of luxury and ease the judge naturally was the leading character in these nomadic groups he received all the special consideration the democratic spirit of the inhabitants bestowed on any one and controlled his privacy and his time to a degree 
judge david davis who from eighteen forty eight presided over the eighth circuit as long as mr lincoln travelled it was a man of unusual force of character of large learning quick impulses and strong prejudices lincoln was from the beginning of their association a favourite with judge davis unless he joined the circle which the judge formed in his room after supper his honour was impatient and distraught interrupting the conversation constantly by demanding where's lincoln why don't lincoln come and when lincoln did come the judge would draw out story after story quieting everybody who interrupted with an impatient mr lincoln's talking if any one came to the door to see the host in the midst of one of lincoln's stories he would send a lawyer into the hall to see what was wanted and as soon as the door closed order lincoln to go ahead the appearance of the court in a town was invariably a stimulus to its social life in all of the county seats there were a few fine homes of which the dignity spaciousness and elegance still impressed the traveller through illinois the hospitality of these houses was generous dinners receptions and suppers followed one another as soon as the court began lincoln was a favourite figure at all these gatherings his favourite field however was the court the courthouses of illinois in which he practised were not log houses as has been frequently taken for granted it is not probable says a leading member of the illinois bar mr lincoln ever saw a log courthouse in central illinois where he practised law unless he saw one in decatur in macon county in a conversation between three members of the supreme court of illinois all of whom had been born in this state and had lived in it all their lives and who were certainly familiar with the central portions of the state all declared they had never seen a log courthouse in the state the courthouses in which lincoln practised were stiff old-fashioned wood or brick structures usually capped by cupola or tower and fronted by verandas with huge doric or ionic pillars they were furnished inside in the most uncompromising style hard white walls unpainted woodwork pine floors wooden benches usually they were heated by huge franklin stoves with yards of stovepipe running wildly through the air searching for an exit and threatening momentarily to unjoint and tumble in sections few of the lawyers had offices in the town and a corner of the courtroom the shade of a tree in the courtyard a sunny side of a building were where they met with their clients and transacted business in the courts themselves there was a certain indifference to formality engendered by the primitive surroundings which however the judges never allowed to interfere with the seriousness of the work lincoln habitually when not busy whispered stories to his neighbors frequently to the annoyance of judge davis if lincoln persisted too long the judge would rap on the chair and exclaim come come mr lincoln i can't stand this there is no use trying to carry on two courts i must adjourn mine or you yours and i think you will have to be the one as soon as the group had scattered the judge would call one of the men to him and ask what was that lincoln was telling i was never fined but once for contempt of court says one of the clerks of the court in lincoln's day davis fined me five dollars mr lincoln had just come in and leaning over my desk had told me a story so irresistibly funny that i broke out into a loud laugh the judge called me to order in haste saying this must be stopped mr lincoln you are constantly disturbing this court with your stories then to me you may find yourself five dollars for your disturbance i apologized but told the judge that the story was worth the money in a few minutes the judge called me to him what was the story lincoln told you he asked i told him and he laughed aloud in spite of himself remit your fine he ordered the partiality of judge davis for lincoln was shared by the members of the court generally the unaffected friendliness and helpfulness of his nature had more to do with this than his wit and cleverness if there was a new clerk in court a stranger unused to the ways of the place lincoln was the first sometimes the only one to shake hands with him and congratulate him on his election 
no lawyer on the circuit was more unassuming than was mr lincoln says one who practised with him he arrogated to himself no superiority over any one not even the most obscure member of the bar he treated every one with that simplicity and kindness that friendly neighbors manifest in their relations with one another he was remarkably gentle with young lawyers becoming permanent residents at the several county seats in the circuit where he had practised for so many years the result was he became the much beloved senior member of the bar no young lawyer ever practised in the courts with mr lincoln who did not in all his after life have a regard for him akin to personal affection i remember with what confidence i always went to him says judge lawrence weldon who first knew lincoln at the bar in eighteen fifty four because i was certain he knew all about the matter and would most cheerfully help me i can see him now through the decaying memories of thirty years standing in the corner of the old courtroom and as i approached him with a paper i did not understand he said wait until i fix this plug of my gallus and i will pitch into that like a dog at a root while speaking he was busily engaged in trying to connect his suspenders with his pants by making a plug perform the function of a button if for any reason lincoln was absent from court he was missed perhaps as no other man on the eighth circuit would have been and his return greeted joyously he was not less happy to rejoin his friends ain't you glad i've come he would call out as he came up to shake hands the cases which fell to lincoln on the eighth circuit were of the sort common to a new country litigation over bordering lines and deeds over damages by wandering cattle over broils at country festivities few of the cases were of large importance when a client came to lincoln his first effort was to arrange matters if possible and to avoid a suit in a few notes for a law lecture prepared about eighteen fifty he says discourage litigation persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees expenses and waste of time as a peacemaker the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man there will still be business enough never stir up litigation a worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this who can be more nearly a fiend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects in titles whereon to stir up strife and put money in his pocket a moral tone ought to be infused into the profession which should drive such men out of it he carried out this in his practice who was your guardian he asked a young man who came to him to complain that a part of the property left him had been withheld enoch kingsbury replied the young man i know mr kingsbury said lincoln and he is not the man to have cheated you out of a cent and i can't take the case and advise you to drop the subject and it was dropped we shall not take your case he said to a man who had shown that by a legal technicality he could win property worth six hundred dollars you must remember that some things legally right are not morally right we shall not take your case but we'll give you a little advice for which we will charge you nothing you seem to be a sprightly energetic man we would advise you to try your hand at making six hundred dollars in some other way where he saw injustice he was quick to offer his services to the wronged party a pleasant example of this is related by joseph jefferson in his autobiography in eighteen thirty nine jefferson then a lad of ten years travelled through illinois with his father's theatrical company after playing at chicago quincy peoria and pekin the company went in the fall to springfield where the sight of the legislature tempted the elder jefferson and his partner to remain throughout the season but there was no theatre not to be daunted they built one but hardly had they completed it before a religious revival broke out in the town and the church people turned all their influence against the theatre so effectually did they work that a law was passed by the municipality imposing a license which was practically prohibitory in the midst of our trouble says jefferson a young lawyer called on the managers 
he had heard of the injustice and offered if they would place the matter in his hands to have the license taken off declaring that he only desired to see fair play and he would accept no fee whether he failed or succeeded the young lawyer began his harangue he handled the subject with tact skill and humour tracing the history of the drama from the time when thespis acted in a cart to the stage of to-day he illustrated his speech with a number of anecdotes and kept the council in a roar of laughter his good humour prevailed and the exorbitant tax was taken off the young lawyer was lincoln having accepted a case lincoln's first object seemed to be to reduce it to its simplest elements if i can clean this case of technicalities and get it properly swung to the jury i'll win it he told his partner herndon one day he began by getting at what seemed to him the pivot on which it rested sure of that he cared little for anything else he trusted very little to books a great deal to common sense and his ideas of right and wrong in the make of his character mr lincoln had many elements essential to the successful circuit lawyer says one of his fellow practitioners he knew much of the law as written in the books and had that knowledge ready for use at all times that was a valuable possession in the absence of law books where none were obtainable on the circuit but he had more than a knowledge of the law he knew right and justice and knew how to make their application to the affairs of everyday life that was an element in his character that gave him power to prevail with the jury when arguing a case before them few lawyers ever had the influence with a jury that mr lincoln had when a case was clear to him and he was satisfied of its justice he trusted to taking advantage of the developments of the trial to win for this reason he made few notes beforehand rarely writing out his plan of argument those he left are amusingly brief for instance the notes made for a suit he had brought against a pension agent who had withheld as fee half of the pension he had obtained for the aged widow of a revolutionary soldier lincoln was deeply indignant at the agent and had resolved to win his suit he read up the revolutionary war afresh and when he came to address the jury drew a harrowing picture of the private soldier's sufferings and of the trials of his separation from his wife the notes for this argument ran as follows no contract not professional services unreasonable charge money retained by defendant not given by plaintiff revolutionary war soldiers bleeding feet plaintiff's husband soldier leaving home for the army skin defect close lincoln's reason for not taking notes as he told it to h w beckwith when a student in the danville office of lincoln and layman was notes are a bother taking time to make and more to hunt them up afterwards lawyers who do so soon get the habit of referring to them so much that it confuses and tires the jury he relied on his well-trained memory says mr beckwith that recorded and indexed every passing detail and by his skilful questions a joke or pat retort as the trial progressed he steered his jury from the bayous and eddies of side issues and kept them clear of the snags and sandbars if any were put in the real channel of his case much of his strength lay in his skill in examining witnesses he had a most remarkable talent for examining witnesses says an intimate associate with him it was a rare gift it was a power to compel a witness to disclose the whole truth even a witness at first unfriendly under his kindly treatment would finally become friendly and would wish to tell nothing he could honestly avoid against him if he could state nothing for him he could not endure an unfair use of testimony or the misrepresentation of his own position in the harrison murder case says mr t w s kidd of springfield a crier of the court in lincoln's day the prosecuting attorney stated that such a witness made a certain statement when mr lincoln rose and made such a plaintive appeal to the attorney to correct the statement that the attorney actually made the amend honourable and afterwards remarked to a brother lawyer that he could deny his own child's appeal as quickly as he could mr lincoln's 
sometimes under provocation he became violently angry in the murder case referred to above the judge ruled contrary to his expectations and as mr lincoln said contrary to the decision of the supreme court in a similar case both mr lincoln and judge logan who was with him in the case says mr kidd rose to their feet quick as thought i do think he was the most unearthly-looking man i had ever seen he roared like a lion suddenly aroused from his lair and said and did more in ten minutes than i ever heard him say or saw him do before in an hour he depended a great deal upon his stories in pleading using them as illustrations which demonstrated the case more conclusively than argument could have done judge h w beckwith of danville illinois in his personal recollections of lincoln tells a story which is a good example of lincoln's way of condensing the law and the facts of an issue in a story a man by vile words first provoked and then made a bodily attack upon another the latter in defending himself gave the other much the worst of the encounter the aggressor to get even had the one who thrashed him tried in our circuit court upon a charge of an assault and battery mr lincoln defended and told the jury that his client was in the fix of a man who in going along the highway with a pitchfork on his shoulder was attacked by a fierce dog that ran out at him from a farmer's dooryard in parrying off the brute with the fork its prong stuck into the brute and killed him what made you kill my dog said the farmer what made him try to bite me but why did you not go at him with the other end of the pitchfork why did he not come after me with his other end at this mr lincoln whirled about in his long arms an imaginary dog and pushed its tail end toward the jury this was the defensive plea of son assault de main loosely that the other fellow brought on the fight quickly told and in a way the dullest mind would grasp and retain mr t w s kidd says that he once heard a lawyer opposed to lincoln trying to convince a jury that precedent was superior to law and that custom made things legal in all cases when lincoln arose to answer him he told the jury he would argue his case in the same way said he old squire bagley from menard came into my office and said lincoln i want your advice as a lawyer has a man what's been elected justice of the peace a right to issue a marriage license i told him he had not when the old squire threw himself back in his chair very indignantly and said lincoln i thought you was a lawyer now bob thomas and me had a bet on this thing and we agreed to let you decide but if this is your opinion i don't want it for i know a thundering sight better for i have been squire now eight years and have done it all the time his manner of telling stories was most effective when he chose to do so writes judge scott he could place the opposite party and his counsel too for that matter in a most ridiculous attitude by relating in his inimitable way a pertinent story that often gave him a great advantage with the jury a young lawyer had brought an action in trespass to recover damages done to his client's growing crops by defendant's hogs the right of action under the law of illinois as it was then depended on the fact whether the plaintiff's fence was sufficient to turn ordinary stock there was some little conflict in the evidence on that question but the weight of the testimony was decidedly in favor of the plaintiff and sustained beyond all doubt his cause of action mr lincoln appeared for defendant there was no controversy as to the damage done by defendant's stock the only thing in the case that could possibly admit of any discussion was the condition of plaintiff's fence and as the testimony on that question seemed to be in favor of plaintiff and as the sum involved was little in amount mr lincoln did not deem it necessary to argue the case seriously but by way of saying something in behalf of his client he told a little story about a fence that was so crooked that when a hog went through an opening in it invariably it came out on the same side from whence it started 
his description of the confused look of the hog after several times going through the fence and still finding itself on the side from which it had started was a humorous specimen of the best storytelling the effect was to make plaintiff's case appear ridiculous and while mr lincoln did not attempt to apply the story to the case the jury seemed to think it had some kind of application to the fencing controversy otherwise he would not have told it and shortly returned a verdict for the defendant those unfamiliar with his methods frequently took his stories as an effort to wring a laugh from the jury a lawyer a stranger to mr lincoln once expressed to general linder the opinion that this practice of lincoln was a waste of time don't lay that flattering unction to your soul linder answered lincoln is like tansy's horse he breaks to win but it was not his stories it was his clearness which was his strongest point he meant that the jury should see that he was right for this reason he never used a word which the dullest juryman could not understand rarely if ever did a latin term creep into his arguments a lawyer quoting a legal maxim one day in court turned to lincoln and said that is so is it not mr lincoln if that's latin lincoln replied you had better call another witness his illustrations were almost always of the homeliest kind he did not care to go among the ancients for figures he said much of the force of his argument writes judge scott lay in his logical statement of the facts of a case when he had in that way secured a clear understanding of the facts the jury and the court would seem naturally to follow him in his conclusions as to the law of the case his simple and natural presentation of the facts seemed to give the impression that the jury themselves were making the statement he had the happy and unusual faculty of making the jury believe they and not he were trying the case mr lincoln kept himself in the background and apparently assumed nothing more than to be an assistant counsel to the court or jury on whom the primary responsibility for the final decision of the case in fact rested he rarely consulted books during a trial lest he lose the attention of the jury and if obliged to translated their statements into the simplest terms in his desire to keep his case clear he rarely argued points which seemed to him unessential in law it is good policy never to plead what you need not lest you oblige yourself to prove what you cannot he wrote he would thus give away point after point with an indifferent i reckon that so until the point which he considered pivotal was reached and there he hung in making a speech says mr john hill mr lincoln was the plainest man i ever heard he was not a speaker but a talker he talked to juries and to political gatherings plain sensible candid talk almost as in conversation no effort whatever in oratory but his talking had wonderful effect honesty candor fairness everything that was convincing was in his manner and expressions this candor of which mr hill speaks characterized his entire conduct of a trial it is well understood by the profession says general mason brayman that lawyers do not read authorities favoring the opposing side i once heard mr lincoln in the supreme court of illinois reading from a reported case some strong points in favor of his argument reading a little too far and before becoming aware of it he plunged into an authority against himself pausing a moment he drew up his shoulders in a comical way and half laughing went on there there may it please the court i reckon i've scratched up a snake but as i'm in for it i guess i'll read it through then in his most ingenious and matchless manner he went on with his argument and won his case convincing the court that it was not much of a snake after all end of section fifteen section sixteen of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell the sleepervox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen lincoln's important law cases defense of a slave girl the mccormick case the armstrong murder case 
the rock island bridge case abraham lincoln's place in the legal circle of illinois has never been clearly defined the ordinary impression is that though he was a faithful and trusted lawyer he never rose to the first rank of his profession this idea has come from imperfect information concerning his legal career an examination of the reports of the illinois supreme court from eighteen forty when he tried his first case before that body to eighteen sixty one when he gave up his profession to become president of the united states shows that in this period of twenty years broken as it was from eighteen forty seven to eighteen forty nine by a term in congress and interrupted constantly from eighteen fifty four to eighteen sixty by his labors in opposition to the repeal of the missouri compromise lincoln was engaged in nearly one hundred cases before that court some of them of great importance this fact shows him to have been one of the leading lawyers of his state between ninety and one hundred cases before the supreme court of a state in twenty years is a record surpassed by but few lawyers it was exceeded by none of lincoln's illinois contemporaries among the cases in which he was prominent and of which we have reports there are several of dramatic import viewing them as we can now in connection with his later life one of the first in which he appeared before the illinois supreme court involved the freedom of a negro girl called nance in spite of the fact that illinois had been free since its admission as a state many traces of slavery still remained particularly in the southern and central parts of the state among the scattered slaveholders was one nathan cromwell of tazewell county who for some years had in his service a negro girl nance he claimed that Nance was bound to him by indenture, and that he had the right to sell her as any other property, a right he succeeded finally in exercising. One of his neighbors, Bailey by name, bought the girl, but the purchase was conditional. Bailey was to pay for his property only when he received from Cromwell title papers showing that Nance was bound to serve under the laws of the state. These papers Cromwell failed to produce before his death later his heirs sued bailey for the purchase price bailey employed lincoln to defend him the case was tried in september eighteen thirty nine and decided against bailey then in july eighteen forty one it was tried again before the supreme court of the state lincoln proved that nance had lived for several years in the state that she was over twenty-one years of age that she declared herself to be free and that she had even purchased goods on her own account the list of authorities he used in the trial to prove that nance could not be held in bondage shows that he was already familiar with both federal and state legislation on the slavery question up to that date he went back to the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven to show that slavery was forbidden in the northwest territory he recalled the constitution that had made the state free in eighteen eighteen he showed that by the law of nations no person can be sold in a free state his argument convinced the court the judgment of the lower court was overruled and nance was free after lincoln's return from congress in eighteen forty nine he was engaged in some of the most important cases of the day one of these was a contest between the illinois central railroad at that time building and mclean county illinois this road had been exempted by the legislature from all state taxation on condition that it pay perpetually into the state treasury seven per cent of its annual gross earnings when the line was laid in mclean county the county authorities declared that the state legislature could not excuse the railroad company from paying county taxes accordingly the company's property was assessed and a tax levied if this claim of the county could be sustained it was certain to kill the railroad and great preparations were made for the defense the solicitor of the illinois central at that time was general mason brayman who retained lincoln the case was tried at bloomington before the supreme court and largely through the efforts of lincoln was won for the road according to herndon lincoln charged for his services a fee of two thousand dollars going to chicago he presented his bill why said the officer to whom he applied this is as much as a first-class lawyer would have charged 
stung by the ungrateful speech lincoln withdrew the bill left the office and at the first opportunity submitted the matter to his friends five thousand dollars they all agreed was a moderate fee considering what he had done for the road and six leading lawyers of the state signed a paper in which they declared that such a charge would not be unreasonable lincoln then sued the road for that amount and won his case he gave me my half says herndon and as much as we deprecated the avarice of great corporations we both thanked the lord for letting the illinois central railroad fall into our hands the current version of this story names general george b mcclellan as the testy official who snubbed lincoln when he presented the bill this could not have been the incident occurred in eighteen fifty five that year captain mcclellan spent in the crimea as one of a commission of three sent abroad to study the european military service as displayed in the crimean war it was not until january eighteen fifty seven that mcclellan resigned his commission in the united states army to become the chief engineer and afterwards vice-president of the illinois central railroad it was when an officer of the illinois central however that mcclellan first met lincoln long before the war he says in mcclellan's own story when vice-president of the illinois central railroad i knew mr lincoln for he was one of the counsel of the company more than once i have been with him in out-of-the-way county seats where some important case was being tried and in the lack of sleeping accommodations have spent the night in front of a stove listening to the unceasing flow of anecdotes from his lips he was never at a loss and i could never quite make up my mind how many of them he had really heard before and how many he invented on the spur of the moment his stories were seldom refined but were always to the point it was through his legal practice that lincoln first met still another man who was to sustain a relation of the greatest importance to him in the war this man was edwin m stanton the meeting occurred in cincinnati in eighteen fifty five in connection with a patent case which is famous in the legal history of the country and in which both lincoln and stanton had been retained as counsel so much that is false has been written of this meeting that a full and exact statement of the circumstances has been obtained for this work from mr george harding of philadelphia the only one of either judges or counsel in the case living at this writing cyrus h mccormick owned reaping machine patents granted in eighteen forty five and eighteen forty seven says mr harding upon which he sued john m manny and company of rockford illinois mr manny had obtained patents also manny and company were large manufacturers of reaping machines under manny's patents mccormick contended that his patents were valid and secured to him a virtual monopoly of all practical reaping machines as constructed at that date if mccormick had been successful in his contention manny would have been enjoined his factory stopped and a claim of four hundred thousand dollars damages demanded from his firm mccormick's income from that monopoly would have been vastly increased hence the suit was very important to all parties and to the farming public the plaintiff mccormick had retained mr e n dickerson and reverdy johnson the former was entrusted with the preparation of the plaintiff's case and the argument before the court on the mechanics of the case mr p h watson who had procured manny's patents was given by manny the entire control of the defendant's case he employed mr george harding to prepare the defence for manny and to argue the mechanics of the case before the court in those times it was deemed important in patent cases to employ associate counsel not specially familiar with mechanical questions but of high standing in the general practice of the law and of recognized forensic ability if such counsel represented the defendant he urged upon the court the importance of treating the patentee as a quasi-monopolist whose claim should be limited to the precise mechanical contributions which he had made to the art while on the other hand the plaintiff's forensic counsel was expected to dwell upon the privations and labor of the patentee and to insist on a very liberal view of his claims and to hold that defendants who had appropriated any of his ideas should be treated as pirates the necessity of the forensic contribution in the argument of patent cases is not now recognized 
McCormick had selected Mr. Reverdy Johnson for the forensic part of his case. Mr. Watson was in doubt as to whom to select to perform this duty for the defendants. At the suggestion of Mr. Manny, Mr. Watson wrote to Mr. Lincoln, sending to him a retainer of $500, and requesting him to read the testimony, which was sent to him from time to time as taken, so that if Mr. Watson afterward concluded to have him argue the case, he would be prepared. Mr. Harding had urged the employment of Mr. Stanton, who was personally known to him, and who then resided at Pittsburgh with a view to determining finally who should argue the forensic part of manny's case mr watson personally visited springfield and conferred with mr lincoln on his way back from springfield he called upon mr stanton at pittsburgh and after a conference retained mr stanton and informed him distinctly that he was to make the closing argument in the case nevertheless mr lincoln was sent copies of the testimony he studied the testimony and was paid for so doing, the same as Mr. Stanton. Mr. Watson considered that it would be prudent for Mr. Lincoln to be prepared in case of Mr. Stanton's inability for any cause to argue the case, so that at the outset Mr. Stanton was selected by Mr. Manny's direct representative to perform this duty. When all the parties and counsel met at Cincinnati, Mr. Lincoln was first definitely informed by Mr. Watson of his determination that Mr. Stanton was to close the case for defendants. Mr. Lincoln was evidently disappointed at Mr. Watson's decision. Mr. Lincoln had written out his argument in full. He was anxious to meet Mr. Reverdy Johnson in forensic contest. The case was important as to the amount in dispute and of widespread interest to farmers. Mr. Lincoln's feelings were embittered, moreover, because the plaintiff's counsel subsequently, in open court, of their own motion, stated that they perceived that there were three counsel present for defendant, and that plaintiff had only two counsel present, but they were willing to allow all three of defendant's counsel to speak, provided Mr. Dickerson, who had charge of the mechanical part of McCormick's case, were permitted to make two arguments, besides Mr. Johnson's argument. Mr. Watson, who had charge of defendant's case, declined this offer, because the case ultimately depended upon mechanical questions, and he thought that if Mr. Dickerson were allowed to open the mechanical part of the case, and then make a subsequent argument on the mechanics, the temptation would be great to make an insufficient or misleading mechanical opening of the case at first, and, after Mr. Harding had replied thereto, to make a fuller or different mechanical presentation, which could not be replied to by Mr. Harding it was conceded that neither mr lincoln nor mr stanton was prepared to handle the mechanics of the case either in opening or reply in view of these facts mr watson decided that only two arguments would be made for manny and that mr harding would open the case for defendant on the mechanical part and mr stanton would close on the general propositions of law applicable to the case mr stanton said in court that personally he had no desire to speak but he agreed with mr watson that only two arguments should be made for defendants whether he spoke or not mr lincoln knowing mr watson's wishes insisted that mr stanton should make the closing argument and that he would not himself speak mr stanton accepted the position and did speak because he knew that such was the expressed wish and direction of Mr. Watson, who controlled the conduct of defendant's case. Mr. Lincoln kindly and gracefully, but regretfully, accepted the situation. He attended and exhibited much interest in the case as it proceeded. He sent to Mr. Harding the written argument which he had prepared, that he might have the benefit of it before he made his opening argument, but requested Mr. Harding not to show it to Mr. Stanton. The chagrin of Mr. Lincoln at not speaking continued, however, and he felt that Mr. Stanton should have insisted on his, Mr. Lincoln's, speaking also, while Mr. Stanton merely carried out the positive direction of his client that there should be only two arguments for defendant, and that he, Mr. Stanton, should close the case, and Mr. Harding should open the case. Mr. Lincoln expressed to Mr. Harding satisfaction at the manner in which the mechanical part of the case had been presented by him, 
and after mr lincoln had been elected president he showed his recollection of it by tendering mr harding of his own motion a high position in regard to the personal treatment of mr lincoln while in attendance at cincinnati it is to be borne in mind that mr lincoln was known to hardly any one in cincinnati at that date and that mr stanton was probably not impressed with the appearance of mr lincoln it is true there was no personal intimacy formed between them while at cincinnati mr lincoln was disappointed and unhappy while in cincinnati and undoubtedly did not receive the attention which he should have received mr lincoln felt all this and particularly but unjustly reflected upon mr stanton as the main cause when mr lincoln was nominated for president mr stanton like many others in the country sincerely doubted whether mr lincoln was equal to the tremendous responsibility which he was to be called upon to assume as president this is to be borne in mind in view of events subsequent to the case at cincinnati mr stanton never called upon mr lincoln after he came to washington as president mr lincoln in alluding to mr stanton both before and after his election as president did not attempt to conceal his unkind feeling towards him which had its origin at cincinnati this feeling did not undergo a change until after he met mr stanton as secretary of war the occurrences narrated show how one great man may underrate his fellow-man mr stanton saw at cincinnati in mr lincoln only his gaunt rugged features his awkward dress and carriage and heard only his rural jokes but stanton lived to perceive in those rugged lineaments only expressions of nobility and loveliness of character and to hear from his lips only wisdom prudence and courage couched in language unsurpassed in literature but above all they show the nobility of mr lincoln's character in forgetting all unkind personal feeling engendered at cincinnati towards mr stanton and subsequently appointing him his secretary of war the above was narrated by mr harding for the main purpose of correcting the popular impression that mr stanton of his own motion rode over and displaced mr lincoln in the case at cincinnati for the truth is that mr stanton in the course he pursued was directed by his client's representative mr watson who believed that he was serving the best interests of his clients lincoln was first suggested to mr manny as counsel in this case by a younger member of the firm mr ralph emerson of rockford illinois mr emerson as a student of law had been thrown much into company with mr lincoln and had learned to respect his judgment and ability indeed it was lincoln who was instrumental in deciding him to abandon the law the young man had seen much in the practice of his chosen profession which seemed to him unjust and he had begun to feel that the law was incompatible with his ideals one evening after a particularly trying day in court he walked out with lincoln suddenly turning to his companion he said mr lincoln i want to ask you a question is it possible for a man to practice law and always do by others as he would be done by lincoln's head dropped on his breast and he walked in silence for a long way then he heaved a heavy sigh when he finally spoke it was of a foreign matter i had my answer said mr emerson and that walk turned the course of my life during the trial at cincinnati lincoln and mr emerson were thrown much together and mr emerson's recollections are particularly interesting as i was the sole intimate friend of mr lincoln in the case when it was decided that he should not take part in the argument he invited me to his room to express his bitter disappointment and it was with difficulty that i persuaded him to remain as counsel during the hearing we generally spent the afternoons together the hearing had hardly progressed two days before mr lincoln expressed to me his satisfaction that he was not to take part in the argument so many and so deep were the questions involved that he realized he had not given the subject sufficient study to have done himself justice the courtroom which during the first day or two was well filled greatly thinned out as the argument proceeded day after day but as the crowd diminished mr lincoln's interest in the case increased 
he appeared entirely to forget himself and at times rising from his chair walked back and forth in the open space of the court-room as though he were in his own office pausing to listen intently as one point after another was clearly made out in our favour he manifested such delight in countenance and unconscious action that its effect on the judges one of whom at least already highly respected him was evidently stronger than any set speech of his could possibly have been the impression produced on the judges was evidently that mr lincoln was thoroughly convinced of the justice of our side and anxious that we should prevail not merely on account of his interest in his clients but because he thought our case was just and should triumph the final summing up on our side was by mr stanton and though he took but about three hours in its delivery he had devoted as many if not more weeks to its preparation it was very able and mr lincoln was throughout the whole of it a rapt listener mr stanton closed his speech in a flight of impassioned eloquence then the court adjourned for the day and mr lincoln invited me to take a long walk with him for block after block he walked rapidly forward not saying a word evidently deeply dejected at last he turned suddenly to me exclaiming emerson i am going home a pause i am going home to study law why i exclaimed mr lincoln you stand at the head of the bar in illinois now what are you talking about ah yes he said i do occupy a good position there and i think that i can get along with the way things are done there now but these college-trained men who have devoted their whole lives to study are coming west don't you see and they study their cases as we never do they've got as far as cincinnati now they will soon be in illinois another long pause then stopping and turning toward me his countenance suddenly assuming that look of strong determination which those who knew him best sometimes saw upon his face he exclaimed i am going home to study law i am as good as any of them and when they get out to illinois i will be ready for them the fee which lincoln received in the mccormick case including the retainer which was five hundred dollars the largest retainer ever received by lincoln amounted to nearly two thousand dollars except the sum paid him by the illinois central railroad it was probably the largest fee he ever received the two sums came to him about the same time and undoubtedly helped to tide over the rather unfruitful period from a financial standpoint which followed the period of his contest with douglas for the senate lincoln never made money from eighteen fifty to eighteen sixty his income averaged from two thousand to three thousand dollars a year in the forties it was considerably less the fee book of lincoln and herndon for eighteen forty seven shows total earnings of only fifteen hundred dollars the largest fee entered was one of one hundred dollars there are several of fifty dollars a number of twenty more of ten still more of five and a few of three dollars but lincoln's fees were as a rule smaller than his clients expected or his fellow lawyers approved of mr abraham brokaw of bloomington illinois tells the following story illustrating lincoln's idea of a proper fee one of mr brokaw's neighbors had borrowed about five hundred dollars from him and given his note when it became due the man refused to pay action was brought and the sheriff levied on the property of the debtor and finally collected the entire debt but at about that time the sheriff was in need of funds and used the money collected when brokaw demanded it from him he was unable to pay it and found to be insolvent thereupon brokaw employed stephen a douglas to sue the sureties on the official bond of the sheriff douglas brought the suit and soon collected the claim but douglas was at that time in the midst of a campaign for congress and the funds were used by him with the expectation of being able to pay brokaw later however he neglected the matter and went to washington without making any settlement brokaw although a lifelong and ardent democrat and a great admirer of douglas was a thrifty german and did not propose to lose sight of his money after fruitlessly demanding the money from douglas brokaw went to david davis then in general practice at bloomington 
told him the circumstances and asked him to undertake the collection of the money from douglas davis protested that he could not do it that douglas was a personal friend and a brother lawyer and democrat and it would be very disagreeable for him to have anything to do with the matter he finally said to brokaw you wait until the next term of court and lincoln will be here he would like nothing better than to have this claim for collection i will introduce you to him and i have no doubt he will undertake it shortly after brokaw was presented to lincoln stated his case and engaged his services lincoln promptly wrote douglas still at washington that he had the claim for collection and that he must insist upon prompt payment douglas very indignant wrote directly to brokaw that he thought the placing of the claim in lincoln's hands a gross outrage that he and brokaw were old friends and democrats and that brokaw ought not to place any such weapon in the hands of such an abolitionist opponent as lincoln and if he could not wait until douglas returned he should at least have placed the claim for collection in the hands of a democrat brokaw's thrift again controlled and he sent douglas's letter to lincoln thereupon lincoln placed the claim in the hands of long john wentworth then a democratic member of congress from chicago wentworth called upon douglas and insisted upon payment which shortly after was made and brokaw at last received his money and what do you suppose lincoln charged me brokaw says in telling the story after hearing a few guesses he answers he charged me exactly three dollars and fifty cents for collecting nearly six hundred dollars such charges were felt by the lawyers of the eighth circuit with some reason to be purely quixotic they protested and argued but lincoln went on serenely charging what he thought his services worth ward layman who was one of lincoln's numerous circuit partners says that he and lincoln frequently fell out on the matter of fees on one occasion layman was particularly incensed he had charged and received a good-sized fee for a case which the two had tried together and won when layman offered lincoln his share he refused it the fee was too large he said part of it must be refunded and he would not accept a cent until part of it had been refunded judge davis heard of this transaction he was himself a shrewd money-maker never hesitating to take all he could legally get and he felt strong disgust at this disinterested attitude about money calling lincoln to him the judge scolded roundly you are pauperizing this court mr lincoln you are ruining your fellows unless you quit this ridiculous policy we shall all have to go to farming but not even the ire of the bench moved lincoln if a fee was not paid lincoln did not believe in suing for it mr herndon says that he would consent to be swindled before he would contest a fee the case of the illinois central railroad however was an exception to this rule he was careless in accounts never entering anything on the book when a fee was paid to him he simply divided the money into two parts one of which he put into his pocket and the other into an envelope which he labeled herndon's half lincoln's whole theory of the conduct of a lawyer in regard to money is summed up in the notes for a law lecture which he left among his papers the matter of fees is important far beyond the mere question of bread and butter involved properly attended to fuller justice is done to both lawyer and client an exorbitant fee should never be claimed as a general rule never take your whole fee in advance nor any more than a small retainer when fully paid beforehand you are more than a common mortal if you can feel the same interest in the case as if something was still in prospect for you as well as for your client and when you lack interest in the case the job will very likely lack skill and diligence in the performance settle the amount of fee and take a note in advance then you will feel that you are working for something and you are sure to do your work faithfully and well never sell a fee note at least not before the consideration service is performed it leads to negligence and dishonesty negligence by losing interest in the case and dishonesty in refusing to refund when you have allowed the consideration to fail 
if a client was poor and lincoln's sympathies were aroused he not infrequently refused pay there are a few well-authenticated cases of his offering his services to those whom he believed he could help stipulating when he did it that he would make no charge the best-known example of this is the armstrong murder case william or duff armstrong as he was generally called was the son of lincoln's new salem friends jack and hannah armstrong in august eighteen fifty seven duff and a number of his mates had joined a crowd of ruffians who had gathered on the outskirts of a camp meeting held near havana in macon county he had drunk heavily for some days and finally in a broil on the night of august twenty ninth had beaten a comrade one metzger who had provoked him to a fight that same night metzger was hit with an ox yoke by another drunken reveller norris by name three days later he died both armstrong and norris were arrested marks of two blows were on the victim either of which might have killed him that norris had dealt one was proved did armstrong deal the other he claimed he had used nothing but his fists in the broil but both the marks on metzger were such as must have been made by some instrument the theory was developed that one blow was from a slung shot used by armstrong and that he and norris had acted in concert deliberately planning to murder metzger outraged by the cruelty of the deed the whole countryside demanded the punishment of the prisoners just at the time that armstrong was thrown into prison his father died his last charge to his wife hannah being sell everything you have and clear duff true to her trust hannah engaged two lawyers of havana both of whom are still living to defend her boy anxious lest the violence of public feeling should injure duff's chances the lawyers secured a change of venue to cass county their client remaining in prison until spring norris in the meantime was convicted and sentenced to eight years in the penitentiary when the lawyers and the witnesses assembled in beardstown may eighteen fifty eight for armstrong's trial it happened that lincoln was attending court in the town at that moment he was after stephen a douglas the most conspicuous man in illinois his future course in politics was a source of interest in the east as well as the west the coming contest with douglas for the senatorship for it was already probable that he would be the candidate in the convention which was only a month away was causing him intense anxiety yet occupied as he was with his profession and harassed by the critical political situation he did not hesitate an instant when hannah armstrong came to him for advice going to her lawyers he said he should like to assist them they of course were glad of his aid and he at once took the case in hand his first care was the selection of a jury not knowing the neighborhood well he could not discriminate closely as to individuals but he took pains as far as he could control the choice to have only young men chosen believing that they would be more favorable to the prisoner a surviving witness in the case estimates that the average age of the jury was not over twenty-three years the jury impaneled the examination of witnesses seems to have been conducted on behalf of the defense chiefly by lincoln many of the witnesses bore familiar names some were sons of clary's grove boys and lincoln had known their fathers the witnesses were kept out of the courtroom until called to testify says william a douglas i happened to be the first witness called and so heard the whole trial when william killian was called to the stand lincoln asked him his name william killian was the reply bill killian lincoln repeated in a familiar way tell me are you a son of old jake killian yes sir answered the witness well said lincoln somewhat aside you are a smart boy if you take after your dad as the trial developed it became evident that there could have been no collusion between armstrong and norris but there was strong evidence that armstrong had used a slung shot the most damaging evidence was that of one allen who swore that he had seen armstrong strike metzger about ten or eleven o'clock in the evening when asked how he could see he answered that the moon shone brightly under lincoln's questioning he repeated the statement until it was impossible that the jury should forget it with allen's testimony unimpeached conviction seemed certain 
lincoln's address to the jury was full of genuine pathos it was not as a hired attorney that he was there he said but to discharge a debt of friendship uncle abe says duff armstrong himself did his best talking when he told the jury what true friends my father and mother had been to him in the early days he told how he used to go out to jack armstrong's and stay for days how kind mother was to him and how many a time he had rocked me to sleep in the old cradle but lincoln was not relying on sympathy alone to win his case in closing he reviewed the evidence showing that all depended on allen's testimony and this he said he could prove to be false allen never saw armstrong strike metzger by the light of the moon for at the hour when he said he saw the fight between ten and eleven o'clock the moon was not in the heavens then producing an almanac he passed it to the judge and jury the moon which was on that night only in its first quarter had set before midnight this unexpected overthrow of the testimony by which lincoln had taken care that the jury should be most deeply impressed threw them into confusion there was a complete change of feeling lincoln saw it and as he finished his address and the jury left the room turning to the boy's mother he said aunt hannah your son will be free before sundown lincoln had not misread his jury duff armstrong was discharged as not guilty there has long been a story current that the dramatic introduction of the almanac by which certainly the audience and jury were won was a pure piece of trickery on lincoln's part that the almanac was not one of eighteen fifty seven but of eighteen fifty three in which the figure three had been changed throughout to seven the best reply to this charge of forgery is the very evident one that it was utterly unnecessary the almanac for august eighteen fifty seven shows that the moon was exactly in the position where it served lincoln's client's interests best he did not need to forge an almanac the one of the period being all that he could want another murder case in which lincoln defended the accused occurred in august eighteen fifty nine the victim was a student in his own law office greek crafton the murderer peachy harrison was the grandson of lincoln's old political antagonist peter cartwright both young men were connected with the best families of the county the brother of one was married to the sister of the other they had been lifelong friends in an altercation upon some political question hot words were exchanged and harrison beside himself stabbed crafton who three days later died from the wound the best-known lawyers of the state were engaged for the case senator john m palmer and general a mcclernand were on the side of the prosecution among those who represented the defendant were lincoln herndon logan and senator shelby m cullum the tragic pathos of a case which involved as this did the deepest affections of almost an entire community reached its climax in the appearance in court of the venerable peter cartwright no face in illinois was better known than his no life had been spent in a more relentless war on evil eccentric and aggressive as he was he was honored far and wide and when he arose in the witness-stand his white hair crowned with this cruel sorrow the most indifferent spectator felt that this examination would be unbearable it fell to lincoln to question cartwright with the rarest gentleness he began to put his questions how long have you known the prisoner cartwright's head dropped on his breast for a moment then straightening himself he passed his hand across his eyes and answered in a deep quavering voice i have known him since a babe he laughed and cried on my knee the examination ended by lincoln drawing from the witness the story of how crafton had said to him just before his death i am dying i will soon part with all i love on earth and i want you to say to my slayer that i forgive him i want to leave this earth with a forgiveness of all who have in any way injured me this examination made a profound impression on the jury lincoln closed his argument by picturing the scene anew appealing to the jury to practice the same forgiving spirit that the murdered man had shown on his deathbed it was undoubtedly to his handling of the grandfather's evidence that harrison's acquittal was due 
a class of legal work which lincoln enjoyed particularly was that in which mathematical or mechanical problems were involved he never lost interest in his youthful pot-boiling profession of surveying and would go out himself to make sure of boundaries if a client's case required particular investigation indeed he was generally recognized by his fellow lawyers as an authority in surveying and as late as eighteen fifty nine his opinion on a disputed question was sought by a convention of surveyors who had met in springfield one of the most interesting cases involving mechanical problems which lincoln ever argued was that of the rock island bridge it was not however the calculations he used which made it striking the case was a dramatic episode in the war long waged by the mississippi against the plains beyond for decades the river had been the willing burden-bearer of the west now however the railroad had come the rock island road had even dared to bridge the stream to carry away the traffic which the river claimed in may eighteen fifty six a steamboat struck one of the piers of the bridge and was wrecked and burned one pier of the bridge was also destroyed the boat owners sued the railroad company the suit was the beginning of the long and violent struggle for commercial supremacy between st louis and chicago in chicago it was commonly believed that the st louis chamber of commerce had bribed the captain of the boat to run upon the pier and it was said that later when the bridge itself was burned the steamers gathered near and whistled for joy the case was felt to involve the future course of western commerce and when it was called in september eighteen fifty seven at chicago people crowded there from all over the west norman b judd afterwards so prominent in the politics of the state was the attorney of the road and he engaged lincoln among others as counsel lincoln made an address to the jury which those who remember it declare to have been one of his strongest legal arguments the two points relied upon by the opponents of the bridge says judge blodgett of chicago were first that the river was the great waterway for the commerce of the valley and could not legally be obstructed by a bridge second that this particular bridge was so located with reference to the channel of the river at that point as to make it a peril to all watercraft navigating the river and an unnecessary obstruction to navigation the first proposition had not at that time been directly passed upon by the supreme court of the united states although the wheeling bridge case involved the question but the court had evaded a decision upon it by holding that the wheeling bridge was so low as to be an unnecessary obstruction to the use of the bridge by steamboats the discussion of the first proposition on the part of the bridge company devolved mainly upon mr abraham lincoln i listened with much interest to his argument on this point and while i was not impressed by it as a specially eloquent effort as the word eloquent is generally understood i have always considered it as one of the ablest efforts i ever heard from mr lincoln at the bar his illustrations were apt and forcible his statements clear and logical and his reasons in favor of the policy and necessarily the right to bridge the river and thereby encourage the settlement and building up of the vast area of fertile country to the west of it were broad and statesmanlike the pith of his argument was in his statement that one man has as good a right to cross a river as another had to sail up or down it that these were equal and mutual rights which must be exercised so as not to interfere with each other like the right to cross a street or highway and the right to pass along it from this undeniable right to cross the river he then proceeded to discuss the means for crossing must it always be by canoe or ferry-boat must the products of all the boundless fertile country lying west of the river for all time be compelled to stop on its western bank be unloaded from the cars and loaded upon a boat and after the transit across the river be reloaded into cars on the other side to continue their journey east in this connection he drew a vivid picture of the future of the great west lying beyond the river and argued that the necessities of commerce demanded that the bridges across the river be a conceded right which the steamboat interests ought not to be allowed to successfully resist and thereby stay the progress of development and civilization in the region to the west 
while i cannot recall a word or sentence of the argument i well remember its effect on all who listened to it and the decision of the court fully sustained the right to bridge so long as it did not unnecessarily obstruct navigation all the papers in regard to the trial are supposed to have been burned in the chicago fire of eighteen seventy one but the speech which was reported by congressman hitt of illinois at that time court stenographer was published on september twenty fourth eighteen fifty seven in the chicago daily press afterwards united with the tribune according to this report the first part of the speech was devoted to the points judge blodgett outlines the second part was given to a careful explanation of the currents of the mississippi at the point where the bridge crossed lincoln succeeded in showing that had the pilot of the boat been as familiar as he ought to have been with the river he could easily have prevented the accident his argument was full of nice mathematical calculations clearly put and was marked by perfect candor indeed the honesty with which he admitted the points made by the opposite counsel caused considerable alarm to some of his associates mrs norman b judd mr judd was the attorney of the road says that mr joseph b knox who was also engaged with mr lincoln in the defense dined at her house the day that lincoln made his speech he sat down at the dinner table in great excitement writes mrs judd saying lincoln has lost the case for us the admissions he made in regard to the currents in the mississippi at rock island and moline will convince the court that a bridge at that point will always be a serious and constant detriment to navigation on the river wait until you hear the conclusion of his speech replied mr judd you will find his admission is a strong point instead of a weak one and on it he will found a strong argument that will satisfy you and as it proved mr judd was right the few cases briefly outlined here show something of the range of lincoln's legal work they show that not only his friends like hannah armstrong believed in his power with a jury but that great corporations like the illinois central railroad were willing to trust their affairs in his hands that he was not only a jury lawyer as has often been stated but trusted when it came to questions of law pure and simple if this study of his cases were continued it would only be to accumulate evidence to prove that lincoln was considered by his contemporaries one of the best lawyers of illinois it is worth notice too that he made his reputation as a lawyer and tried his greatest cases before his debate with douglas gave him a national reputation it was in eighteen fifty five that the illinois central engaged him first as counsel in eighteen fifty five that he went to cincinnati on the mccormick case in eighteen fifty seven that he tried the rock island bridge case thus his place was won purely on his legal ability unaided by political prestige his success came too in middle life lincoln was forty years old in eighteen forty nine when he abandoned politics definitely as he thought for the law he tried his greatest cases when he was from forty five to forty eight. End of section sixteen. Section seventeen of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seventeen. Lincoln re enters politics from eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty four abraham lincoln gave almost his entire time to his profession politics received from him only the attention which any public-spirited citizen without personal ambition should give he kept close watch upon federal state and local affairs he was active in the efforts made in illinois in eighteen fifty one to secure a more thorough party organization in eighteen fifty two he was on the scott electoral ticket and did some canvassing but this was all he was yearly becoming more absorbed in his legal work losing more and more of his old inclination for politics when in may eighteen fifty four the repeal of the missouri compromise aroused him as he had never been before in all his life the missouri compromise was the second in that series of noble provisions for making new territory free territory which liberty-loving men have wrested from the united states congress whenever the thirst for expansion has seized this country 
the first of these was the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven prohibiting slavery in all the great northwest territory the second the missouri compromise passed in eighteen twenty was the result of a struggle to keep the louisiana purchase free it provided that missouri might come in as a slave state if slavery was never allowed north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes north latitude the next great expansion of the united states after the louisiana purchase resulted from the annexation of texas and of territory acquired by the mexican war the north was determined that this new territory should be free the south wanted it for slaves the struggle between them threatened the union for a time but it was adjusted by the compromise of eighteen fifty in which according to mr lincoln's summing up the south got their new fugitive slave law and the north got california by far the best part of our acquisition for mexico as a free state the south got a provision that new mexico and utah when admitted as states may come in with or without slavery as they may then choose and the north got the slave trade abolished in the district of columbia the north got the western boundary of texas thrown farther back eastward than the south desired but in turn they gave texas ten millions of dollars with which to pay her old debts for three years matters were quiet then nebraska sought territorial organization now by the missouri compromise slavery was forbidden in that section of the union but in spite of this fact stephen a douglas then a member of the senate of the united states introduced a bill to give nebraska and kansas the desired government to which later he added an amendment repealing the missouri compromise and permitting the people who should settle in the new territories to reject or establish slavery as they should see fit it was the passage of this bill which brought abraham lincoln from the courtroom to the stump his friend richard yates was running for re-election to congress lincoln began to speak for him but in accepting invitations he stipulated that it should be against the kansas nebraska bill that he talk his earnestness surprised his friends lincoln was coming back into politics they said and when douglas the author of the repeal was announced to speak in springfield in october of eighteen fifty four they called on lincoln to meet him douglas was having a serious struggle to reconcile his illinois constituency all the free sentiment of the state had been bitterly aroused by his part in the repeal of the missouri compromise and when he first returned to illinois it looked as if he would not be given even a hearing indeed when he first attempted to speak in chicago september first he was hooted from the platform with every day in the state however he won back his friends so great was his power over men and he was beginning to arouse something of his old enthusiasm when he went to springfield to speak at the annual state fair there was a great crowd present from all parts of the state and douglas spoke for three hours when he closed it was announced that lincoln would answer him the next day lincoln's friends expected him to do well in his reply but his speech was a surprise even to those who knew him best it was profound finished vigorous eloquent when had he mastered the history of the slavery question so completely they asked each other the anti-nebraska speech of mr lincoln said the springfield journal the next day was the profoundest in our opinion that he has made in his whole life he felt upon his soul the truth's burn which he uttered and all present felt that he was true to his own soul his feelings once or twice swelled within and came near stifling utterance he quivered with emotion the whole house was as still as death he attacked the nebraska bill with unusual warmth and energy and all felt that a man of strength was its enemy and that he intended to blast it if he could by strong and manly efforts he was most successful and the house approved the glorious triumph of truth by loud and continued huzzas the vigor and earnestness of lincoln's speech aroused the crowd to such enthusiasm that senator douglas felt obliged to reply to him the next day these speeches of october third fourth and fifth eighteen fifty four form really the first of the series of lincoln douglas debates 
they proved conclusively to the anti-nebraska politicians in illinois that lincoln was to be their leader in the fight they had begun against the extension of slavery although the speech of october fourth was not preserved we know from paul selby at that time editor of an independent paper in jacksonville illinois which had been working hard against the repeal of the missouri compromise that lincoln's speech at springfield was practically the same as one delivered twelve days later at peoria in reply to douglas of this latter a full report was preserved in his reply at peoria lincoln began by a brief but sufficient resume of the efforts of the north to apply the declaration of independence to all new territory which it acquired and failing in that to provide for the sake of peace a series of compromises reserving as much territory as possible to freedom he showed that the kansas nebraska bill was a direct violation of one of the greatest of these solemn compromises this he declared was wrong wrong in its direct effect letting slavery into kansas and nebraska and wrong in its prospective principle allowing it to spread to every other part of the wide world where men can be found inclined to take it this declared indifference but as i must think covert real zeal for the spread of slavery i cannot but hate i hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself i hate it because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity and especially because it forces so many men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty criticizing the declaration of independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest disavowing all prejudice against the southern people he generously declared they are just what we would be in their situation if slavery did not exist among them they would not introduce it if it did now exist among us we should not instantly give it up i surely will not blame them for not doing what i should not know how to do myself if all earthly power were given me i should not know what to do as to the existing institution my first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them to liberia to their own native land but a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope there may be in this in the long run its sudden execution is impossible if they were all landed there in a day they would all perish in the next ten days and there are not surplus shipping and surplus money enough to carry them there in many times ten days i think i would not hold one in slavery at any rate yet the point is not clear enough for me to denounce people upon it does seem to me that systems of gradual emancipation might be adopted but for their tardiness in this i will not undertake to judge our brethren of the south the law which forbids the bringing of slaves from africa and that which has so long forbidden the taking of them into nebraska can hardly be distinguished on any moral principle and the repeal of the former could find quite as plausible excuses as that of the latter taking up the arguments by which the appeal of the missouri compromise was justified he answered them one by one with clearness and a great array of facts the chief of these arguments was that the repeal was in the interest of the sacred right of self-government and that the people of nebraska had a right to govern themselves as they chose voting for or against slavery as they pleased the doctrine of self-government is right lincoln said absolutely and eternally right but it has no just application as here attempted or perhaps i should rather say that whether it has such application depends on whether a negro is not or is a man if he is not a man in that case he who is a man may as a matter of self-government do just what he pleases with him but if the negro is a man is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself when the white man governs himself that is self-government but when he governs himself and also governs another man that is more than self-government that is despotism 
if the negro is a man why then my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another judge douglas frequently with bitter irony and sarcasm paraphrases our argument by saying the white people of nebraska are good enough to govern themselves but they are not good enough to govern a few miserable negroes well i doubt not that the people of nebraska are and will continue to be as good as the average of people elsewhere i do not say the contrary what i do say is that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent i say this is the leading principle the sheet anchor of american republicanism this peoria speech which is very long is particularly interesting to students of mr lincoln's speeches because in it is found the germ of many of the arguments which he elaborated in the next six years and used with tremendous effect with the peoria speech douglas had had enough of lincoln as an antagonist and he made a compact with him that neither should speak again in the campaign it was characteristic of douglas that on his way to chicago he should stop and deliver a speech at princeton but though lincoln had temporarily withdrawn from the stump he was by no means abandoning the struggle the iniquity of the kansas nebraska bill grew greater to him every day he meant to fight it to the end and he wanted to go where he could fight it directly he became a candidate for the general assembly of illinois from sangamon county and was elected by a large majority in november a little later he saw an opportunity for a larger position although illinois was strongly democratic the revolt against the nebraska bill had driven from the party a number of men members of the legislature who had signified their determination to vote only for an anti-nebraska senator this gave the whigs a chance and several candidates offered themselves among them lincoln resigning from the legislature members of the legislature could not become candidates for the senatorship he began his electioneering in the frank western style of those days by requesting his friends to support him i have really got it into my head to try to be united states senator he wrote his friend gillespie and if i could have your support my chances would be reasonably good but i know and acknowledge that you have as just claims to the place as i have and therefore i cannot ask you to yield to me if you are thinking of becoming a candidate yourself if however you are not then i should like to be remembered affectionately by you and also to have you make a mark for me with the anti-nebraska members down your way he sent a large number of similar letters to friends and by the first of january when the legislature reassembled he felt his chances of election were good i have more committals than any other man he wrote his friend washburn nevertheless he failed of the election just how he explained to washburn early in february i began with forty-four votes shields democratic forty-one and trumbull anti-nebraska five yet trumbull was elected in fact forty-seven different members voted for me getting three new ones on the second ballot and losing four old ones how came my forty-seven to yield to trumbull's five it was governor madison's work he has been secretly a candidate ever since before even the fall election all the members round about the canal were anti-nebraska but were nevertheless nearly all democrats and old personal friends of his his plan was to privately impress them with the belief that he was as good anti-nebraska as anyone else at least could be secured to be so by instructions which could be easily passed the nebraska men of course were not for madison but when they found out they could elect no avowed nebraska man they tardily determined to let him get whomever of our men he could by whatever means he could and ask him no questions the nebraska men were very confident of the election of madison though denying that he was a candidate and we very much believing also that they would elect him but they wanted first to make a show of good faith to shields by voting for him a few times and our secret madison men also wanted to make a show of good faith by voting with us a few times so we led off on the seventh ballot i think the signal was given to the nebraska men to turn to madison which they acted on to a man with one exception 
next ballot the remaining nebraska man and one pretended anti went over to him giving him forty-six the next still another giving him forty-seven wanting only three of an election in the meantime our friends with a view of detaining our expected bolters had been turning from me to trumbull till he had risen to thirty-five and i had been reduced to fifteen these would never desert me except by my direction but i became satisfied that if we could prevent madison's election one or two ballots more we could not possibly do so a single ballot after my friend should begin to return to me from trumbull so i determined to strike at once and accordingly advised my remaining friends to go for him which they did and elected him on the tenth ballot such is the way the thing was done i think you would have done the same under the circumstances i could have headed off every combination and been elected had it not been for madison's double game and his defeat now gives me more pleasure than my own gives me pain on the whole it is perhaps as well for our general cause that trumbull is elected the nebraska men confess that they hate it worse than anything that that could have happened it is a great consolation to see them worse whipped than i am not only had lincoln made the leading orator of the nebraska cry enough he had by his quick wit and his devotion to the cause secured an anti-nebraska senator for the state although for the time being campaigning was over lincoln by no means dropped the subject the struggle between north and south over the settlement of kansas grew every day more bitter violence was beginning and it was evident that if the people of the new territory should vote to make the state free it would be impossible to enforce the decision without bloodshed lincoln watched the developments with a growing determination never to submit to the repeal of the missouri compromise he would advocate its restoration so long as kansas remained a territory and if it ever sought to enter the union as a slave state he would oppose it he discussed the subject incessantly with his friends as he travelled the circuit and wrestled with it day and night in solitude a new conviction was gradually growing upon him he had long held that slavery was wrong but that it could not be touched in the state where it was recognized by the constitution all that the free states could require in his judgment was that no new territory should be open to slavery he held that all compromises adjusting difficulties between the north and south on the slavery question were as sacred as the constitution now he saw the most important of them all violated was it possible to devise a compromise which would settle forever the conflicting interests he turned over this question continually judge t lyle dickey of illinois once told the hon william pitt kellogg that when the excitement over the kansas nebraska bill first broke out he was with lincoln and several friends attending court one evening several persons including himself and lincoln were discussing the slavery question judge dickey contended that slavery was an institution which the constitution recognized and which could not be disturbed lincoln argued that ultimately slavery must become extinct after a while said judge dickey we went upstairs to bed there were two beds in our room and i remember that lincoln sat up in his nightshirt on the edge of the bed arguing the point with me at last we went to sleep early in the morning i woke up and there was lincoln half sitting up in bed dickey he said i tell you this nation cannot exist half slave and half free oh lincoln said i go to sleep as the months went on this idea took deeper root and in august eighteen fifty five we find it expressed in a letter to george robertson of kentucky our political problem now is can we as a nation continue together permanently forever half slave and half free the problem is too mighty for me may god in his mercy superintend the solution not only was he beginning to see that the union could not exist divided against itself he was beginning to see that in order to fight effectively against the repeal of the missouri compromise and the admission of kansas as a slave state he might be obliged to abandon the whigs all his life he had been a loyal henry clay whig ardent in his devotion to the party sincerely attached to its principles his friends were of that party 
and never had a man's party friends been more willing than his to aid his ambition but the whigs were afraid of the anti-nebraska agitation was he being forced from his party he hardly knew i think i am a whig he wrote his friend speed who had inquired where he stood but others say there are no whigs and that i am an abolitionist this was in august eighteen fifty five the events of the next few months showed him that he must stand by the body of men of all parties whig democratic abolition free soil who opposed the repeal of the missouri compromise and were slowly uniting into the new republican party to fight it the first decisive step to organize these elements in illinois was an editorial convention held on february twenty second eighteen fifty six at decatur one of the editors interested paul selby relates the history of the convention in an unpublished manuscript on the formation of the republican party in illinois from which the following account is quoted this movement first suggested by the morgan journal at jacksonville having received the approval of a considerable number of the anti-nebraska papers of the state resulted in the issue of the following call editorial convention all editors in illinois opposed to the nebraska bill are requested to meet in convention at decatur illinois on the twenty second of february next for the purpose of making arrangements for organizing the anti-nebraska forces in this state for the coming contest all editors favoring the movement will please forward a copy of their paper containing their approval to the office of illinois state chronicle decatur twenty-five papers endorse the call but on the day of the meeting only about half that number of editors put in an appearance one reason for the small number was the fact that on the night before a heavy snowstorm had fallen throughout the state obstructing the passage of trains on the two railroads centering at decatur the meeting was held in the parlor of the castle house afterwards the oglesby house now called the st nicholas hotel those present and participating in the opening proceedings as shown by the official report were e c dougherty register rockford charles faxon post princeton a n ford gazette lakin thomas j pickett republican peoria virgil y ralston whig quincy charles h ray tribune chicago george schneider Staats zeitung chicago paul selby journal jacksonville b f shaw telegraph dixon w j usry chronicle decatur and o p wharton advertiser rock island in the organization paul selby was made chairman and w j usry secretary while messrs ralston ray wharton dougherty prickett and schneider constituted a committee on resolutions the platform adopted as a basis of common and concerted action among the members of the new organization embraced a declaration of principles that would be regarded in this day as most conservative republicanism recognizing the legal rights of the slave states to hold and enjoy their property in slaves under their state laws reaffirming the principles of the declaration of independence with its correlative doctrine that freedom is national and slavery sectional declaring assumption of the right to extend slavery on the plea that it is essential to the security of the institution an invasion of our rights which must be resisted demanding the restoration of the missouri compromise and the restriction of slavery to its present authorized limits advocating the maintenance of the naturalization laws as they are and favoring the widest tolerance in matters of religion and faith a rebuke to know nothingism pledging resistance to assaults upon the common school system and closing with a demand for reformation in the administration of the state government as second only in importance to the question of slavery itself mr lincoln was present in decatur during the day and although he did not take part in the public deliberations of the convention he was in close conference with the committee on resolutions and the impress of his hand is seen in the character of the platform adopted messrs ray and schneider of the chicago press were also influential factors in shaping the declaration of principles with which the new party in illinois started on its long career of almost uninterrupted success 
the day's proceedings ended with a complimentary banquet given to the editors at the same hotel by the citizens of decatur speeches were made in response to toasts by mr lincoln r j oglesby afterwards major general of volunteers and three times governor of illinois then a young lawyer of decatur ray of the chicago tribune ralston of the quincy whig and others among the editors in the course of his speech referring to a movement which some of the editors present had inaugurated to make him the anti-nebraska candidate for governor at the ensuing election mr lincoln spoke in substance as follows i wish to say why i should not be a candidate if i should be chosen the democrats would say it was nothing more than an attempt to resurrect the dead body of the old whig party i would secure the vote of that party and no more and our defeat will follow as a matter of course but i can suggest a name that will secure not only the old whig vote but enough anti-nebraska democrats to give us the victory that man is colonel william h bissell here mr lincoln again displayed his characteristic unselfishness and sagacity that he would at that time have regarded an election to the governorship of the great state of illinois as an honor not worth contending for will scarcely be presumed he was seeking more important results however in the interest of freedom and good government the ending of the political chaos that had prevailed for the past two years and the consolidation of the forces opposed to slavery extension in a compact political organization bissell had been an officer in the mexican war with a good record had afterwards as a member of congress from the bellevue district opposed the kansas nebraska bill and had refused to be browbeaten by jefferson davis into the retraction of statements he had made on the floor of congress as will appear later he was nominated and lincoln's judgment vindicated by his election and the unification of the elements which afterwards composed the republican party one of the last acts of the editorial convention was the appointment of a state central committee consisting of one member for each congressional district and two for the state at large some of the names were suggested by mr lincoln while others received his approval a supplementary resolution recommended the holding of a state convention at bloomington on the twenty ninth of may following and requested the committee just appointed to issue the necessary call it is a coincidence of some interest that on the day the illinois editors were in session at decatur a convention of representatives from different states with a similar object in view for the country at large was in session at pittsburgh pennsylvania the latter was presided over by the venerable francis p blair of maryland while among its most prominent members appear such names as those of governor e d morgan of new york horace greeley preston king david wilmot oliver p morton joshua r giddings zachariah chandler and many others of national reputation a national committee there appointed called the first national convention of the republican party held at philadelphia on the seventeenth of june in the interval between the decatur meeting and the bloomington convention called for may twenty ninth the excitement in the county over kansas grew almost to a frenzy the new state was in the hands of a pro-slavery mob her governor a prisoner her capital in ruins her voters intimidated the newspapers were full of accounts of the attack on sumner in the united states senate by brooks one of the very men who had been expected to be a leader in the bloomington convention paul selby was lying at home prostrated by a cowardly blow from a political opponent little wonder then that when the convention met its members were resolved to take radical action the convention was opened with john m palmer afterwards united states senator in its chair and in a very short time it had adopted a platform appointed delegates to the national convention nominated a state ticket completed in short all the work of organizing the republican party in illinois after this work of organizing and nominating was finished there was a call for speeches the convention felt the need of some powerful amalgamating force which would wield its discordant elements in spite of the best intentions of the members their most manful efforts they knew in their hearts that they were still political enemies that the whig was still a whig the democrat a democrat the abolitionist an abolitionist 
man after man was called to the platform and spoke without producing any marked effect when suddenly there was a call raised of a name not on the program lincoln lincoln give us lincoln the crowd took it up and made the hall ring until a tall figure rose in the back of the audience and slowly strode down the aisle as he turned to his audience there came gradually a great change upon his face there was an expression of intense emotion judge scott of bloomington once told the author it was the emotion of a great soul even in stature he seemed greater he seemed to realize it was a crisis in his life lincoln in fact had come to the parting of the ways in his political life to the moment when he must publicly break with his party for two years he had tried to fight slavery extension under the name of a whig he had found it could not be done and now in spite of the efforts of his conservative friends who had vainly tried to keep him away from the bloomington convention he was facing that convention was openly acknowledging that henceforth he worked with the republican party lincoln's extraordinary human insight and sympathy told him as he looked at his audience that what this body of splendid earnest but groping men needed was to feel that they had undertaken a cause of such transcendent value that beside it all previous alliances ambitions and duties were as nothing if he could make them see the triviality of their differences as compared with the tremendous principle of the new party he was certain they would go forth republicans in spirit as well as in name he began his speech then deeply moved and with a profound sense of the importance of the moment at first he spoke slowly and haltingly but gradually he grew in force and intensity until his hearers arose from their chairs and with pale faces and quivering lips pressed unconsciously towards him starting from the back of the broad platform on which he stood his hands on his hips he slowly advanced towards the front his eyes blazing his face white with passion his voice resonant with the force of his conviction as he advanced he seemed to his audience fairly to grow and when at the end of a period he stood at the front line of the stage hands still on the hips head back raised on his tiptoes he seemed like a giant inspired at that moment he was the handsomest man i ever saw judge scott declared so powerful was his effect on his audience that men and women wept as they cheered and children there that night still remember the scene though at the time they understood nothing of its meaning as he went on there came upon the convention the very emotion he sought to arouse every one in that before incongruous assembly came to feel as one man to think as one man and to purpose and resolve as one man says one of his auditors he had made every one of them pure republican he did something more the indignation which the outrages in kansas and throughout the country had aroused was uncontrolled men talked passionately of war it was at this meeting that lincoln after firing his hearers by an expression which became a watchword of the campaign we won't go out of the union and you shan't poured oil on the wrath of the illinois opponents of the nebraska bill by advising ballots not bullets nothing illustrates better the extraordinary power of lincoln's speech at bloomington than the way he stirred up the newspaper reporters it was before the stenographer had become acclimated in illinois the longhand reports were regularly taken of course all the leading papers of the state leaning towards the new party had reporters at the convention among these was mr joseph medill it was my journalistic duty says mr medill though a delegate to the convention to make a longhand report of the speeches delivered for the chicago tribune i did make a few paragraphs of what lincoln said in the first eight or ten minutes but i became so absorbed in his magnetic oratory that i forgot myself and ceased to take notes and joined with the convention in cheering and stamping and clapping to the end of his speech i well remember that after lincoln sat down and calm had succeeded the tempest i waked out of a sort of hypnotic trance and then thought of my report for the tribune there was nothing written but an abbreviated introduction 
it was some sort of satisfaction to find that i had not been scooped as all the newspaper men present had been equally carried away by the excitement caused by the wonderful oration and had made no report or sketch of the speech a number of lincoln's friends young lawyers most of them were accustomed to taking notes of speeches and as usual sharpened their pencils as he began i attempted for about fifteen minutes says mr herndon lincoln's law partner as was usual with me then to take notes but at the end of that time i threw pen and paper away and lived only in the inspiration of the hour the result of this excitement was that when the convention was over there was no reporter present who had anything for his newspaper they all went home and wrote burning editorials about the speech and its great principle but as to reproducing it they could not men came to talk of it all over illinois they realized that it had been a purifying fire for the party but as to what it contained no one could say gradually it became known as lincoln's lost speech from the very mystery of it its reputation grew greater as time went on but though the convention so nearly to a man lost its head there was at least one auditor who had enough control to pursue his usual habit of making notes of the speeches he heard this was a young lawyer on the same circuit as lincoln mr h c whitney for some three weeks before the convention lincoln and whitney had been attending court at danville they had discussed the political situation in the state carefully and to whitney lincoln had stated his convictions and determinations in a way whitney had absorbed lincoln's speech beforehand as indeed any one must have done who was with lincoln when he was preparing an address it being his habit to discuss points and to repeat them aloud indifferent to who heard him whitney had gone to the convention intending to make notes knowing as he did that lincoln had not written out what he was going to say fortunately he had a cool enough head to keep to his purpose he made his notes and on returning to judge davis's home in bloomington where he with lincoln and one or two others were staying he enlarged them while the others discussed the speech these notes whitney kept for many years always intending to write them out but never attending to it until the author in eighteen ninety six learned that he had them and urged him to expand them this mr whitney did and the speech was first published in mcclure's magazine for september eighteen ninety six mr whitney does not claim that he has made a full report he does claim that the argument is correct and that in many cases the expressions are exact a few quotations will show any one familiar with lincoln's speeches that mr whitney has caught much of their style for instance the following we come we are here assembled together to protest as well as we can against a great wrong and to take measures as well as we now can to make that wrong right to place the nation as far as it may be possible now as it was before the repeal of the missouri compromise and the plain way to do this is to restore the compromise and to demand and determine that kansas shall be free while we affirm and reaffirm if necessary our devotions to the principles of the declaration of independence let our practical work here be limited to the above we know that there is not a perfect agreement of sentiment here on the public questions which might be rightfully considered in this convention and that the indignation which we all must feel cannot be helped but all of us must give up something for the good of the cause there is one desire which is uppermost in the mind one wish common to us all to which no dissent will be made and i counsel you earnestly to bury all resentment to sink all personal feeling make all things work to a common purpose in which we are united and agreed about and which all present will agree is absolutely necessary which must be done by any rightful mode if there be such slavery must be kept out of kansas the test the pinch is right there if we lose kansas to freedom an example will be set which will prove fatal to freedom in the end we therefore in the language of the bible must lay axe to the root of the tree temporizing will not do longer now is the time for decision 
for firm persistent resolute action we have made a good beginning here today as our methodist friends would say i feel it is good to be here while extremists may find some fault with the moderation of our platform they should remember that the battle is not always to the strong nor the race to the swift in grave emergencies moderation is generally safer than radicalism and as this struggle is likely to be long and earnest we must not by our action repel any who are in sympathy with us in the main but rather win all that we can to our standard we must not belittle nor overlook the facts of our condition that we are new and comparatively weak while our enemies are entrenched and relatively strong they have the administration and the political power and right or wrong at present they have the numbers our friends who urge an appeal to arms with so much force and eloquence should recollect that the government is arrayed against us and that the numbers are now arrayed against us as well or to state it nearer to the truth they are not yet expressly and affirmatively for us and we should repel friends rather than gain them by saying anything savoring of revolutionary methods as it now stands we must appeal to the sober sense and patriotism of the people we will make converts day by day we will grow strong by calmness and moderation we will grow strong by the violence and injustice of our adversaries and unless truth be a mockery and justice a hollow lie we will be in the majority after a while and then the revolution which we will accomplish will be none the less radical from being the result of pacific measures the battle of freedom is to be fought out on principle slavery is a violation of the eternal right we have temporized with it from the necessities of our condition but as sure as god reigns and school children read that black foul lie can never be consecrated into god's hallowed truth i will not say that we may not sooner or later be compelled to meet force by force but that time has not yet come and if we are true to ourselves may never come do not mistake that the ballot is stronger than the bullet therefore let the legions of slavery use bullets let us wait patiently till november and file ballots at them in return and by that peaceful policy i believe we shall ultimately win did you ever my friends seriously reflect upon the speed with which we are tending downwards within the memory of men now present the leading statesmen of virginia could make genuine red-hot abolitionist speeches in old virginia and as i have said now even in free kansas it is a crime to declare that it is free kansas the very sentiments that i and others have just uttered would entitle us and each of us to the ignominy and seclusion of a dungeon and yet i suppose that like paul we were free-born but if this thing is allowed to continue it will be but one step further to impress the same rule in illinois the conclusion of all is that we must restore the missouri compromise we must highly resolve that kansas must be free we must reinstate the birthday promise of the republic we must reaffirm the declaration of independence we must make good in essence as well as in form madison's avowal that the word slave ought not to appear in the constitution and we must even go further and decree that only local law and not that time-honored instrument shall shelter a slaveholder we must make this a land of liberty in fact as it is in name but in seeking to attain these results so indispensable if the liberty which is our pride and boast shall endure we will be loyal to the constitution and to the flag of our union and no matter what our grievance even though kansas shall come in as a slave state and no matter what theirs even if we shall restore the compromise we will say to the southern disunionists we won't go out of the union and you shan't End of section 17. Section 18 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen the lincoln douglas debates part one the greatest speech ever made in illinois and it puts lincoln on the track for the presidency was the comment made by enthusiastic republicans on lincoln's speech before the bloomington convention conscious that it was he who had put the breath of life into their organization the party instinctively turned to him as its leader the effect of this local recognition was at once perceptible in the national organization less than three weeks after the delivery of the bloomington speech the national convention of the republican party met in philadelphia june seventeenth to nominate candidates for the presidency and vice-presidency lincoln's name was the second proposed for the latter office and on the first ballot he received one hundred and ten votes the news reached him at urbana illinois where he was attending court one of his companions reading from a daily paper just received from chicago the results of the ballot the simple name lincoln was given without the name of the man's state lincoln said indifferently that he did not suppose it could be himself and added that there was another great man of the name a man from massachusetts the next day however he knew that it was himself to whom the convention had given so strong an endorsement he also knew that the ticket chosen was fremont and dayton the campaign of the following summer and fall was one of intense activity for lincoln in illinois and the neighboring states he made over fifty speeches only fragments of which have been preserved one of the first important ones was delivered on july fourth eighteen fifty six at a great mass meeting at princeton the home of the lovejoys and the bryants the people were still irritated by the outrages in kansas and by the attack on sumner in the senate and the temptation to deliver a stirring and indignant oration must have been strong lincoln's speech was however a fine example of political wisdom an historical argument admirably calculated to convince his auditors that they were right in their opposition to slavery extension but so controlled and sane that it would stir no impulsive radical to violence there probably was not uttered in the united states on that critical fourth of july eighteen fifty six when the very foundation of the government was in dispute and the day itself seemed a mockery a cooler more logical speech than this by the man who a month before had driven a convention so nearly mad that the very reporters had forgotten to make notes and the temper of this princeton speech lincoln kept throughout the campaign in spite of the valiant struggle of the republicans buchanan was elected but lincoln was in no way discouraged the republicans had polled one million three hundred and forty one thousand two hundred and sixty four votes in the country in illinois they had given fremont nearly one hundred thousand votes and they had elected their candidate for governor general bissell lincoln turned from arguments to encouragement and good counsel all of us he said at a republican banquet in chicago a few weeks after the election who did not vote for mr buchanan taken together are a majority of four hundred thousand but in the late contest we were divided between fremont and fillmore can we not come together for the future let every one who really believes and is resolved that free society is not and shall not be a failure and who can conscientiously declare that in the last contest he has done only what he thought best let every such one have charity to believe that every other one can say as much thus let bygones be bygones let past differences as nothing be and with steady eye on the real issue let us reinaugurate the good old central idea of the republic we can do it the human heart is with us god is with us we shall again be able not to declare that all states as states are equal nor yet that all citizens as citizens are equal but to renew the broader better declaration including both these and much more that all men are created equal the spring of eighteen fifty seven gave lincoln a new line of argument 
buchanan was scarcely in the presidential chair before the supreme court in the decision of the dred scott case declared that a negro could not sue in the united states courts and that congress could not prohibit slavery in the territories this decision was such an evident advance of the slave power that there was a violent uproar in the north douglas went at once to illinois to calm his constituents what he cried oppose the supreme court is it not sacred to resist it is anarchy lincoln met him fairly on the issue in a speech at springfield in june eighteen fifty seven we believe as much as judge douglas perhaps more in obedience to and respect for the judicial department of government but we think the dred scott decision is erroneous we know the court that has made it has often overruled its own decisions and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this we offer no resistance to it if this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges and without any apparent partisan bias and in accordance with legal public expectation and with the steady practice of the departments throughout our history and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true or if wanting in some of these it had been before the court more than once and had there been affirmed and reaffirmed through a course of years it then might be perhaps would be factious nay even revolutionary not to acquiesce in it as a precedent but when as is true we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence it is not resistance it is not factious it is not even disrespectful to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country let douglas cry awful anarchy revolution as much as he would lincoln's arguments against the dred scott decision appealed to common sense and won him commendation all over the country even the radical leaders of the party in the east seward sumner theodore parker began to notice him to read his speeches to consider his arguments with every month of eighteen fifty seven lincoln grew stronger and his election in illinois as united states senatorial candidate in eighteen fifty eight against douglas would have been insured if douglas had not suddenly broken with buchanan and his party in a way which won him the hearty sympathy and respect of a large part of the republicans of the north by a flagrantly unfair vote the pro-slavery leaders of kansas had secured the adoption of the lecompton constitution allowing slavery in the state president buchanan urged congress to admit kansas with her bogus constitution douglas who would not sanction so base an injustice opposed the measure voting with the republicans steadily against the admission the buchananists outraged at what they called douglas's apostasy broke with him then it was that a part of the republican party notably horace greeley at the head of the new york tribune struck by the boldness and nobility of douglas's opposition began to hope to win him over from the democrats to the republicans their first step was to counsel the leaders of their party in illinois to put up no candidate against douglas for the united states senatorship in eighteen fifty eight lincoln saw this change on the part of the republican leaders with dismay greeley is not doing me right he said i am a true republican and have been tried already in the hottest part of the anti-slavery fight and yet i find him taking up douglas a veritable dodger once a tool of the south now its enemy and pushing him to the front he grew so restless over the returning popularity of douglas among the republicans that herndon his law partner determined to go east to find out the real feelings of the eastern leaders towards lincoln herndon had for a long time been in correspondence with the leading abolitionists and had no difficulty in getting interviews the returns he brought back from his canvas were not altogether reassuring seward sumner phillips garrison beecher theodore parker all spoke favorably of lincoln and seward sent him word that the republicans would never take up so slippery a quantity as douglas had proved himself 
but greeley the all-important greeley was lukewarm the republican standard is too high he told herndon we want something practical douglas is a brave man forget the past and sustain the righteous good god righteous eh groaned herndon in his letter to lincoln but though the encouragement which came to lincoln from the east in the spring of eighteen fifty eight was meagre that which came from illinois was abundant there the republicans supported him in whole-hearted devotion in june the state convention meeting in springfield to nominate its candidate for senator declared that abraham lincoln was its first and only choice as the successor of stephen a douglas the press was jubilant unanimity is a weak word wrote the editor of the bloomington pantograph to express the universal and intense feeling of the convention lincoln 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 was the cry everywhere whenever the senatorship was alluded to delegates from chicago and from cairo from the wabash and the illinois from the north the center and the south were alike fierce with enthusiasm whenever that loved name was breathed enemies at home and misjudging friends abroad who have looked for dissension among us on the question of the senatorship will please take notice that our nomination is a unanimous one and that in the event of a republican majority in the next legislature no other name than lincoln's will be mentioned or thought of by a solitary republican legislator one little incident in the convention was a pleasing illustration of the universality of the lincoln sentiment cook county had brought a banner into the assemblage inscribed cook county for abraham lincoln during a pause in the proceedings a delegate from another county rose and proposed with the consent of the cook county delegation to amend the banner by substituting for cook county the word which i hold in my hand at the same time unrolling a scroll and revealing the word illinois in huge capitals the cook delegation promptly accepted the amendment and amidst a perfect hurricane of hurrahs the banner was duly altered to express the sentiment of the whole republican party of the state thus illinois for abraham lincoln on the evening of the day of his nomination lincoln addressed his constituents the first paragraph of his speech gave the key to the campaign he proposed a house divided against itself cannot stand i believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free i do not expect the house to fall but i do expect it will cease to be divided it will become all one thing or all the other then followed the famous charge of conspiracy against the slavery advocates the charge that pierce buchanan chief justice taney and douglas had been making a concerted effort to legalize the institution of slavery in all the states old as well as new north as well as south he marshalled one after another of the measures that the pro-slavery leaders had secured in the past four years and clinched the argument by one of his inimitable illustrations when we see a lot of framed timbers different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places and by different workmen stephen franklin roger and james for instance and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places and not a piece too many or too few not omitting even scaffolding or if a single piece be lacking we see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared yet to bring such a piece in in such a case we find it impossible not to believe that stephen and franklin and roger and james all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first blow was struck the speech was severely criticized by lincoln's friends it was too radical it was sectional he heard the complaints unmoved 
if i had to draw a pen across my record he said one day and erase my whole life from sight and i had one poor gift or choice left as to what i should save from the wreck i should choose that speech and leave it to the world unerased the speech was in fact one of great political adroitness it forced douglas to do exactly what he did not want to do in illinois explain his own record during the past four years explain the true meaning of the kansas nebraska bill discuss the dred scott decision say whether or not he thought slavery so good a thing that the country could afford to extend it instead of confining it where it would be in course of gradual extinction douglas wanted the republicans of illinois to follow greeley's advice forgive the past he wanted to make the most among them of his really noble revolt against the attempt of his party to fasten an unjust constitution on kansas lincoln would not allow him to bask for an instant in the sun of that revolt he crowded him step by step through his party's record and compelled him to face what he called the profound central truth of the republican party slavery is wrong and ought to be dealt with as wrong but it was at once evident that douglas did not mean to meet the issue squarely he called the doctrine of lincoln's house divided against itself speech sectionalism his charge of conspiracy false his talk of the wrong of slavery extension abolitionism this went on for a month then lincoln resolved to force douglas to meet his arguments and challenged him to a series of joint debates douglas was not pleased his reply to the challenge was irritable even slightly insolent to those of his friends who talked with him privately of the contest he said i do not feel between you and me that i want to go into this debate the whole country knows me and has me measured lincoln as regards myself is comparatively unknown and if he gets the best of this debate and i want to say he is the ablest man the republicans have got i shall lose everything and lincoln will gain everything should i win i shall gain but little i do not want to go into a debate with abe publicly however he carried off the prospect confidently even jauntily mr lincoln he said patronizingly is a kind amiable intelligent gentleman in the meantime his constituents boasted loudly of the fine spectacle they were going to give the state the little giant chawing up old abe many of lincoln's friends looked forward to the encounter with foreboding often in spite of their best intentions they showed anxiety shortly before the first debate came off at ottawa says judge h w beckwith of danville illinois i passed the chenery house then the principal hotel in springfield the lobby was crowded with partisan leaders from various sections of the state and mr lincoln from his greater height was seen above the surging mass that clung about him like a swarm of bees to their ruler he looked careworn but he met the crowd patiently and kindly shaking hands answering questions and receiving assurances of support the day was warm and at the first chance he broke away and came out for a little fresh air wiping the sweat from his face as he passed the door he saw me and taking my hand inquired for the health and views of his friends over in vermilion county he was assured they were wide awake and further told that they looked forward to the debate between him and senator douglas with deep concern from the shadow that went quickly over his face the pained look that came to give quickly way to a blaze of eyes and quiver of lips i felt that mr lincoln had gone beneath my mere words and caught my inner and current fears as to the result and then in a forgiving jocular way peculiar to him he said sit down i have a moment to spare and will tell you a story having been on his feet for some time he sat on the end of the stone step leading into the hotel door while i stood closely fronting him you have he continued seen two men about to fight yes many times well one of them brags about what he means to do he jumps high in the air cracking his heels together smites his fists and wastes his breath trying to scare somebody you see the other fellow he says not a word 
here mr lincoln's voice and manner changed to a great earnestness and repeating you see the other man says not a word his arms are at his side his fists are closely doubled up his head is drawn to the shoulder and his teeth are set firm together he is saving his wind for the fight and as sure as it comes off he will win it or die a-trying he made no other comment but arose bade me good-bye and left me to apply the illustration it was inevitable that douglas's friend should be sanguine lincoln's doubtful the contrast between the two candidates was almost pathetic senator douglas was the most brilliant figure in the political life of the day winning in personality fearless as an advocate magnetic in eloquence shrewd in political manoeuvring he had every quality to captivate the public his resources had never failed him from his entrance into illinois politics in eighteen thirty four he had been the recipient of every political honor his party had to bestow for the past eleven years he had been a member of the united states senate where he had influenced all the important legislation of the day and met in debate every strong speaker of north and south in eighteen fifty two and again in eighteen fifty six he had been a strongly supported though unsuccessful candidate for the democratic presidential nomination in eighteen fifty eight he was put at or near the head of every list of possible presidential candidates made up for eighteen sixty how barren lincoln's public career in comparison three terms in the lower house of the state assembly one term in congress then a failure which drove him from public life now he returns as a bolter from his party a leader in a new organization which the conservatives are denouncing as visionary impractical revolutionary no one recognized more clearly than lincoln the difference between himself and his opponent with me he said sadly in comparing the careers of himself and douglas the race of ambition has been a failure a flat failure with him it has been one of splendid success he warned his party at the outset that with himself as a standard-bearer the battle must be fought on principle alone without any of the external aids which douglas's brilliant career gave senator douglas is of world-wide renown he said all the anxious politicians of his party or who have been of his party for years past have been looking upon him as certainly at no distant day to be the president of the united states they have seen in his round jolly fruitful face post offices land offices marshalships and cabinet appointments charge ships and foreign missions bursting and sprouting out in wonderful exuberance ready to be laid hold of by their greedy hands and as they have been gazing upon this attractive picture so long they cannot in the little distraction that has taken place in the party bring themselves to give up the charming hope but with greedier anxiety they rush about him sustain him and give him marches triumphal entries and receptions beyond what even in the days of his highest prosperity they could have brought about in his favor on the contrary nobody has ever expected me to be president in my poor lean lank face nobody has ever seen that any cabbages were sprouting out these are disadvantages all taken together that the republicans labor under we have to fight this battle upon principle and upon principle alone if one will take a map of illinois and locate the points of the lincoln and douglas debates held between august twenty first and october fifteenth eighteen fifty eight he will see that the whole state was traversed in the contest the first took place at ottawa about seventy-five miles southwest of chicago on august twenty first the second at freeport near the wisconsin boundary on august twenty seventh the third was in the extreme southern part of the state at jonesboro on september fifteenth three days later the contestants met one hundred and fifty miles northeast of jonesboro at charleston the fifth sixth and seventh debates were held in the western part of the state at galesburg october seventh quincy october thirteenth and alton october fifteenth constant exposure and fatigue were unavoidable in meeting these engagements 
both contestants spoke almost every day through the intervals between the joint debates and as railroad communication in illinois in 1858 was still very incomplete they were often obliged to resort to horse carriage or steamer to reach the desired points judge douglas succeeded however in making this difficult journey something of a triumphal procession he was accompanied throughout the campaign by his wife a beautiful and brilliant woman and by a number of distinguished democrats on the illinois central railroad he always had a special car sometimes a special train frequently he swept by lincoln sidetracked in an accommodation or freight train the gentleman in that car evidently smelt no royalty in our carriage laughed lincoln one day as he watched from the caboose of a laid-up freight train the decorated special of douglas flying by it was only when lincoln left the railroad and crossed the prairie to speak at some isolated town that he went in state the attentions he received were often very trying to him he detested what he called fizzle gigs and fireworks and would squirm in disgust when his friends gave him a genuine prairie ovation usually when he was going to a point distant from the railway a distinguished citizen met him at the station nearest the place with a carriage when they were come within two or three miles of the town a long procession with banners and band would appear winding across the prairie to meet the speaker a speech of greeting was made and then the ladies of the entertainment committee would present lincoln with flowers sometimes even winding a garland about his head and lank figure his embarrassment at these attentions was thoroughly appreciated by his friends at the ottawa debate the enthusiasm of his supporters was so great that they insisted on carrying him from the platform to the house where he was to be entertained powerless to escape from the clutches of his admirers he could only cry don't boys let me down come now don't but the boys persisted and they tell today proudly of their exploit and of the cordial handshake lincoln all embarrassed as he was gave each of them when at last he was free on arrival at the towns where the joint debates were held douglas was always met by a brass band and a salute of thirty-two guns the union was composed of thirty-two states in eighteen fifty eight and was escorted to the hotel in the finest equipage to be had lincoln's supporters took delight in showing their contempt of douglas's elegance by affecting a republican simplicity often carrying their candidate through the streets on a high and unadorned hay-rack drawn by farm horses the scenes in the towns on the occasions of the debates were perhaps never equalled at any other of the hustings of this country no distance seemed too great for the people to go no vehicle too slow or fatiguing at charleston there was a great delegation of men women and children present which had come in a long procession from indiana by farm wagons afoot on horseback and in carriages the crowds at three or four of the debates were for that day immense there were estimated to be from eight thousand to fourteen thousand people at quincy some six thousand at alton from ten thousand to fifteen thousand at charleston some twenty thousand at ottawa many of those at ottawa came the night before it was a matter of but a short time says mr george Beatty of ottawa until the few hotels the livery stables and private houses were crowded and there were no accommodations left then the campaigners spread out about the town and camped in whatever spot was most convenient they went along the bluff and on the bottom lands and that night the campfires spread up and down the valley for a mile made it look as if an army was gathered about us when the crowd was massed at the place of the debate the scene was one of the greatest hubbub and confusion on the corners of the squares and scattered around the outskirts of the crowd were fakers of every description selling painkillers and ague cures watermelons and lemonade jugglers and beggars plied their trades and the brass bands of all the four corners within twenty-five miles tooted and pounded at hail columbia happy land or columbia the gem of the ocean conspicuous in the processions at all the points was what lincoln called the basket of flowers thirty-two young girls in a resplendent car representing the union 
at charleston a thirty-third young woman rode behind the car representing kansas she carried a banner inscribed i will be free a motto which brought out from nearly all the newspaper reporters the comment that she was too fair to be long free the mottoes at the different meetings epitomized the popular conception of the issues and the candidates among the lincoln sentiments were illinois born under the ordinance of eighty seven free territories and free men free pulpits and free preachers free press and a free pen free schools and free teachers westward the star of empire takes its way the girls link on to lincoln their mothers were for clay abe the giant killer edgar county for the tall sucker a striking feature of the crowds was the number of women they included the intelligent and lively interest they took in the debates caused much comment no doubt mrs douglas's presence had something to do with this they were particularly active in receiving the speakers and at quincy lincoln on being presented with what the local press described as a beautiful and elegant bouquet took pains to express his gratification at the part women everywhere took in the contest while this helter-skelter outpouring of prairiedom had the appearance of being little more than a great jollification a lawless country fair in reality it was with the majority of the people a profoundly serious matter with every discussion it became more vital indeed in the first debate which was opened and closed by douglas the relation of the two speakers became dramatic it was here that douglas hoping to fasten on lincoln the stigma of abolitionist charged him with having undertaken to abolitionize the old whig party and having been in eighteen fifty four a subscriber to a radical platform proclaimed at springfield this platform douglas read lincoln when he replied could only say he was never at the convention knew nothing of the resolutions but the impression prevailed that he was cornered the next issue of the chicago press and tribune dispelled it that paper had employed to report the debates the first shorthand reporter in chicago mr robert l hitt now a member of congress and the chairman of the committee on foreign affairs mr hitt when douglas began to read the resolutions took an opportunity to rest supposing he could get the original from the speaker he took down only the first line of each resolution he missed douglas after the debate but on reaching chicago where he wrote out his report he sent out an assistant to the files to find the platform adopted at the springfield convention it was brought but when mr hitt began to transcribe it he saw at once that it was widely different from the one douglas had read there was great excitement in the office and the staff ardently republican went to work to discover where the resolutions had come from it was found that they originated at a meeting of radical abolitionists with whom lincoln had never been associated the press and tribune announced the forgery as it was called in a caustic editorial the little dodger cornered and caught within a week even the remote school districts of illinois were discussing douglas's action and many of the most important papers of the nation had made it a subject of editorial comment almost without exception douglas was condemned no amount of explanation on his part helped him the particularity of douglas's charge said the louisville journal precludes the idea that he was simply and innocently mistaken lovers of fair play were disgusted and those of douglas's own party who would have applauded a trick too clever to be discovered could not forgive him for one which had been found out greeley came out bitterly against him and before long wrote to lincoln and herndon that douglas was like the man's boy who he said didn't weigh so much as he expected and he always knew he wouldn't douglas's error became a sharp-edged sword in lincoln's hand without directly referring to it he called his hearer's attention to the forgery every time he quoted a document by his elaborate explanation that he believed unless there was some mistake on the part of those with whom the matter originated and which he had been unable to detect that this was correct 
once when douglas brought forth a document lincoln blandly remarked that he could scarcely be blamed for doubting its genuineness since the introduction of the springfield resolutions at ottawa End of section 18. Section 19 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, The Lincoln-Douglas Debates, Part 2. It was in the second debate at Freeport that Lincoln made the boldest stroke of the contest. Soon after the Ottawa debate, in discussing his plan for the next encounter with a number of his political friends, Washburn, Cook, Judd, and others, he told them he proposed to ask Douglas four questions, which he read. One and all cried halt at the second question. Under no condition, they said, must he put it. If it were put, Douglas would answer it in such a way as to win the senatorship. The morning of the debate, while on the way to Freeport, Lincoln read the same questions to Mr. Joseph Medill. "'I do not like this second question, Mr. Lincoln,' said Mr. Medill. The two men argued to their journey's end, but Lincoln was still unconvinced. Even after he reached Freeport, several Republican leaders came to him, pleading, "'Do not ask that question.' He was obdurate and he went on the platform with a higher head a haughtier step than his friends had noted in him before lincoln was going to ruin himself the committee said despondently one would think he did not want the senatorship the mooted question ran in lincoln's notes can the people of a united states territory in any lawful way against the wish of any citizen of the united states exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution lincoln had seen the irreconcilableness of douglas's own measure of popular sovereignty which declared that the people of a territory should be left to regulate their domestic concerns in their own way subject only to the constitution and the decision of the supreme court in the dred scott case that slaves being property could not under the constitution be excluded from a territory he knew that if douglas said no to this question his illinois constituents would never return him to the senate he believed that if he said yes the people of the south would never vote for him for president of the united states he was willing himself to lose the senatorship in order to defeat douglas for the presidency in eighteen sixty i am after larger game the battle of eighteen sixty is worth a hundred of this he said confidently the question was put and douglas answered it with rare artfulness it matters not he cried what way the supreme court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the constitution the people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it as they please for the reason that slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations those police regulations can only be established by the local legislature and if the people are opposed to slavery they will elect representatives to that body who will by unfriendly legislation effectually prevent the introduction of it into their midst if on the contrary they are for it their legislation will favor its extension his democratic constituents went wild over the clever way in which douglas had escaped lincoln's trap he now practically had his election the republicans shook their heads lincoln only was serene he alone knew what he had done the freeport debate had no sooner reached the pro-slavery press than a storm of protest went up douglas had betrayed the south he had repudiated the supreme court decision he had declared that slavery could be kept out of the territories by other legislation than a state constitution the freeport doctrine or the theory of unfriendly legislation as it became known spread month by month and slowly but surely made douglas an impossible candidate in the south the force of the question was not realized in full by lincoln's friends until the democratic party met in charleston south carolina in eighteen sixty 
and the southern delegates refused to support douglas because of the answer he gave to lincoln's question in the freeport debate of eighteen fifty eight do you recollect the argument we had on the way up to freeport two years ago over the question i was going to ask judge douglas lincoln asked mr joseph medill when the latter went to springfield a few days after the election of eighteen sixty yes said medill i recollect it very well don't you think i was right now we were both right the question hurt douglas for the presidency but it lost you the senatorship yes and i have won the place he was playing for from the beginning of the campaign lincoln supplemented the strength of his arguments by inexhaustible good humor douglas physically worn harassed by the trend which lincoln had given the discussions irritated that his adroitness and eloquence could not so cover the fundamental truth of the republican position but that it would up again often grew angry even abusive lincoln answered him with most effective raillery at havana where he spoke the day after douglas he said i am informed that my distinguished friend yesterday became a little excited nervous perhaps and he said something about fighting as though referring to a pugilistic encounter between him and myself did anybody in this audience hear him use such language cries of yes i am informed further that somebody in his audience rather more excited and nervous than himself took off his coat and offered to take the job off judge douglas's hands and fight lincoln himself did anybody here witness that warlike proceeding laughter and cries of yes well i merely desire to say that i shall fight neither judge douglas nor his second i shall not do this for two reasons which i will now explain in the first place a fight would prove nothing which is an issue in this contest it might establish that judge douglas is a more muscular man than myself or it might demonstrate that i am a more muscular man than judge douglas but this question is not referred to in the cincinnati platform nor in either of the springfield platforms neither result would prove him right nor me wrong and so of the gentleman who volunteered to do this fighting for him if my fighting judge douglas would not prove anything it would certainly prove nothing for me to fight his bottle-holder my second reason for not having a personal encounter with the judge is that i don't believe he wants it himself he and i are about the best friends in the world and when we get together he would no more think of fighting me than of fighting his wife therefore ladies and gentlemen when the judge talked about fighting he was not giving vent to any ill feeling of his own but merely trying to excite well enthusiasm against me on the part of his audience and as i find he was tolerably successful we will call it quits more difficult for lincoln to take good-naturedly than threats and hard names was the irrelevant matters which douglas dragged into the debates to turn attention from the vital arguments thus douglas insisted repeatedly on taunting lincoln because his zealous friends had carried him off the platform at ottawa lincoln was so frightened by the questions put to him said douglas that he could not walk he tried to arouse the prejudice of the audience by absurd charges of abolitionism lincoln wanted to give negroes social equality he wanted a negro wife he was willing to allow fred douglas to make speeches for him again he took up a good deal of lincoln's time by forcing him to answer to a charge of refusing to vote supplies for the soldiers in the mexican war lincoln denied and explained until at last at charleston he turned suddenly to douglas's supporters dragging one of the strongest of them the hon o b ficklin with whom he had been in congress in eighteen forty eight to the platform i do not mean to do anything with mr ficklin he said except to present his face and tell you that he personally knows it to be a lie and mr ficklin had to acknowledge that lincoln was right judge douglas said lincoln in speaking of this policy is playing cuttlefish a small species of fish that has no mode of defending himself when pursued except by throwing out a black fluid which makes the water so dark the enemy cannot see it and thus it escapes the question at stake was too serious in lincoln's judgment for platform jugglery 
every moment of his time which douglas forced him to spend answering irrelevant charges he gave begrudgingly he struggled constantly to keep his speeches on the line of solid argument slowly but surely those who followed the debates began to understand this it was douglas who drew the great masses to the debates in the first place it was because of him that the public men and the newspapers of the east as well as of the west watched the discussions but as the days went on it was not douglas who made the impression during the hours of the speeches the two men seemed well mated i can only recall one fact of the debates says mrs william crotty of seneca illinois that i felt so sorry for lincoln while douglas was speaking and then to my surprise i felt so sorry for douglas when lincoln replied the disinterested to whom it was an intellectual game felt the power and charm of both men partisans had each reason enough to cheer it was afterwards as the debates were talked over by auditors as they lingered at the country store or were grouped on the fence in the evening or when they were read in the generous reports which the newspapers of illinois and even of other states gave that the thoroughness of lincoln's argument was understood even the first debate at ottawa had a surprising effect i tell you says mr george Beatty of ottawa that debate set people thinking on these important questions in a way they hadn't dreamed of i heard any number of men say this thing is an awfully serious question and i have about concluded lincoln has got it right my father a thoughtful god-fearing man said to me as we went home to supper george you are young and don't see what this thing means as i do douglas's speeches of squatter sovereignty please you younger men but i tell you that with us older men it's a great question that faces us we've either got to keep slavery back or it's going to spread all over the country that's the real question that's behind all this lincoln is right and that was the feeling that prevailed i think among the majority after the debate was over people went home talking about the danger of slavery getting a hold in the north this territory had been democratic la salle county on the morning of the day of the debate was democratic but when the next day came around hundreds of democrats had been made republicans owing to the light in which lincoln had brought forward the fact that slavery threatened it was among lincoln's own friends however that his speeches produced the deepest impression they had believed him to be strong but probably there was no one of them who had not felt dubious about his ability to meet douglas many even feared a fiasco gradually it began to be clear to them that lincoln was the stronger could it be that lincoln really was a great man the young republican journalists of the press and tribune scripps hitt medill began to ask themselves the question one evening as they talked over lincoln's arguments a letter was received it came from a prominent eastern statesman who is this man that is replying to douglas in your state he asked do you realize that no greater speeches have been made on public questions in the history of our country that his knowledge of the subject is profound his logic unanswerable his style inimitable similar letters kept coming from various parts of the country before the campaign was over lincoln's friends were exultant their favorite was a great man a full-grown man as one of them wrote in his paper the country at large watched lincoln with astonishment when the debates began there were republicans in illinois of wider national reputation judge lyman trumbull then senator was better known he was an able debater and a speech which he made in august against douglas's record called from the new york evening post the remark this is the heaviest blow struck at senator douglas since he took the field in illinois it is unanswerable and we suspect that it will be fatal trumbull's speech the post afterwards published in pamphlet form besides trumbull owen lovejoy oglesby and palmer were all speaking that lincoln should not only have so far outstripped men of his own party but should have out-argued douglas was the cause of comment everywhere 
no man of this generation said the evening post editorially at the close of the debate has grown more rapidly before the country than lincoln in this canvass as a matter of fact lincoln had attracted the attention of all the thinking men of the country the first thing that really awakened my interest in him said henry ward beecher was his speech parallel with douglas in illinois and indeed it was that manifestation of ability that secured his nomination to the presidency but able as were lincoln's arguments deep as was the impression he had made he was not elected to the senatorship douglas won fairly enough though it is well to note that if the republicans did not elect a senator they gained a substantial number of votes over those polled in eighteen fifty six lincoln accepted the result with a serenity inexplicable to his supporters to him the contest was but one battle in a durable struggle little matter who won now if in the end the right triumphed from the first he had looked at the final result not at the senatorship i do not claim gentlemen to be unselfish he said at chicago in july i do not pretend that i would not like to go to the united states senate i make no such hypocritical pretense but i do say to you that in this mighty issue it is nothing to you nothing to the mass of the people of the nation whether or not judge douglas or myself shall ever be heard of after this night it may be a trifle to either of us but in connection with this mighty question upon which hang the destinies of the nation perhaps it is absolutely nothing the intense heat and fury of the debates the defeat in november did not alter a jot this high view i am glad i made the late race he wrote mr a g henry it gave me a hearing on the great and durable question of the age which i would have had in no other way and though i now sink out of view and shall be forgotten i believe i have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after i am gone at that date perhaps no one appreciated the value of what lincoln had done as well as he did himself he was absolutely sure he was right and that in the end people would see it though he might not rise he knew his cause would douglas had the ingenuity to be supported in the late contest both as the best means to break down and to uphold the slave interest he wrote no ingenuity can keep these antagonistic elements in harmony long another explosion will soon occur his whole attention was given to conserving what the republicans had gained we have some one hundred and twenty thousand clear republican votes that pile is worth keeping together to consoling his friends you are feeling badly he wrote to n b judd chairman of the republican committee and this too shall pass away never fear to rallying for another effort the cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even one hundred defeats if lincoln had at times a fear that his defeat would cause him to be set aside it soon was dispelled the interest awakened in him was genuine and it spread with the wider reading and discussion of his arguments he was besieged by letters from all parts of the union congratulations encouragements criticisms invitations for lectures poured in upon him and he became the first choice of his entire party for political speeches the greater number of these invitations he declined he had given so much time to politics since eighteen fifty four that his law practice had been neglected and he was feeling poor but there were certain of the calls which could not be resisted douglas spoke several times for the democrats of ohio in the nineteen fifty nine campaign for governor and lincoln naturally was asked to reply he made but two speeches one at columbus on september sixteenth and the other at cincinnati on september seventeenth but he had great audiences on both occasions the columbus speech was devoted almost entirely to answering an essay by douglas which had been published in the september number of harper's magazine and which began by asserting that under our complex system of government it is the first duty of american statesmen to mark distinctly the dividing line between federal and local authority 
it was an elaborate argument for popular sovereignty and attracted national attention indeed at the moment it was the talk of the country lincoln literally tore it to bits what is judge douglas's popular sovereignty he asked it is as a principle no other than that if one man chooses to make a slave of another man neither that other man nor anybody else has a right to object applied in government as he seeks to apply it it is this if in a new territory into which a few people are beginning to enter for the purpose of making their homes they choose to either exclude slavery from their limits or to establish it there however one or the other may affect the persons to be enslaved or the infinitely greater number of persons who are afterward to inhabit that territory or the other members of the families or communities of which they are but an incipient member or the general head of the family of states as parent of all however their action may affect one or the other of these there is no power or right to interfere that is douglas's popular sovereignty applied it was in this address that lincoln uttered the oft-quoted paragraphs i suppose the institution of slavery really looks small to him he is so put up by nature that a lash upon his back would hurt him but a lash upon anybody else's back does not hurt him that is the build of the man and consequently he looks upon the matter of slavery in this unimportant light judge douglas ought to remember when he is endeavoring to force this policy upon the american people that while he is put up that way a good many are not he ought to remember that there was once in this country a man by the name of thomas jefferson supposed to be a democrat a man whose principles and policy are not very prevalent among democrats to-day it is true but that man did not take exactly this view of the insignificance of the element of slavery which our friend judge douglas does in contemplation of this thing we all know he was led to exclaim i tremble for my country when i remember that god is just we know how he looked upon it when he thus expressed himself there was danger to this country danger of the avenging justice of god in that little unimportant popular sovereignty question of judge douglas he supposed there was a question of god's eternal justice wrapped up in the enslaving of any race of men or any man and that those who did so braved the arm of jehovah that when a nation thus dared the almighty every friend of that nation had cause to dread his wrath choose thee between jefferson and douglas as to what is the true view of this element among us one interesting point about the columbus address is that in it appears the germ of the cooper institute speech delivered five months later in new york city lincoln made so deep an impression in ohio by his speeches that the state republican committee asked permission to publish them together with the lincoln douglas debates as campaign documents in the presidential election of the next year in december he yielded to the persuasion of his kansas political friends and delivered five lectures in that state only fragments of which have been preserved unquestionably the most effective piece of work he did that winter was the address at cooper institute new york on february twenty seventh he had received an invitation in the fall of eighteen fifty nine to lecture at plymouth church brooklyn to his friends it was evident that he was greatly pleased by the compliment but that he feared that he was not equal to an eastern audience after some hesitation he accepted provided they would take a political speech if he could find time to get up no other when he reached new york he found that he was to speak there instead of brooklyn and felt that he was certain to have a distinguished audience fearful lest he was not as well prepared as he ought to be conscious too no doubt that he had a great opportunity before him he spent nearly all of the two days and a half before his lecture in revising his matter and in familiarizing himself with it in order that he might be sure that he was heard he arranged with his friend mason brayman who had come to new york with him to sit in the back of the hall and in case he did not speak loud enough to raise his high hat on a cane mr lincoln's audience was a notable one even for new york it included william cullen bryant who introduced him horace greeley 
david dudley field and many more well-known men of the day it is doubtful if there were any persons present even his best friends who expected that lincoln would do more than interest his hearers by his sound arguments many have confessed since that they feared his queer manner and quaint speeches would amuse people so much that they would fail to catch the weight of his logic but to the surprise of everybody lincoln impressed his audience from the start by his dignity and his seriousness his manner was to a new york audience a very strange one but it was captivating wrote an auditor he held the vast meeting spellbound and as one by one his oddly expressed but trenchant and convincing arguments confirmed the soundness of his political conclusions the house broke out in wild and prolonged enthusiasm i think i never saw an audience more thoroughly carried away by an orator the cooper union speech was founded on a sentence from one of douglas's ohio speeches our fathers when they framed the government under which we live understood this question just as well and even better than we do now douglas claimed that the fathers held that the constitution forbade the federal government controlling slavery in the territories lincoln with infinite care had investigated the opinions and votes of each of the fathers whom he took to be the thirty-nine men who signed the constitution and showed conclusively that a majority of them certainly understood that no proper division of local from federal authority nor any part of the constitution forbade the federal government to control slavery in the federal territories not only did he show this of the thirty-nine framers of the original constitution but he defied anybody to show that one of the seventy-six members of the congress which framed the amendments to the constitution ever held any such view let all he said who believe that our fathers who framed the government under which we live understood this question just as well and even better than we do now speak as they spoke and act as they acted upon it this is all republicans ask all republicans desire in relation to slavery as those fathers marked it so let it be again marked as an evil not to be extended but to be tolerated and protected only because of and so far as its actual presence among us makes that toleration and protection a necessity let all the guarantees those fathers gave it be not grudgingly but fully and fairly maintained for this republicans contend and with this so far as i know or believe they will be content one after another he took up and replied to the charges the south was making against the north at the moment sectionalism radicalism giving undue prominence to the slave question stirring up insurrection among slaves refusing to allow constitutional rights and to each he had an unimpassioned answer impregnable with facts the discourse was ended with what lincoln felt to be a precise statement of the opinion of the question on both sides and of the duty of the republican party under the circumstances this portion of his address is one of the finest early examples of that simple and convincing style in which most of his later public documents were written if slavery is right he said all words acts laws and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away if it is right we cannot justly object to its nationality its universality if it is wrong they cannot justly insist upon its extension its enlargement all they ask we could readily grant if we thought slavery right all we ask they could as readily grant if they thought it wrong their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy thinking it right as they do they are not to blame for desiring its full recognition as being right but thinking it wrong as we do can we yield to them can we cast our votes with their view and against our own in view of our moral social and political responsibilities can we do this wrong as we think slavery is we can yet afford to let it alone where it is because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation 
but can we while our votes will prevent it allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in these free states if our sense of duty forbids this then let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances wherewith we are so industriously plied and belabored contrivances such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong vain is the search for a man who should be neither a living man nor a dead man such as a policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care such as union appeals beseeching true union men to yield to disunionists reversing the divine rule and calling not the sinners but the righteous to repentance such as invocations to washington imploring men to unsay what washington said and undo what washington did neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government nor of dungeons to ourselves let us have faith that right makes might and in that faith let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it from new york lincoln went to new hampshire to visit his son robert then at phillips exeter academy his coming was known only a short time before he arrived and hurried arrangements were made for him to speak at concord manchester exeter and dover at concord the address was made in the afternoon on only a few hours notice nevertheless he had a great audience so eager were men at the time to hear anybody who had serious arguments on the slavery question something of the impression lincoln made in new hampshire may be gathered from the following article mr lincoln in new hampshire which appeared in the boston atlas and bee for march fifth the concord statesman says that notwithstanding the rain of thursday rendering travelling very inconvenient the largest hall in that city was crowded to hear mr lincoln the editor says it was one of the most powerful logical and compacted speeches to which ever it was our fortune to listen an argument against the system of slavery and in defense of the position of the republican party from the deductions of which no reasonable man could possibly escape he fortified every position assumed by proofs which it is impossible to gainsay and while his speech was at intervals enlivened by remarks which elicited applause at the expense of the democratic party there was nevertheless not a single word which tended to impair the dignity of the speaker or weaken the force of the great truths he uttered the statesman adds that the address was perfect and was closed by a peroration which brought his audience to their feet we are not extravagant in the remark that a political speech of greater power has rarely if ever been uttered in the capital of new hampshire at its conclusion nine roof-raising cheers were given three for the speaker three for the republicans of illinois and three for the republicans of new hampshire on the same evening mr lincoln spoke at manchester to an immense gathering in smith's hall the mirror a neutral paper gives the following enthusiastic notice of his speech the audience was a flattering one to the reputation of the speaker it was composed of persons of all sorts of political notions earnest to hear one whose fame was so great and we think most of them went away thinking better of him than they anticipated they should he spoke an hour and a half with great fairness great apparent candor and with wonderful interest he did not abuse the south the administration or the democrats or indulge in any personalities with the solitary exception of a few hits at douglas's notions he is far from prepossessing in personal appearance and his voice is disagreeable and yet he wins your attention and good will from the start he indulges in no flowers of rhetoric no eloquent passages he is not a wit a humorist or a clown yet so great a vein of pleasantry and good nature pervades what he says gliding over a deep current of practical argument he keeps his hearers in a smiling good mood with their mouths open ready to swallow all he says his sense of the ludicrous is very keen and an exhibition of that is the clincher of all his arguments not the ludicrous acts of persons but ludicrous ideas 
hence he is never offensive and steals away willingly into his train of belief persons who are opposed to him from the first half hour his opponents would agree with every word he uttered and from that point he began to lead them off little by little cunningly till it seemed as if he had got them all into his fold he displays more shrewdness more knowledge of the masses of mankind than any public speaker we have heard since long jim wilson left for california from new hampshire lincoln went to connecticut where on march fifth he spoke at hartford on march sixth at new haven on march eighth at woonsocket on march ninth at norwich there are no reports of the new hampshire speeches but two of the connecticut speeches were published in part and one in full their effect was very similar according to the newspapers of the day to that in new hampshire described by the atlas and b by his debates with douglas and the speeches in ohio kansas new york and new england lincoln had become a national figure in the minds of all the political leaders of the country and of the thinking men of the north never in the history of the united states had a man become prominent in a more logical and intelligent way at the beginning of the struggle between the repeal of the missouri compromise in eighteen fifty four abraham lincoln was scarcely known outside of his own state even most of the men whom he had met in his brief term in congress had forgotten him yet in four years he had become one of the central figures of his party and now by worsting the greatest orator and politician of his time he had drawn the eyes of the nation to him it had been a long road he had travelled to make himself a national figure twenty-eight years before he had deliberately entered politics he had been beaten but had persisted he had succeeded and failed he had abandoned the struggle and returned to his profession his outraged sense of justice had driven him back and for six years he had travelled up and down illinois trying to prove to men that slavery extension was wrong it was by no one speech by no one argument that he had wrought every day his ceaseless study and pondering gave him new matter and every speech he made was fresh he could not repeat an old speech he said because the subject enlarged and widened so in his mind as he went on that it was easier to make a new one than an old one he had never yielded in his campaign to tricks of oratory never played on emotions he had been so strong in his convictions of the right of his case that his speeches had been arguments pure and simple their elegance was that of a demonstration in euclid they persuaded because they proved he had never for a moment counted personal ambition before the cause to ensure an ardent opponent of the kansas nebraska bill in the united states senate he had at one time given up his chance for the senatorship to show the fallacy of douglas's argument he had asked a question which his party pleaded with him to pass by assuring him that it would lose him the election in every step of this six years he had been disinterested calm unyielding and courageous he knew he was right and could afford to wait the result is not doubtful he told his friends we shall not fail if we stand firm we shall not fail wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it but sooner or later the victory is sure to come the country amazed at the rare moral and intellectual character of lincoln began to ask questions about him and then his history came out a pioneer home little schooling few books hard labor at all the many trades of the frontiersman a profession mastered a nights by the light of a friendly cooper's fire an early entry into politics and law and then twenty-five years of incessant poverty and struggle the homely story gave a touch of mystery to the figure which loomed so large men felt a sudden reverence for a mind and heart developed to those noble proportions in so unfriendly a habitat they turned instinctively to one so familiar with strife for help in solving the desperate problem with which the nation had grappled and thus it was that at fifty years of age lincoln became a national figure End of section nineteen
Section 20 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19, Lincoln's Nomination in 1860, Part 1. The possibility of Abraham Lincoln becoming the presidential candidate of the Republican Party in 1860 was probably first discussed by a few of his friends in 1856. The dramatic speech which, in May of that year, gave him the leadership of his party in Illinois, and the unexpected and flattering attention he received a few weeks later at the Republican National Convention suggested the idea but there is no evidence that anything more was excited than a little speculation the impression lincoln made two years later in the lincoln and douglas debates kindled a different feeling it convinced a number of astute illinois politicians that judicious effort would make lincoln strong enough to justify the presentation of his name as a candidate in eighteen sixty on the ground of pure availability one of the first men to conceive this idea was jesse w fell a local politician of bloomington illinois during the lincoln and douglas debates fell was traveling in the middle and eastern states he was surprised to find that lincoln's speeches attracted general attention that many papers copied liberally from them and that on all sides men plied him with questions about the career and personality of the new man before fell left the east he had made up his mind that lincoln must be pushed by his own state as its presidential candidate one evening soon after returning home he met lincoln in bloomington where the latter was attending court and drew him into a deserted law office for a confidential talk i have been east lincoln said he as far as boston and up into new hampshire travelling in all the new england states save maine in new york new jersey pennsylvania ohio michigan and indiana and everywhere i hear you talked about very frequently i have been asked who is this man lincoln of your state now canvassing in opposition to senator douglas being as you know an ardent republican and your friend i usually told them we had in illinois two giants instead of one that douglas was the little one as they all knew but that you were the big one which they didn't all know but seriously lincoln judge douglas being so widely known you are getting a national reputation through him and the truth is i have a decided impression that if your popular history and efforts on the slavery question can be sufficiently brought before the people you can be made a formidable if not a successful candidate for the presidency what's the use of talking of me for the presidency was lincoln's reply whilst we have such men as seward chase and others who are so much better known to the people and whose names are so intimately associated with the principles of the republican party everybody knows them nobody scarcely outside of illinois knows me besides is it not as a matter of justice due to such men who have carried this movement forward to its present status in spite of fearful opposition personal abuse and hard names i really think so fell continued his persuasions and finally requested lincoln to furnish him a sketch of his life which could be put out in the east the suggestion grated on lincoln's sensibilities he had no chance why force himself fell he said rising and wrapping his old gray shawl around his tall figure i admit that i am ambitious and would like to be president i am not insensible to the compliment you pay me and the interest you manifest in the matter but there is no such good luck in store for me as the presidency of these united states besides there is nothing in my early history that would interest you or anybody else and as judge davis says it won't pay good night and he disappeared into the darkness lincoln's defeat in november eighteen fifty eight in the contest for the united states senatorship in no way discouraged his friends a few days after the november election when it was known that douglas had been re-elected senator the chicago democrat then edited by long john wentworth printed an editorial nearly a column in length headed abraham lincoln his work in the campaign then just closed was reviewed and commended in the highest terms his speeches the democrat declared 
will be recognized for a long time to come as the standard authorities upon those topics which overshadow all others in the political world of our day and our children will read them and appreciate the great truths which they so forcibly inculcate with even a higher appreciation of their worth than their fathers possessed while listening to them we for our part said the democrat further consider that it would be but a partial appreciation of his services to our noble cause that our next state republican convention should nominate him for governor as unanimously and enthusiastically as it did for senator with such a leader and with our just cause we would sweep the state from end to end with a triumph so complete and perfect that there would be scarce enough of the scattered and demoralized forces of the enemy left to tell the story of its defeat and this state should also present his name to the national republican convention first for president and next for vice-president we should then say to the united states at large that in our opinion the great man of illinois is abraham lincoln and none other than abraham lincoln all through the year eighteen fifty nine a few men in illinois worked quietly but persistently to awaken a demand throughout the state for lincoln's nomination the greater number of these were lawyers on lincoln's circuit his lifelong friends men like judge davis leonard swett and judge logan who not only believed in him but loved him and whose efforts were doubly effective because of their affection in addition to these were a few shrewd politicians who saw in lincoln the available man the situation demanded and a group represented by john m palmer who remembering lincoln's magnanimity in throwing his influence to trumbell in eighteen fifty four in order to send a sound anti-nebraska man to the united states senate wanted as senator palmer himself put it to pay lincoln back then there were a few young men who had been won by lincoln in the debates with douglas and who threw youthful enthusiasm and conviction into their support the first time his name was suggested as a candidate in the newspapers indeed was because the young editor of the central illinois gazette mr w o stoddard had caught a glimpse of lincoln's inner might and concluding in a sudden burst of boyish exultation that lincoln was the greatest man he had ever seen or heard of had rushed off and written an editorial nominating him for the presidency this editorial was published on may fourth eighteen fifty nine the work which these men did at this time cannot be traced with any definiteness it consisted mainly in talking up their candidate they were greatly aided by the newspapers the press indeed followed a concerted plan that had been carefully laid out by the republican state committee in the office of the chicago tribune to give an appearance of spontaneity to the newspaper canvas it was arranged that the country papers should first take up lincoln's name joseph medill editor of the tribune and secretary of the committee says that a rock island paper opened the campaign lincoln soon felt the force of this effort in his behalf letters came to him from unexpected quarters offering aid everywhere he went on the circuit men sought him to discuss the situation in the face of an undoubted movement for him he quailed the interest was local could it ever be more above all had he the qualifications for president of the united states he asked himself these questions as he pondered a reply to an editor who had suggested announcing his name and he wrote i must in all candor say i do not think myself fit for the presidency this was in april eighteen fifty nine in the july following he still declared himself unfit even in the following november he had little hope of nomination for my single self he wrote to a correspondent who had suggested the putting of his name on the ticket i have enlisted for the permanent success of the republican cause and for this object i shall labor faithfully in the ranks unless as i think not probable the judgment of the party shall assign me a different position the last weeks of eighteen fifty nine and the first of eighteen sixty convinced lincoln however that fit or not he was in the field fell who as corresponding secretary of the republican state central committee had been travelling constantly in the interests of the organization 
brought him such proof that his candidacy was generally approved of that in december eighteen fifty nine he consented to write the little sketch of his life now known as lincoln's autobiography he wrote it with a little inward shrinking a half shame that it was so meagre there is not much of it he apologized in sending the document for the reason i suppose that there is not much of me if anything be made out of it i wish it to be modest and not to go beyond the material by the opening of eighteen sixty lincoln had concluded that though he might not be a very promising candidate at all events he was now in so deep that he must have the approval of his own state and he began to work in earnest for that i am not in a position where it would hurt much for me not to be nominated on the national ticket he wrote to norman b judd but i am where it would hurt some for me to not get the illinois delegates can you help me a little in your end of the vineyard the plans of the lincoln men were well matured about the first of december eighteen fifty nine medill had gone to washington ostensibly as a tribune correspondent but really to promote lincoln's nomination before writing any lincoln letters for the tribune says mr medill in his reminiscences i began preaching lincoln among the congressmen i urged him chiefly upon the ground of availability in the close and doubtful states with what seemed like reasonable success february sixteenth eighteen sixty the tribune came out editorially for lincoln and medill followed a few days later with a ringing letter from washington naming lincoln as a candidate on whom both conservative and radical sentiment could unite and declaring that he now heard lincoln's name mentioned for president in washington ten times as often as it was one month ago about the time when medill was writing thus norman b judd as a member of the republican national committee was executing a manoeuvre the importance of which no one realized but the illinois politicians this was securing the convention for chicago as the spring passed and the counties of illinois held their conventions lincoln found that save in the north where seward was strong he was unanimously recommended as the candidate at chicago when the state convention met at decatur may ninth and tenth he received an ovation of so picturesque and unique a character that it colored all the rest of the campaign the delegates were in session when lincoln came in as a spectator and was invited to a seat on the platform soon after richard oglesby one of lincoln's ardent supporters asked that an old democrat of macon county be allowed to offer a contribution to the convention the offer was accepted and a curious banner was borne up the hall the standard was made of two weather-worn fence rails decorated with flags and streamers and bearing the inscription abraham lincoln the rail candidate for president in eighteen sixty two rails from a lot of three thousand made in eighteen thirty by thomas hanks and abe lincoln whose father was the first pioneer of macon county a storm of applause greeted the banner followed by cries of lincoln lincoln rising lincoln said pointing to the banner i suppose i am expected to reply to that i cannot say whether i made those rails or not but i am quite sure i have made a great many just as good the speech was warmly applauded and one delegate an influential german and an ardent seward man george schneider after witnessing the demonstration turned to his neighbor and said seward has lost the illinois delegation he was right for when later john m palmer brought forth a resolution that abraham lincoln is the choice of the republican party of illinois for the presidency and the delegates from this state are instructed to use all honorable means to secure his nomination by the chicago convention and to vote as a unit for him it was enthusiastically adopted while the politicians of illinois were thus preparing for the campaign the republicans of the east hardly realized that lincoln was or could be made a possibility in the first four months of eighteen sixty his name was almost unmentioned as a presidential candidate in the public prints of the east in a list of twenty-one prominent candidates for the presidency in eighteen sixty prepared by d w bartlett and published in new york towards the end of eighteen fifty nine lincoln's name is not mentioned 
nor does it appear in a list of thirty-four of our living representative men prepared for presidential purposes by john savage and published in philadelphia in eighteen sixty the most important notice at this period of which we know was a casual mention in an editorial in the new york evening post february fifteenth the post considered it time for the republicans to speak out about the nominee at the coming convention and remarked with such men as seward and chase banks and lincoln and others in plenty let us have two republican representative men to vote for this was ten days before the cooper union speech and the new england tour which undoubtedly did much to recommend lincoln as a logical and statesmanlike thinker and debater though there is no evidence that it created him a presidential following in the east save perhaps in new hampshire indeed it was scarcely to be expected that prudent and conservative men would conclude that because he could make a good speech he would make a good president they knew him to be comparatively untrained in public life and comparatively untrained in large affairs they naturally preferred a man who had a record for executive statesmanship up to the opening of the convention in may there was in fact no specially prominent mention of lincoln by the eastern press greeley intent on undermining seward though as yet nobody perceived him to be so printed in the new york weekly tribune the paper which went to the country at large correspondence favoring the nomination of bates and reed mclean and bell cameron fremont dayton chase wade but not lincoln the new york herald of may first in discussing editorially the nominee of the black republicans recognized four living two dead aspirants the living were seward banks chase and cameron the dead bates and mclean may tenth the independent in an editorial on the nomination at chicago said give us a man known to be true upon the only question that enters into the canvas a seward a chase a wade a sumner a fessenden a banks but it did not mention lincoln his most conspicuous eastern recognition before the convention was in harper's weekly of may twelfth his face being included in a double page of portraits of eleven prominent candidates for the republican presidential nomination at chicago brief biographical sketches appeared in the same number the last and the shortest of them being of lincoln it was on may sixteenth that the republican convention of eighteen sixty formally opened at chicago but for days before the city was in a tumult of expectation and preparation the audacity of inviting a national convention to meet there in the condition in which chicago chanced to be at that time was purely chicagoan no other city would have risked it in ten years chicago had nearly quadrupled its population and it was believed that the feat would be repeated in the coming decade in the first flush of youthful energy and ambition the town had undertaken the colossal task of raising itself bodily out of the grassy marsh where it had been originally placed to a level of twelve feet above lake michigan and of putting underneath a good solid foundation when the invitation to the convention was extended half the buildings in chicago were on stilts some of the streets had been raised to the new grade others still lay in the mud half the sidewalks were poised high on piles and half were still down on a level with the lake a city with a conventional sense of decorum would not have cared to be seen in this demoralized condition but chicago perhaps conceived that it would but prove her courage and confidence to show the country what she was doing and so she had the convention come but it was not the convention alone which came besides the delegates the professional politicians the newspaper men and the friends of the several candidates there came a motley crowd of men hired to march and cheer for particular candidates a kind of out-of-door clack which did not wait for a point to be made in favor of its man but went off in rounds of applause at the mere mention of his name new york brought the greatest number of these professional applauders the leader of them being a notorious prize-fighter and street politician a sort of white blackbird says bromley 
one tom higher with the new york delegation which numbered all told fully two thousand seward men came dodworth's band one of the celebrated musical organizations of that day while new york sent the largest number pennsylvania was not far behind there being about one thousand five hundred persons present from that state from new england long as was the distance there were many trains of excursionists the new england delegation took gilmore's band with it and from boston to chicago stirred up every community in which it stopped with music and speeches several days before the convention opened fully one half of the members of the united states house of representatives were in the city to still further increase the throng were hundreds of merely curious spectators whom the flattering inducements of the fifteen railroads centering in chicago at that time had tempted to take a trip there were fully forty thousand strangers in the city during the sitting of the convention the streets for a week were the forum of this multitude processions for seward for cameron for chase for lincoln marched and countermarched brave with banners and transparencies and noisy with country bands and hissing rockets every street corner became a rostrum where impromptu harangues for any of a dozen candidates might be happened upon in this hurly-burly two figures were particularly prominent tom Heyer, who managed the open-air seward demonstration and horace greeley who was conducting independently his campaign against seward greeley in his fervor talked incessantly it was only necessary for someone to say in a rough but friendly way there's old greeley and all within hearing distance grouped about him not infrequently the two or three to whom he began speaking increased until that which had started as a conversation ended as a speech in this half spontaneous half organized demonstration of the streets lincoln's followers were conspicuous state pride made chicago feel that she must stand by her own lincoln banners floated across every street and buildings and omnibuses were decorated with lincoln emblems when the illinois delegation saw that new york and pennsylvania had brought in so many outsiders to create enthusiasm for their respective candidates they began to call in supporters from the neighboring localities leonard sweat says that they succeeded in getting together fully ten thousand men from illinois and indiana ready to march shout or fight for lincoln as the case required not only was the city full of people days before the convention began but the delegations had organized and actual work was in progress every device conceivable by an ingenious opposition was resorted to in order to weaken seward the most formidable of the candidates the night before the opening of the convention a great mass meeting was held in the wigwam the seward men had arranged to have only advocates of their own candidates speak but the clever opposition detected the game and william d kelly of pennsylvania who was for lincoln or for wade got the floor and held it until nearly midnight doggedly talking against time until an audience of twelve thousand had dwindled to less than one thousand one of the first of the delegations to begin activities was that of illinois the tremont house had been chosen as its headquarters and here were gathered almost all the influential friends lincoln had in the state they came determined to win if human effort could compass it and men never put more intense and persistent energy into a cause judge davis was naturally the head of the body but judge logan leonard sweat john m palmer richard oglesby n b judd jesse w fell and a score more were with him we worked like nailers governor oglesby often declared in after years the effort for lincoln had to begin in the illinois delegation itself in spite of the rail episode at decatur the state convention was by no means unanimous for lincoln our delegation was instructed for him wrote leonard sweat to josiah drummond but of the twenty-two votes in it by uncautiously selecting the men there were eight who would have gladly gone for seward the reason of this is in this fact the northern counties of this state are more overwhelmingly republican than any other portion of the continent 
i could pick twenty-five contiguous counties giving larger republican majorities than any other adjacent counties in any state the result is many people there are for seward and such men had crept upon the delegation they intended in good faith to go for lincoln but talked despondingly and really wanted and expected finally to vote as i have indicated we had also in the north and about chicago a class of men who always want to turn up on the winning side and who would do no work although their feelings were really for us for fear it would be the losing element and would place them out of favor with the incoming power these men were dead weights the center and south with many individual exceptions to the classes i have named were warmly for lincoln whether he won or lost the lawyers of our circuit went there determined to leave no stone unturned and really they aided by some of our state officers and a half dozen men from various portions of the state were the only tireless sleepless unwavering and ever vigilant friends he had End of section twenty. Section twenty one of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One by Ida M. Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nineteen Lincoln's Nomination in eighteen sixty. Part two. The situation which the Illinois delegation faced, briefly put, was this the republican party had in eighteen sixty but one prominent candidate william h seward by virtue of his great talents his superior cultivation and his splendid services in anti-slavery agitation he was the choice of the majority of the republican party it was certain that at the opening of the convention he would have nearly enough votes to nominate him but still there was a considerable and resolute opposition the grounds of this were several but the most substantial and convincing was that illinois indiana pennsylvania and new jersey all declared that they could not elect seward if he was nominated andrew g curtin of pennsylvania and henry s lane of indiana candidates for governor in their respective states were both his active opponents not from dislike of him but because they were convinced that they would themselves be defeated if he headed the republican ticket it was clear to the entire party that pennsylvania and indiana were essential to republican success and since many states with which seward was the first choice held success in november as more important than seward they were willing to give their support to an available man but the difficulty was to unite this opposition nearly every state which considered seward an unsafe candidate had a favorite son whom it was pushing as available pennsylvania wanted cameron new jersey dayton ohio chase mclean or wade massachusetts banks vermont colomer greeley who alone was as influential as a state delegation urged bates of missouri illinois task was to unite this opposition on lincoln she began her work with a next-door neighbor the first state approached says mr sweat was indiana she was about equally divided between bates and mclean saturday sunday and monday were spent upon her when finally she came to us unitedly with twenty-six votes and from that time acted efficiently with us with indiana to aid her illinois now succeeded in drawing a few scattering votes in making an impression on new hampshire and virginia and in persuading vermont to think of lincoln as a second choice matters began to look decidedly cheerful may fourteenth monday the new york herald's last dispatch declared that the contest had narrowed down to seward lincoln and wade the boston herald's dispatch of the same day reported abe lincoln is booming up tonight as a compromise candidate and his friends are in high spirits and this was the situation when the convention finally opened on wednesday may sixteenth the assembly room in which the convention met was situated conveniently at the corner of market and lake streets it had been built especially for the occasion by the chicago republican club and in the fashion of the west in that day was called by the indigenous name of wigwam it was a low characterless structure fully one hundred and eighty feet long by one hundred feet wide 
the roof rose in the segment of a circle so that one side was higher than the other and across this side and the two ends were deep galleries facing the ungalleried side was a platform reserved for the delegates a great floor one hundred and forty feet long and thirty-five feet deep raised some four feet from the ground level with committee rooms at each end this vast structure of pine boards had been rescued from ugliness through the energetic efforts of the committee assisted by the republican women of the city who scarcely less interested than their husbands and brothers strove in every way to contribute to the success of the convention they wreathed the pillars and the galleries with masses of green hung banners and flags brought in busts of american notables ordered great allegorical paintings of justice liberty and the like to suspend on the walls borrowed the whole series of healy portraits of american statesmen in short made the wigwam at least gay and festive in aspect foreign interest added something to the furnishings the chair placed on the platform for the use of the chairman of the convention was donated by michigan as the first chair made in that state it was an armchair of the most primitive description the seat dug out of an immense log and mounted on large rockers another chair one made for the occasion attracted a great deal of attention it was constructed of thirty-four kinds of wood each piece from a different state or territory kansas being appropriately represented by the weeping willow a symbol of her grief at being still excluded from the sisterhood of states the gavel used by the chairman was more interesting even than his chair having been made from a fragment of commodore perry's brave lawrence into the wigwam on the morning of the sixteenth of may there crowded fully ten thousand persons to the spectator in the gallery the scene was vividly picturesque and animated around him were packed hundreds of women gay in the high-peaked flower-filled bonnets and the bright shawls and plaids of the day below on the platform and floor were many of the notable men of the united states william m everts thomas corwin carl schurz david wilmot thaddeus stevens joshua giddings george william curtis francis p blair and his two sons andrew h reeder george ashman gideon wells preston king cassius m clay gratz brown george s boutwell thurlow weed in the multitude the newspaper representatives outnumbered the delegates fully nine hundred editors and reporters were present a body scarcely less interesting than the convention itself horace greeley samuel bowles murat halstead isaac h bromley joseph medill horace white joseph hawley henry villard a k mcclure names so familiar to-day all represented various journals at chicago in eighteen sixty and in some cases were active workers in the caucuses it was evident at once that the members of the convention some five hundred out of the attendant ten thousand were not more interested in its proceedings than the spectators whose approval and disapproval quickly and emphatically expressed swayed and to a degree controlled the delegates wednesday and thursday mornings were passed in the usual opening work of a convention while officers were formally elected and a platform adopted the real interest centered in the caucuses which were held almost uninterruptedly illinois was in a frenzy of anxiety no men ever worked as our boys did wrote mr sweat i did not for the whole week sleep two hours a night they ran from delegation to delegation haranguing pleading promising but do their best they could not concentrate the opposition our great struggle says senator palmer was to prevent lincoln's nomination for the vice presidency the seward men were perfectly willing that he should go on the tail of the ticket in fact they seemed determined that he should be given the vice presidential nomination we were not troubled so much by the antagonism of the seward men as by the overtures they were constantly making to us they literally overwhelmed us with kindness judge david davis came to me in the tremont house greatly agitated at the way things were going he said palmer you must go with me at once to see the new jersey delegation i asked what i could do 
well said he there is a grave and venerable judge over there who is insisting that lincoln shall be nominated for vice-president and seward for president we must convince the judge of his mistake we went i was introduced to the gentleman and we talked about the matter for some time he praised seward but he was especially effusive in expressing his admiration for lincoln he thought that seward was clearly entitled to first place and that lincoln's eminent merits entitled him to second place i listened for some time and then said sir you may nominate mr lincoln for vice-president if you please but i want you to understand that there are forty thousand democrats in illinois who will support this ticket if you give them an opportunity we are not whigs and we never expect to be whigs we will never consent to support two old whigs on this ticket we are willing to vote for mr lincoln with a democrat on the ticket but we will not consent to vote for two whigs i have seldom seen a more indignant man turning to judge davis he said judge davis is it possible that party spirit so prevails in illinois that judge palmer properly represents public opinion oh said davis affecting some distress at what i had said oh judge you can't account for the conduct of these old locofocos will they do as palmer says certainly there are forty thousand of them and as palmer says not one of them will vote for two whigs we left the new jersey member in a towering rage when we were back at the tremont house i said davis you are an infernal rascal to sit there and hear that man berate me as he did you really seem to encourage him judge davis said nothing but chuckled as if he had greatly enjoyed the joke this incident is illustrative of the kind of work we had to do we were compelled to resort to this argument that the old democrats then ready to affiliate with the republican party would not tolerate two whigs on the ticket in order to break up the movement to nominate lincoln for vice-president the seward men recognized in lincoln their most formidable rival and that was why they wished to get him out of the way by giving him second place on the ticket the uncertainty on thursday was harrowing and if the ballot had been taken on the afternoon of that day as was at first intended seward probably would have been nominated illinois indiana and pennsylvania all felt this and shrewdly managed to secure from the convention a reluctant adjournment until friday morning in spite of the time this manoeuvre gave however seward's nomination seemed sure so greeley telegraphed the tribune at midnight on thursday at the same hour the correspondent of the herald new york telegraphed the friends of seward are firm and claim ninety votes for him on the first ballot opposition to seward not fixed on any man lincoln is the strongest and may have altogether forty votes the various delegations are still caucusing it was after these messages were sent that illinois and indiana summoned all their energies for a final desperate effort to unite the uncertain delegates on lincoln and that pennsylvania went through the last violent throes of coming to a decision that night was one of the dramatic episodes of which none perhaps was more nearly tragic than the spectacle of seward's followers confident of success celebrating in advance the nomination of their favorite while scores of determined men laid the plans ultimately effective for his overthrow all night the work was kept up hundreds of pennsylvanians indianians and illinoisians says murat halstad never closed their eyes i saw henry s lane at one o'clock pale and haggard with cane under his arm walking as if for a wager from one caucus room to another at the tremont house in connection with them he had been operating to bring the vermonters and virginians to the point of deserting seward in the pennsylvania delegation which on wednesday had agreed on mclean as its second choice and lincoln as its third a hot struggle was waged to secure the vote of the delegation as a unit for cameron until a majority of the delegates directed otherwise judge s newton pettis who proposed this resolution worked all night to secure votes for it at the caucus to be held early in the morning the illinois men ran from delegate to caucus from editor to outsider 
no man who knew lincoln and believed in him indeed was allowed to rest but was dragged away to this or that delegate to persuade him that the rail candidate as lincoln had already begun to be called was fit for the place colonel hoyt then a resident of chicago spent half the night telling thaddeus stevens of pennsylvania what he knew of lincoln while all this was going on a committee of twelve men from pennsylvania new york ohio indiana illinois and iowa were consulting in the upper story of the tremont house before their session was over they had agreed that in case lincoln's votes reached a specified number on the following day the votes of the states represented in that meeting so far as these twelve men could effect the result should be given to him the night was over at last and at ten o'clock the convention reassembled the great wigwam was packed with a throng hardly less excited than the members of the actual convention while without for blocks away a crowd double that within pushed and strained every nerve alert to catch the movements of the convention the nominations began at once the hon william m everts presenting the name of william h seward the new yorkers had prepared a tremendous clack which now broke forth a deafening shout which says leonard sweat i confess appalled us a little but new york in preparing her clack had only given an idea to illinois the illinois committee to offset it had made secret but complete preparations for what was called a spontaneous demonstration from lake front to prairie the committee had collected every stentorian voice known and early thursday morning while seward's men were marching exultantly about the streets the owners of these voices had been packed into the wigwam where their special endowment would be most effective the women present had been requested to wave their handkerchiefs at every mention of lincoln's name and hundreds of flags had been distributed to be used in the same way a series of signals had been arranged to communicate to the thousands without the moment when a roar from them might influence the convention within when n b judd nominated lincoln this machinery began to work it did well but a moment later in greeting the seconding of seward's nomination new york outbellowed illinois caleb b smith of indiana then seconded the nomination of lincoln says mr sweat and the west came to his rescue no mortal ever before saw such a scene the idea of us hoosiers and suckers being out screamed would have been as bad to them as the loss of their man five thousand people at once leaped to their seats women not wanting in the number and the wild yell made soft vesper breathings of all that had proceeded no language can describe it a thousand steam whistles ten acres of hotel gongs a tribe of comanches headed by a choice vanguard from pandemonium might have mingled in the scene unnoticed as the roar died out a voice cried abe lincoln has it by the sound now let us ballot and judge logan beside himself with screeching and excitement called out mr president in order or out of order i propose this convention and audience give three cheers for the man who is evidently their nominee the balloting followed without delay the illinois men believed they had one hundred votes to start with on counting they found they had a hundred and two more hopeful still no other opposition candidate approached them pennsylvania's man according to the printed reports of that day had but fifty and one-half votes greeley's man forty-eight chase forty-nine while mclean pennsylvania's second choice had but twelve if seward was to be beaten it must be now and it was for pennsylvania to say the delegation hurried to a committee room where judge pettis disregarding the action of the caucus by which mclean had been adopted as the delegation's second choice moved that on the second ballot pennsylvania's vote be cast solidly for lincoln the motion was carried returning to the hall the delegation found the second ballot under way in a moment the name of pennsylvania was called the whole wigwam heard the answer pennsylvania casts her fifty-two votes for abraham lincoln the meaning was clear the break to lincoln had begun 
new york sat as if stupefied while all over the hall cheer followed cheer it seemed but a moment before the second ballot was ended and it was known that lincoln's vote had risen from one o two to one eighty one the tension as the third ballot was taken was almost unbearable a hundred pencils kept score while the delegations were called and it soon became apparent that lincoln was outstripping seward the last vote was hardly given before the whisper went around two hundred and thirty-one and one-half for lincoln two and a half more will give him the nomination an instant of silence followed in which the convention grappled with the idea and tried to pull itself together to act the chairman of the ohio delegation was the first to get his breath mr president he cried springing on his chair and stretching out his arm to secure recognition i rise to change four votes from mr chase to mr lincoln it took a moment to realize the truth new york saw it and the white faces of her noble delegation were bowed in despair greeley saw it and a guileless smile spread over his features as he watched thurlow weed press his hand hard against his wet eyelids illinois saw it and the tears poured from the eyes of more than one of the overwrought devoted men as they grasped one another's hands and vainly struggled against the sobs which kept back their shouts the crowd saw it and broke out in a mad hurrah the scene which followed wrote one spectator baffles all human description after an instant's silence as deep as death which seemed to be required to enable the assembly to take in the full force of the announcement the wildest and mightiest yell for it can be called by no other name burst forth from ten thousand voices which we ever heard from mortal throats this strange and tremendous demonstration accompanied with leaping up and down tossing hats handkerchiefs and canes recklessly into the air with the waving of flags and with every other conceivable mode of exultant and unbridled joy continued steadily and without pause for perhaps ten minutes it then began to rise and fall in slow and billowing bursts and for perhaps the next five minutes these stupendous waves of uncontrollable excitement now rising into the deepest and fiercest shouts and then sinking like the ground swell of the ocean into hoarse and lessening murmurs rolled through the multitude every now and then it would seem as though the physical power of the assembly was exhausted and that quiet would be restored when all at once a new hurricane would break out more prolonged and terrific than anything before if sheer exhaustion had not prevented we don't know but that the applause would have continued to this hour without the scene was repeated at the first instant of realization in the wigwam a man on the platform had shouted to a man stationed on the roof hallelujah abe lincoln is nominated a cannon boomed the news to the multitude below and twenty thousand throats took up the cry the city heard it and one hundred guns on the tremont house innumerable whistles on the river and lake front on locomotives and factories and the bells in all the steeples broke forth for twenty-four hours the clamor never ceased it spread to the prairies and before morning they were afire with pride and excitement and while all this went on where was lincoln too much of a candidate as he told sweat to go to chicago yet hardly enough of one to stay away he had ended by remaining in springfield where he had spent the week in restless waiting and discussion he drifted about the public square went often to the telegraph office looked out for every returning visitor from chicago played occasional games of ball made fruitless efforts to read went home at unusual hours he felt in his bones that he had a fighting chance so he told a friend but the chance was not so strong that he could indulge in much exultation by friday morning he was tired and depressed but still eager for news one of his friends the hon james c conkling returned early in the day from chicago and lincoln soon went around to his law office upon entering says mr conkling lincoln threw himself upon the office lounge and remarked rather wearily well i guess i'll go back to practicing law 
as he lay there on the lounge i gave him such information as i had been able to obtain i told him the tendency was to drop seward that the outlook for him was very encouraging he listened attentively and thanked me saying i had given him a clearer idea of the situation than he had been able to get from any other source he was not very sanguine of the result he did not express the opinion that he would be nominated but he could not be quiet and soon left mr conkling to join the throng around the telegraph office where the reports from the convention were coming in the nominations were being reported his own among the others then news came that the balloting had begun he could not endure to wait for the result he remembered a commission his wife had given him that morning and started across the square to execute it his errand was done and he was standing in the door of the shop talking when a shout went up from the group at the telegraph office the next instant an excited boy came rushing pell-mell down the stairs of the office and plunging through the crowd ran across the square shouting mr lincoln mr lincoln you are nominated the cry was repeated on all sides the people came flocking about him half laughing half crying shaking his hand when they could get it and one another's when they could not for a few minutes carried away by the excitement lincoln seemed simply one of the proud and exultant crowd then remembering what it all meant he said my friends i am glad to receive your congratulations and as there is a little woman down on eighth street who will be glad to hear the news you must excuse me until i inform her he slipped away telegram in hand his coat-tails flying out behind and strode towards home only to find when he reached there that his friends were before him and that the little woman already knew that the honor which for twenty years and more she had believed and stoutly declared her husband deserved and which a great multitude of men had sworn to do their best to obtain for him at last had come end of section twenty one Section 22 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 The Campaign of 1860, Part 1. Thirty six hours after Lincoln received the news of his nomination, an evening train from Chicago brought to Springfield a company of distinguished looking strangers. As they stepped from their coach, cannon were fired, rockets set off, bands played, and enthusiastic cheering went up from a crowd of waiting people. A long and noisy procession accompanied them to their hotel, and later to a modest two-storied house in an unfashionable part of the town. The gentlemen whom the citizens of Springfield received with such demonstration formed the committee, sent by the Republican National Convention, to notify Abraham Lincoln that he had been nominated as its candidate for the presidency of the United States. The delegation had in its number some of the most distinguished workers of the Republican Party of that day, Mr. George Ashman, Samuel Bowles, and Governor Boutwell of Massachusetts, William M. Everts of New York, judge kelly of pennsylvania david k carter of ohio francis p blair of missouri the hon gideon wells of connecticut amos tuck of new hampshire carl schurz of wisconsin only a few of these gentlemen had ever seen mr lincoln and to many of them his nomination had been a bitter disappointment as the committee filed into mr lincoln's simple home there was a sore misgiving in more than one heart and as mr ashman their chairman presented to him the letter notifying him of his nomination they eyed their candidate with critical keenness they noted his great height his huge hands and feet his peculiar lankness of limb his shoulders drooped as he stood giving his form a look of irresolution his smooth shaven face seemed of bronze as he listened to their message and amazed them by its ruggedness the cheeks were sunken the cheekbones high the nose large the mouth unsymmetrical the underlip protruding a little irregular seams and lines cut and creased the skin in every direction the eyes downcast as he listened were sunken and sombre 
shaded by its mass of dark hair the face gave an impression of a sad impenetrable man mr ashman finished his speech and mr lincoln lifting his bent head began to reply the men who watched him thrilled with surprise at the change which passed over him his drooping form became erect and firm the eyes beamed with fire and intelligence strong dignified and self-possessed he seemed transformed by the simple act of self-expression his remarks were brief merely a word of thanks for the honor done him a hint that he felt the responsibility of his position a promise to respond formally in writing and the expression of a desire to take each one of the committee by hand but his voice was calm and clear his bearing frank and sure his auditors saw in a flash that here was a man who was master of himself for the first time they understood that he whom they had supposed to be little more than a loquacious and clever state politician had force insight conscience that their misgivings were vain why sir they told me he was a rough diamond said governor boutwell to one of lincoln's townsmen nothing could have been in better taste than that speech and a delegate who had voted against lincoln in the convention turning to carl schurz said sir we might have done a more daring thing but we certainly could not have done a better thing and it was with that feeling that the delegation two hours later left mr lincoln's home and it was that report they carried to their constituents but one more formality now remained to complete the ceremony of abraham lincoln's nomination to the presidency his letter of acceptance this was soon written the candidates of the opposing parties all sent out letters of acceptance in eighteen sixty which were almost political platforms in themselves lincoln decided to make his merely an acceptance with an expression of his intention to stand by the party's declaration of principles he held himself rigidly to this decision his first address to the republican party being scarcely one hundred and fifty words in length though so short it was prepared with painstaking attention he even carried it when it was finished to a springfield friend dr newton bateman the state superintendent of education for correction mr schoolmaster he said here is my letter of acceptance i am not very strong on grammar and i wish you to see if it is all right i wouldn't like to have any mistakes in it the doctor took the manuscript and after reading it said there is only one change i would suggest mr lincoln you have written it shall be my care to not violate or disregard it in any part you should have written not to violate never split an infinitive is the rule mr lincoln took the manuscript regarding it a moment with a puzzled air so you think i better put those two little fellows end to end do you he said as he made the change his nomination an accomplished fact the all-important question for mr lincoln was can i be elected six months before when he had asked himself can i be nominated he had been forced to reply not probable even the very morning of the nomination he had said despondently to a friend i guess i'll go back to practicing law but now when he asked himself can i be elected the answer he gave was far from uncertain with the tables of the popular vote since eighteen fifty six before him he reckoned his chances twenty-four states out of the thirty-three which then formed the union had taken part in the chicago convention these twenty-four states held two hundred and thirty-four of the three hundred and three electoral votes to be cast on how many of them could he depend in eighteen fifty six the first time the party had appeared in a presidential contest it had secured for fremont eleven states one hundred and fourteen electoral votes on these lincoln felt he could still count but that was not enough nor was it all the republicans claimed the growth of the party had been steady and vigorous since eighteen fifty six the whole country saw that if the chicago convention chose a presidential candidate acceptable to new jersey pennsylvania indiana and illinois those states would certainly go republican lincoln added their votes to the one hundred fourteen of the certain states 
it gave him one hundred sixty nine a respectable majority of the three hundred three which the electoral college would cast the tables were in his favor but that was not all in the situation which encouraged him lincoln saw that as his nomination in chicago had been largely the result of disagreement among the republicans so there was a possibility of his election being the result of quarrels among the democrats the national democratic convention had met in charleston south carolina on april twenty third from the opening the sessions were stormy one vital difference divided the body the south was determined that a platform should be adopted stating unequivocally that slaves could be carried into the territories and that neither congressional nor territorial legislation could interfere with them the democracy of the north was determined to adopt a platform in which douglas's doctrine of popular sovereignty was the central plank the time had been when the south had been thoroughly satisfied with the douglas theory that it was not so now was due largely to lincoln he had discovered that douglas in presenting his attractive dogma that the people of the state should be left to regulate their domestic concerns in their own way subject only to the constitution gave one interpretation in the south another in the north knowing that illinois would never consent to the doctrine as the south understood it nor the south to the northern notion lincoln forced douglas in eighteen fifty eight in a debate at freeport illinois to explain his meaning illinois was satisfied with the explanation but the south saw the deceit from the day of the freeport debate douglas's power in the south declined when the charleston convention met the southern democrats were fully determined to defeat the man who had so nearly persuaded them to a doctrine which he interpreted according to the prejudices of the section in which he spoke when a douglas platform was adopted by the convention they withdrew the upshot of this secession was that the two factions called fresh conventions to meet in baltimore in june there the northern democracy nominated as its candidates douglas and johnson a few days later the southern democrats named breckinridge and lane thus when lincoln was nominated his opponents were divided the opposition to him was still further weakened by the appearance of a sporadic party the constitutional union which in a vague and general platform shirked the very precise and vital question at issue and declared finally for the constitution of the country the union of the states and the enforcement of the laws this party nominated bell and everett known as the kangaroo ticket because the hind part was the stronger the tables were in his favor if his own party stood by him he felt sure of his election there was every sign that it would so far as i can learn he wrote his friend washburn a few days after the convention the nominations start well everywhere and if they get no back set it would seem as if they were going through the start of the nominations had in fact been very good nothing more jubilant could have been conceived than the reception given lincoln's name in the northwest there won't be a tar-barrel left in illinois to-night said douglas in washington to his senatorial friends who asked him when the news of the nomination reached them who is this man lincoln anyhow douglas was right not only the tar-barrels but half the fences of the state went up in the fire of rejoicing the demonstrations in the middle states and in the east were hardly less exultant there was a striking difference in them however in the northwest it was the candidate in the rest of the country the platform and the probability of its success which inspired the popular outbursts and this was inevitable so little was lincoln known outside of his own part of the country the orators at the ratification meetings of the east found it necessary to look up his history to tell their audiences who he was the newspapers printed biographical sketches and very meagre ones they were for up to this time almost no details of his life had been published these facts filled many a serious-minded republican with dismay to them there seemed but one explanation for the choice of lincoln over the heads of so many more experienced and distinguished men it had been a political trick 
born of the sentiment anything to beat seward i remember says a republican of eighteen sixty that when i first read the news on a bulletin board as i came down street in philadelphia that i experienced a moment of intense physical pain it was as though someone had dealt me a heavy blow over the head then my strength failed me i believed our cause was doomed the opposition press found in lincoln's obscurity abundant editorial material he was a third-rate country lawyer poorer even than poor pierce said the new york herald of course he would be a nullity if he were elected how could a man be otherwise who had never done anything but deliver a few lectures and get himself beaten by douglas in the campaign of fifty eight they hooted at his coarse and clumsy jokes declared that he could not speak good grammar and that all he was really distinguished for was rail splitting running a broad horn and bearing the sobriquet of honest old abe the snobbishness of the country came out in full he was not a gentleman that is he did not know how to wear clothes perhaps sat at times in shirt-sleeves tilted back his chair he could quote neither latin nor greek had never travelled had no pedigree the republican press took up the gauntlet to the charge that he would be a nullity the tribune replied a man who by his own genius and force of character has raised himself from being a penniless and uneducated flatboatman on the wabash river to the position mr lincoln now occupies is not likely to be a nullity anywhere and bryant answered all the sneering by a noble editorial in which he claimed mr lincoln to be a real representative man nevertheless the eagerness with which the republican press hastened to show that lincoln was not the coarse backwoodsman the democrats painted him showed how much they winced under the charges reporters were sent west to describe his home his family and his habits in order to prove that he did not live in low hoosier style they told with great satisfaction that he wore daily a broadcloth suit almost elegant they described his modest home as a mansion and an elegant two-story dwelling and they never failed to note that mrs lincoln spoke french fluently and that he had a son in harvard college when they could with reasonable certainty connect him with the lincolns of hingham massachusetts they heralded his good blood with pride and marshalled the lincolns who had distinguished themselves in the history of the country among the common people the jeers that lincoln was but a rail splitter was a spur to enthusiasm too many of the solid men of the north had swung an axe too many of them had passed from log hut to mansion not to blaze with sympathetic indignation when the party was taunted with nominating a backwoodsman the rail became their emblem and their rallying cry and the story of the rail fence lincoln had built a feature of every campaign speech and every country store discussion in a week after his nomination two rails declared to have been split by lincoln were on exhibition in new york and certain zealous pennsylvanians had sent to macon illinois asking to buy the whole fence and have it shipped east it was the rail which decorated campaign medals inspired campaign songs appeared in campaign cartoons there was something more than a desire to stand by the candidate in the enthusiasm at bottom it was a popular vindication of the american way of making a man more important to lincoln than any popular enthusiasm was the ratification given his nomination by the rival candidates what would they do the whole party held its breath until seward was heard from no man could have taken a crushing defeat more nobly he was at his home in auburn new york on may eighteenth the day of the nomination and when the news of lincoln's success was brought him his informer told him that there was not a republican to be found in town who had the heart left to write an editorial for the daily advertiser approving the nomination seward smilingly took his pen and wrote the following paragraph which appeared that evening no truer exposition of the republican creed could be given than the platform adopted by the convention contains no truer or firmer defenders of the republican faith could have been found in the union than the distinguished and esteemed citizens on whom the honors of the nomination have fallen 
their election we trust by a decisive majority will restore the government of the u s to its constitutional and ancient course let the watchword of the republican party be union and liberty and onward to victory a few days later seward went to washington where a number of disappointed and rebellious republicans called upon him to offer their condolence mr seward they said we cannot accept this situation we want you to bolt the nomination and run on an independent ticket mr seward smiled gentlemen he said your zeal outruns your discretion there are many of you giving this advice now say perhaps three hundred two weeks hence there would be one hundred and fifty and the next week fifty after that only william h seward no gentlemen the republican party was not made for william h seward but mr seward if he is worth anything for the republican party and i believe i have still work to do i must therefore decline to accept your advice i have had some experience of this kind i ran once as a candidate for the nomination to the governorship of new york i was defeated my friends wanted me to bolt and run independently but i declined my opponent who had received the nomination was defeated in the election i would have been defeated another year i did receive the nomination and i was elected but if i had consented in the first place to bolt the regular nominee i would never have received the nomination regularly a second time and so would never have been governor of new york seward wrote lincoln very soon congratulating him and promising support so did the other leading rivals the letters were grateful to lincoln holding myself the humblest of all those whose names were before the convention he wrote chase i feel in special need of the assistance of all and i am glad very glad of the indication that you stand ready with these congratulations and promises of support from his rivals came others from men not less known joshua giddings wrote lincoln an admirable letter on may nineteenth dear lincoln you are nominated you will be elected after your election thousands will crowd around you claiming rewards for services rendered i too have my claims upon you i have not worked for your nomination nor for that of any other man i have labored for the establishment of principles and when men came to me asking my opinion of you i only told them lincoln is an honest man all i ask of you in return for my services is make my statement good through your administration yours giddings lincoln soon saw that not only the strong men of his party were supporting him but that they were working harmoniously in an excellent organization the republicans all agreed with the tribune that the election of mr lincoln though it could not be accomplished without work was eminently a thing that could be done and they set themselves vigorously to do it as the party was composed largely of young men who felt that the cause was worthy of their best efforts great zest and ingenuity was thrown into the campaigning arrangements were immediately made for a systematic stumping of the whole country the speakers engaged were of a very high order among them being sumner seward chase cassius m clay greeley stevens many of the speeches were of more than usual dramatic interest such was sumner's great speech at cooper institute july eleventh on the origin necessity and permanence of the republican party it was the first speech sumner had made in public since the attack on him in the senate in eighteen fifty six and attracted immense attention seward made a five weeks trip through the west often speaking several times a day no one worked harder than charles schurz i began speaking shortly after the convention mr schurz once told the author and continued until the day of the election making from one to three speeches with the exception of about ten days in september when i was so fatigued that i had to stop for a little while i spoke in both english and german under the auspices of the national committee and not only in the larger towns but frequently also in country districts no speaker of the campaign touched the people more deeply young ardent aspiring said the new york evening post in speaking of mr schurz 
the romances connected with his life and escape from his fatherland his scholarly attainments and above all his devotion to the principles which cast him an exile on our shores have all combined to render him dear to the hearts of his countrymen and to place him in the foremost rank of their leaders beside this educational work on the stump was that by pamphlets after the campaign lives of lincoln and hamlin of which there were many the campaign tracts issued by the tribune were the most widely circulated documents there were several of these the most popular being carl schurz's speech on the doom of slavery and seward's on the irrepressible conflict there was at the same time of course an immense amount done in the press and much of it by the ablest literary men the united states has produced thus lowell wrote essays for the atlantic whittier verses for the tribune and the atlantic bryant greeley raymond bowles editorials for their journals the republican campaign of eighteen sixty had one distinguishing feature the wide awakes bands of torch-bearers who in a simple uniform of glazed cap and cape and carrying colored lanterns or blazing coal-oil torches paraded the streets of almost every town of the north throughout the summer and fall arousing everywhere the wildest enthusiasm their origin was purely accidental in february cassius m clay spoke in hartford connecticut a few ardent young republicans accompanied him as a kind of bodyguard and to save their garments from the dripping of the torches a few of them wore improvised capes of black glazed cambric the uniform attracted so much attention that a campaign club formed in hartford soon after adopted it the club called itself the wide awakes other clubs took up the idea and soon there were wide awakes drilling regularly from one end of the north to the other a great many fantastic movements were invented by them a favorite one being a peculiar zigzag march an imitation of the party emblem the rail fence numbers of the clubs adopted the rules and drills of the chicago zouaves one of the most popular military organizations of the day in the summer of eighteen sixty colonel ellsworth the commanding officer of the zouaves brought them east the wide awake movement was greatly stimulated by this tour of the zouaves almost all of the clubs had their peculiar badges lincoln splitting rails or engineering a flatboat being a favorite decoration for them there were many medals worn as well many of these combined business and politics adroitly the obverse advising you to vote for the rail splitter the reverse to buy somebody's soap or tea or wagons many of the clubs owned lincoln rails which were given the place of honor on all public occasion and the originals as the hartford wide awakes were called possessed the identical mall with which lincoln had split the rails for the famous fence it had been secured in illinois together with such weighty credentials that nobody could dispute its claim and was the pride of the club it is still to be seen in hartford occupying a conspicuous place in the collection of the connecticut historical society campaign songs set to familiar airs were heard on every hand many of these never had more than a local vogue but others were sung generally one of the most ringing was e c steadman's honest abe of the west sung to the air of star-spangled banner then on to the holy republican strife and again for a future as fair as the morning for the sake of that freedom more precious than life ring out the grand anthem of liberty's warning lift the banner on high while from mountain and plain the cheers of the people are sounded again hurrah for our cause of all causes the best hurrah for old abe honest abe of the west one of the campaign songs which will never be forgotten was whittier's the quakers are out give the flags to the winds set the hills all aflame make way for the man with the patriarch's name away with misgivings away with all doubt for lincoln goes in when the quakers are out in many of the states great rallies were held at central points at which scores of wide awake clubs and a dozen popular speakers were present the most enthusiastic of all these was held in mr lincoln's own home springfield on august eighth 
fully seventy-five thousand people gathered for the celebration by far the greater number coming across the prairies on horseback or in wagons a procession eight miles long filed by mr lincoln's door mr e b washburn who was with mr lincoln in springfield that day says of this mass meeting it was one of the most enormous and impressive gatherings i had ever witnessed mr lincoln surrounded by some intimate friends sat on the balcony of his humble home it took hours for all the delegations to file before him and there was no token of enthusiasm wanting he was deeply touched by the manifestations of personal and political friendships and returned all his salutations in that off-hand and kindly manner which belonged to him i know of no demonstration of a similar character that can compare with it except the review by napoleon of his army for the invasion of russia about the same season of the year in eighteen twelve end of section twenty two Section twenty three of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty The Campaign of eighteen sixty. Part two. From May until November, this work for the ticket went on steadily and ardently. Mr. Lincoln, during all this time, remained quietly in Springfield. The conspicuous position in which he was placed made almost no difference in his simple life he was the same genial accessible modest man as ever his habits as unpretentious his friendliness as great the chief outward change in his daily round was merely one of quarters it seemed to his friends that neither his home nor his dingy law office was an appropriate place in which to receive his visitors and they arranged that a room in the state house which stood on the village green in the centre of the town be put at his disposal he came down to this office every morning about eight o'clock always stopping on his way in his old cordial fashion to ask the news or exchange a story when he met an acquaintance frequently he went to the post office himself before going to his office and came out his arms loaded with letters and papers he had no regular hours for visitors there was no ceremony for admittance to his presence people came when they would usually they found the door open if it was not it was mr lincoln's own voice which answered come in to their knock these visitors were a strange medley of the curious the interested and the friendly many came simply to see him to say they had shaken hands with him numbers to try to find out what his policy would be if elected others to wish him success all day long they filed in and out leaving him some days no time for his correspondence which every day grew larger he seemed never to be in a hurry never to lose patience however high his table was plied with mail however closely his room was crowded with visitors he even found time to give frequent sittings to the artists sent from various places of the country to paint his portrait among those who came in the summer after the nomination were barry of boston hicks of new york conant of st louis wright of mobile brown and atwood of philadelphia jones of cincinnati mr lincoln took the kindliest interest in these men and later when president did more than one of them a friendly turn thus in march eighteen sixty five he wrote to seward in regard to jones and piatt that he had some wish that they might have some of those moderate-sized consulates which facilitate artists a little in their profession they in their turn never forgot him sitting over their easels by the hour in the corner of his office assigned them they got many glimpses into the man's great heart and nowhere do we get pleasanter pictures of mr lincoln in this period than from their journals to those who observed mr lincoln closely as he received his visitors one thing was apparent he always remained master of the interview while his visitors told him a great deal they learned nothing from him which he did not wish to give the following observations published in the illinois state journal in november eighteen sixty illustrate very well what happened almost every day in his office while talking to two or three gentlemen and standing up a very hard-looking customer rolled in and tumbled into the only vacant chair and the one lately occupied by mr lincoln mr lincoln's keen eye took in the fact but gave no evidence of the notice 
turning around at last he spoke to the odd specimen holding out his hand at such a distance that our friend had to vacate the chair if he accepted the proffered shake mr lincoln quietly resumed his chair it was a small matter yet one giving proof more positively than a larger event of that peculiar way the man has of mingling with a mixed crowd he converses fluently on all subjects illustrates everything by a merry anecdote of which article he has an abundant supply i said on all subjects he does not talk politics he passes from that gracefully the moment it is introduced hundreds seek him every week to get his opinion on this or that subject he has a jolly way of disposing of that matter by saying ah you haven't read my speeches let me make you a present of my speeches and the earnest inquirer finds himself the happy possessor of some old documents among his daily visitors there were usually men of eminence from north and south he received them all with perfect simplicity and always even on his busiest days found a moment to turn away from them to greet old friends who had known him when he kept grocery in new salem or acted as deputy surveyor of sangamon county one day as he talked to a company of distinguished strangers an old lady in a big sunbonnet heavy boots and short skirts walked into the office she carried a package wrapped in brown paper and tied with a white string as soon as mr lincoln saw her he left the group went to meet her and shaking her hand cordially inquired for her folks after a moment the old lady opened her package and taking out a pair of coarse wool socks she handed them to him i wanted to give you something mr lincoln she said to take to washington and that's all i had i spun that yarn and knit them socks myself thanking her warmly mr lincoln took the socks and holding them up by the toes one in each hand he turned to the astonished celebrities and said in a voice full of kindly amusement the lady got my latitude and longitude about right didn't she gentlemen the old lady was not the only one however who gave mr lincoln something to carry to washington from the time of his nomination gifts poured in on him many of these came in the form of wearing apparel mr george lincoln of brooklyn who in january carried a handsome silk hat to the president-elect the gift of a new york hatter says that in receiving the hat mr lincoln laughed heartily over the gifts of clothing and remarked to mrs lincoln well wife if nothing else comes out of this scrape we are going to have some new clothes are we not to those who observed mr lincoln superficially in this period it might have seemed that he was doing nothing of any value to himself or to his party certainly he was taking no active part in the campaign he was making no speeches writing no letters giving no interviews this policy of silence he had adopted at the outset the very night of his nomination his townspeople in serenading him had called for a speech standing in the doorway of his house he said to them that he did not suppose the honor of such a visit was intended particularly for himself as a private citizen but rather as the representative of a great party that as to his position on the political questions of the day he could only refer them to his previous speeches and added fellow citizens and friends the time comes upon every public man when it is best for him to keep his lips closed that time has come upon me when in august the monster mass meeting was held in springfield every effort was made to persuade mr lincoln to speak all he would consent to do was to appear and in a few words excuse himself up to the time he left for washington to be inaugurated he kept his resolve nor would he write letters explaining his position or defending himself so many letters were received asking his political opinion that he found it necessary soon after his nomination to prepare the following form of reply to be sent out by his secretary dear sir your letter to mr lincoln of blank and by which you seek to obtain his opinions on certain political points has been received by him he has received others of a similar character but he also has a greater number of the exactly opposite character the latter class beseech him to write nothing whatever on any point of political doctrine 
they say his positions were well known when he was nominated and that he must not now embarrass the canvas by undertaking to shift or modify them he regrets that he cannot oblige all but you perceive it is impossible for him to do so yours etc john g nicolay to one gentleman who asked him to write something disclaiming all intention to interfere with slaves or slavery in the states he replied i have already done this many many times and it is in print and open to all who will read those who will not read or heed what i have already publicly said would not read or heed a repetition of it if they hear not moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded through one rose from the dead and to another correspondent who suggested he set forth his conservative views he wrote i will not forbear from doing so merely on punctilio and pluck if i do finally abstain it will be because of apprehension that it would do harm for the good men of the south and i regard the majority of them as such i have no objection to repeat seventy and seven times but i have bad men to deal with both north and south men who are eager for something new upon which to base new representations men who would like to frighten me or at least to fix upon me the character of timidity and cowardice they would seize upon almost any letter i could write as being an awful coming down i intend keeping my eye upon these gentlemen and to not unnecessarily put any weapons in their hands nor would he defend himself against the campaign stories which appeared in numbers one of which his enemies made much was that he had received two hundred dollars for the cooper union speech in february eighteen sixty they claim that as it was a political speech it was contrary to political etiquette to accept pay lincoln explained the affair in a letter to a gentleman who had been disturbed by it and added i have made this explanation to you as a friend but i wish no explanation made to our enemies what they want is a squabble and a fuss and they can have that if we explain and they cannot have it if we don't another foolish tale which caused lincoln's partisans unrest was that when he was a member of congress he had charged several pairs of boots to his stationary account and that they had been paid for out of public funds one of lincoln's friends took the trouble to examine the stationary account for the thirtieth congress and to publish a certified denial of the story lincoln's silence and inactivity were merely external as a matter of fact no one was busier than he no one was following more intently and thoughtfully the gradual development of the situation and the daily fluctuation of opinion by correspondence from the press through his visitors many of whom came to springfield at his request he kept himself informed of how the campaign was going from maine to california whenever he feared a break in the ranks he put in a word of warning or of advice he warned thurlow weed that douglas was managing the bell element with great adroitness he cautioned hannibal hamlin against a break the latter feared in maine such a result as you seem to predict in maine he wrote would i fear put us on the downhill track lose us the state elections in pennsylvania and indiana and probably ruin us on the main turn in november while he gave the strictest attention to the progress of the elections all over the country he managed to keep above local issues and to hold himself aloof from the personal contests and rivalries within the party in fact lincoln kept in perfect touch with the progress of his party from may to november and was able to say at any time with accuracy just what his chances were in each state he seems at no time to have had any serious fear that he would be defeated there was a tragic side to this very certainty of election which lincoln felt deeply in the convention which had nominated him nine states of the union had not been represented if he should be elected these states would have no voice in his choice he knew that he was pledged to a platform whose principles these states stigmatized as deception and fraud and that if elected he must deny what they claimed as rights he knew that in at least one state alabama 
the legislature two months before his nomination had pledged itself by an almost unanimous vote in case of his election to call a convention to consider what should be done for the protection of their rights interests and honor he knew that numbers of influential southern men were repeating daily with william l yancey i want the cotton states precipitated in a revolution or declaring with mr crawford of georgia we will never submit to the inauguration of a black republican president from may to november he watched anxiously for every sign that the south was preparing to make good the threats with which its orators were inflaming their audiences which a hostile press reiterated day by day which teemed in his mail and which brought scores of timorous men to springfield to advise and warn him how serious was it all he did his utmost to discover even writing in october to major david hunter to find out how much truth there was in the report of disaffection in a western fort i have a letter from a writer unknown to me he said saying that the officers of the army at fort kearney have determined in case of republican success at the approaching presidential election to take themselves and the arms at that point south for the purpose of resistance to the government while i think there are many chances to one that this is a humbug it occurs to me that any real movement of this sort in the army would leak out and become known to you in such case if it would not be unprofessional or dishonorable of which you are to be the judge i shall be much obliged if you will apprise me of it in spite of all that lincoln knew of the temper of the south in spite of his close study of events there through the summer of eighteen sixty he did not believe secession probable the people of the south have too much good sense and good temper to attempt the ruin of the government rather than see it administered as it was administered by the men who made it at least so i hope and believe he wrote a correspondent in august and in september he said to a visitor there are no real disunionists in the country there were reasons for this confidence in every state of the south there was a union party working to meet the crisis which lincoln's election was sure to produce many of the members sent him cheering letters in acknowledging such a letter in august lincoln wrote it contains one of the many assurances i receive from the south that in no probable event will there be any very formidable effort to break up the union then too lincoln had heard this threat of secession for so long that he had grown slightly indifferent to it he remembered that in the fremont campaign it had been employed with even more violence than now again in eighteen fifty eight the clamor of disunion had risen he believed that now much of the noise about disunion was merely political raised by the friends of breckinridge or douglas or bell to drive voters from him the leading men of the party sustained lincoln in this belief seward and schurz both confidently assured republicans in their speeches that they might vote for lincoln without fear and bryant in the evening post laughed at the conservative distresses of those who supposed that lincoln's election would cause secession and war reminding them that when jefferson was a candidate it was said his election would let loose the floodgates of french jacobinism and that henry clay had declared that nothing short of universal commercial ruin would follow jackson's election lincoln was sustained not only by the assurances of the union party of the south and by the buoyant hopefulness of the republicans of the north he had a powerful moral support in his own conviction that no matter what effort the south made to secede the north could and would prevent it he was and had been for years perfectly clear on this subject in the fremont campaign he had said in reply to the threat of disunion no matter what our grievance even though kansas shall come in as a slave state and no matter what theirs even if we shall restore the compromise we will say to the southern disunionists we won't go out of the union and you shan't it was then with the belief that he was going to be elected and that while his election would produce a serious uproar in the south that no successful resistance would follow that lincoln approached election day 
he had grown materially in the estimation of the country in the interval between may and november many of the leading men of his party who had deplored his nomination had come to believe him a wise strong man those who sought personal interviews with him and they were many went home feeling like thurlow weed who heartsick over seward's defeat and full of distrust not to say contempt of lincoln's ability visited him soon after the nomination at the earnest request of david davis and leonard sweat i found mr lincoln wrote weed afterward sagacious and practical he displayed throughout the conversation so much good sense such intuitive knowledge of human nature and such familiarity with the virtues and infirmities of politicians that i became impressed very favorably with his fitness for the duties with which he was not unlikely to be called upon to discharge this conversation lasted some five hours and when the train arrived in which we were to depart i rose all the better prepared to go to work with a will in favor of mr lincoln's election as the interview had inspired me with confidence in his capacity and integrity in the very south where a fury of prejudice had burst and where as was to be expected lincoln was popularly regarded as an odious and tyrannical monster much as later the north regarded jefferson davis there were signs that he was at least considered honest in his views it may seem strange to you wrote a kentuckian who was quoted by the new york evening post august seventeenth eighteen sixty but it is nevertheless true that the south looks for the election of lincoln by the people and would prefer him to douglas our most ultra-southern men seem to respect him and to have confidence in his honesty fairness and conservatism they concede that he stands on a moderate platform that his antecedents are excellent and that he is not likely to invade the rights of any one but they can't go for him because he holds opinions relative to the rights of slavery in the territories directly opposite to the southern view still he is an open and candid opponent and therefore commands southern respect some of the most interesting interviews which mr lincoln has had wrote someone to the baltimore patriot have been with extreme southern gentlemen who came full of prejudice against him and who left satisfied with his loyalty to all the constitutional rights of the south i could tell you of some of the most interesting cases but it is enough to know that the general sentiment of all southern men who have conversed with him is the same as that publicly expressed by mr goggin of virginia mr perry of south carolina mr mccray of north carolina and many others who have not hesitated to avow their intention of accepting mr lincoln's election and holding him to the constitutional discharge of the presidential office the most significant element in the estimate of lincoln which the country formed between may and november was the respect and affection which was awakened among the common people there sprang up all over the country among plain people a feeling for him not unlike that which had long existed in illinois the general distribution made of his speeches had something to do with this there was published in eighteen sixty in columbus ohio an edition of the lincoln and douglas debates of eighteen fifty eight which was used freely as a campaign document lincoln himself gave away scores of these books to his friends and to persons who came to him begging for an expression of his views Today, copies bearing his autograph are to be seen treasured volumes in the libraries of many public men the cooper union speech was published by the young men's republican club of new york and circulated widely to the hard-working farmer mechanic storekeeper who thought slowly but surely and whose sole political ambition was to cast an honest vote these speeches were like a personal face-to-face -face talk the argument was so clear the illustrations so persuasive the statement so colloquial and natural that they could not get away from them lincoln's right was the general verdict among masses of people who hesitating between republicanism and popular sovereignty read the speeches as a help to a decision while lincoln's speeches awakened respect for and confidence in his ability the story of his life stirred something deeper in men here was a man who had become a leader of the nation by the labor of his hands the honesty of his intellect 
the uprightness of his heart plain people were touched by the hardships of this life so like their own inspired by the thought that a man who had struggled as they had done who had remained poor who had lived simply could be eligible to the highest place in the nation they had believed that it could be done here was a proof of it they told the story to their boys this they said is what american institutions make possible not glitter or wealth trickery or demagogy or necessary only honesty hard thinking a fixed purpose affection and sympathy for lincoln grew with respect it was the beginning of that peculiar sympathetic relation between him and the common people which was to become one of the controlling influences in the great drama of the civil war election day in eighteen sixty fell on the sixth springfield although a town of strong democratic sympathy realized the importance of the occasion and by daylight was booming away with cannon before noon numbers of bands which came the citizens hardly knew from where were playing on the corners of every street mr lincoln as was his custom came down to his room at the state house by eight o'clock where he went over his big mail as coolly as if it were not election day and he a candidate for the presidency of the united states he had not been there long before his friends began to flock in in such numbers that it was proposed that the doors be closed and he be allowed to remain by himself but he said he had never done such a thing in his life as to close the door on his friends and that he did not intend to begin now and so the day wore away in the entertainment of visitors it had not been mr lincoln's intention to vote the obstacle which he found in the way being that his own name headed the republican ticket and that he did not want to vote for himself one of his friends suggested that his name might be cut off and he vote for the rest of the ticket he fell in with this suggestion and late in the afternoon when the crowd around the polls which were just across the street from his office had subsided somewhat he went over to cast his ballot he was recognized immediately and his friends were soon about him cheering wildly and contending good-naturedly for the opportunity to shake his hand even the democrats with their hands full of documents which they were distributing joined in this enthusiastic demonstration and cheered at the top of their voices for their beloved townsmen no returns were expected before seven o'clock and it was a little later than that when mr lincoln returned from his supper to the state house the first dispatches that came were from different parts of illinois the very first being from decatur where a republican gain was announced soon after alton which was expected to go for douglas sent in a majority of twelve for lincoln there was a tremendous sensation in the company and mr lincoln asked that the dispatch be sent out to the boys meaning the crowd which had gathered in and about the state house after an hour or more news began to come from missouri now said mr lincoln they should get a few licks back at us but to everybody's surprise there was more good news from missouri than had been expected towards midnight news began to come in from pennsylvania allegheny county ten thousand majority for lincoln philadelphia fifteen thousand plurality five thousand majority overall then a telegram from simon cameron pennsylvania seventy thousand for you new york safe glory enough this was the first news from new york and since ten o'clock the company had been waiting impatiently for it a fusion ticket it was feared might go through there and if it did the disaster to the republicans would be serious while waiting anxiously for something definite from new york a delegation of springfield ladies came in to invite mr lincoln and his friends to a hall nearby where they had prepared refreshments for all the republican politicians of the town the party had not been there long before there came a telegram announcing that new york city had gone republican such a cheering was probably never heard in springfield before the hall full of people beside themselves with joy began a romping promenade around the tables singing at the top of their voices the popular campaign song oh ain't you glad you joined the republicans here at intervals further telegrams came from new york all announcing large majorities 
the scene became one of the wildest excitement and mr lincoln and his friends soon withdrew to a little telegraph office on the square where they could receive reports more quietly up to this time the only anxiety mr lincoln had shown about the election was in the returns from his state and town he didn't feel quite easy as he said about springfield towards morning however the announcement came that he had a majority in his own precinct then it was that he showed the first emotion a jubilant chuckle and soon after remarked cheerfully to his friends that he guessed he'd go home now which he did but springfield was not content to go home cannon banged until daylight and on every street corner and in every alley could be heard groups of men shouting at the tops of their voices oh ain't you glad you joined the republicans twenty-four hours later and the full result of that tuesday's work was known out of three hundred three electoral votes lincoln had received one hundred eighty of the popular vote he had received one million eight hundred sixty six thousand four hundred fifty two nearly half a million over douglas a million over breckinridge a million and a quarter over bell it was a victory but there were facts about the victory which startled the thoughtful if lincoln had more votes than any one opposing candidate they together had nearly one million over him fifteen states of the union gave him no electoral votes and in ten states he had not received a single popular vote end of section twenty three section twenty four of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one mr lincoln is president-elect part one although the election of november sixth made lincoln the president-elect of the united states for four months he could exercise no direct influence on the affairs of the country if the south tried to make good her threat to secede in case he was elected he could do nothing to restrain her the south did try and at once with the very election returns the telegraph brought lincoln news of disruption day by day this news continued and always more alarming on november tenth the united states senators from south carolina resigned six weeks later that state passed an ordinance of secession and began to organize an independent government by the end of december the only remnant of united states authority in south carolina was the small garrison commanded by major anderson which occupied fort sumter in charleston harbor the remaining forts and batteries of that harbor the lighthouse tender the arsenal the post office the custom house in short everything in the states over which the stars and stripes had floated was under the palmetto flag in his quiet office in springfield mr lincoln read in january reports of the proceedings of conventions in mississippi florida alabama georgia and louisiana by all of which states in that month ordinances of secession were adopted in february he saw representatives of these same states unite in a general convention at montgomery alabama and the newspapers told him how promptly and intelligently they went to work to found a new nation the southern confederacy to provide it with a constitution and to give it officers mr lincoln observed that each state as she went out of the union prepared to defend her course if necessary on november eighteenth georgia appropriated one million dollars to arm the state and in january she seized forts pulaski and jackson and the united states arsenal louisiana appropriated all the federal property in her borders even to the mint and custom house and the money they contained georgia florida alabama and mississippi were not behind in their seizures and when the new government was formed at montgomery it promptly took up the question of defending its life mr lincoln was not only obliged to sit inactive and watch this steady dissolution of the union but he was obliged to see what was still harder that the administration which he was to succeed was doing nothing to check the destructionists 
indeed all through this period proof accumulated that members of mr buchanan's cabinet had been systematically working for many months to disarm the north and equip the south the quantity of arms sent quietly from northern arsenals was so great that the citizens of the towns from which they went became alarmed thus the springfield republican of january second eighteen sixty one noted that the citizens of that town were growing excited over the procession of government licenses which during the last spring and summer and also quite recently have been engaged in transporting from the united states armory to the united states freight station an immense quantity of boxes of muskets marked for southern distribution we find the paper continues that in eighteen sixty there were removed for safe keeping in other arsenals one hundred thirty five thousand four hundred thirty government arms this has nothing to do with the distribution occasionally made for state militia and when in december the citizens of pittsburgh pennsylvania found that one hundred twenty three cannon had been ordered south from the arsenal there they made such energetic protests that president buchanan was obliged to countermand the order of his secretary of war the rapid disintegration which followed the election of mr lincoln filled the north with dismay there was a general demand for some compromise which would reassure the south and stop secession it was the place of the republicans the conservatives argued to make this compromise a furious clamor broke over mr lincoln's head his election had caused the trouble now what would he do to quell it how much of the republican platform would he give up among the newspapers which pleaded with the president-elect to do something to reassure the south the most able was the new york herald lincoln was a sectional president declared the herald who out of four million seven hundred thousand votes cast had received but one million eight hundred fifty thousand and whom the south had had no part in electing if mr lincoln intends to carry on the government according to the principles laid down in the chicago platform and the documents issued under the authority of the republican national committee the inevitable tendency of his administration will be to encourage servile insurrections and to make the southern states still more uncomfortable within the union than they could by any possibility be without it if the new president recognizes the fact that he is not bound by the chicago platform the people having repudiated it if he comes out and tells the people that he will govern the country according to the views of the majority and not to serve the purposes of the minority all may yet be well mr lincoln must throw his pledges to the winds let his party go to perdition in its own way and devote himself to the service of the whole country it is mr lincoln's bounden duty to come out now and declare his views it was not only the opposition press which urged lincoln to offer some kind of compromise many frightened republican newspapers added their influence the appeals of thousands of letters and of scores of visitors were added to the arguments of the press lincoln however refused to express his views anew i know the justness of my intentions he told an interviewer in november and the utter groundlessness of the pretended fears of the men who are filling the country with their clamor if i go into the presidency they will find me as i am on record nothing less nothing more my declarations have been made to the world without reservation they have been often repeated and now self-respect demands of me and of the party which has elected me that when threatened i should be silent business was brought almost to a standstill throughout the north by the prospect of disunion it is an awful time for merchants wrote a correspondent to charles sumner worse than in eighteen fifty seven and if there is not some speedy relief more than half of the best concerns in the country will be ruined numbers of prominent men urged the president-elect to say something conciliatory for the sake of trade his replies published in nicolay and hayes abraham lincoln are marked by spirit and decision to one man of wealth he wrote on november tenth 
i am not insensible to any commercial or financial depression that may exist but nothing is to be gained by fawning around the respectable scoundrels who got it up let them go to work and repair the mischief of their own making and then perhaps they will be less greedy to do the like again and to henry j raymond the editor of the new york times he gave on november twenty eighth in answer to a request for his views what he called a demonstration of the correctness of his judgment that he should say nothing for the public on the twentieth instant senator trumbull made a short speech which i suppose you have both seen and approved has a single newspaper heretofore against us urged that speech upon its readers with a purpose to quiet public anxiety not one so far as i know on the contrary the boston courier and its class hold me responsible for that speech and endeavor to inflame the north with the belief that it foreshadows an abandonment of republican ground by the incoming administration while the washington constitution and its class hold the same speech up to the south as an open declaration of war against them this is just as i expected and just what would happen with any declaration i could make these political fiends are not half sick enough yet party malice and not public good possesses them entirely they seek a sign and no sign shall be given them at least such is my present feeling and purpose while refusing positively to express himself for the general public at this time lincoln wrote and talked freely to the republican leaders almost all of whom were busy with one or another scheme for quieting the distracted nation on the opening of congress a committee of thirty-three had been appointed by the house to consider the present perilous condition of the country and the republican members wished to know what mr lincoln would yield the hon william kellogg the illinois member of the committee wrote to him his reply dated december eleventh is unmistakable entertain no proposition for a compromise in regard to the extension of slavery the instant you do they have us under again all our labor is lost and sooner or later must be done over douglas is sure to be again trying to bring in his popular sovereignty have none of it the tug has to come and better now than later you know i think the fugitive slave clause of the constitution ought to be enforced to put it in its mildest form ought not to be resisted while the committee of thirty-three was seeking grounds for a settlement in the house a committee of thirteen was busy in the senate in the same search on the latter committee was william h seward and he too sent to mr lincoln for a suggestion in reply the president-elect sent mr seward by thurlow weed a memorandum which was supposed to have been lost until a few months ago when it was discovered by mr frederick bancroft in course of his researches for a life of seward two points are covered in this memorandum the first that the fugitive slave law should be enforced the second that the federal union must be preserved in a letter to the hon e b washburn written on december thirteenth lincoln again stated his views on slavery extension prevent as far as possible any of our friends from demoralizing themselves and our cause by entertaining propositions for compromise of any sort on slavery extension there is no possible compromise upon it but which puts us under again and leaves all our work to do over again whether it be a missouri line or eli thayer's popular sovereignty it is all the same let either be done and immediately filibustering and extending slavery recommences on that point hold firm as with a chain of steel these counsels were given while secession was still in its infancy the alarming developments which followed did not cause lincoln to waver on january eleventh he wrote to the hon j t hale a letter published by nicolay and hay in which he said what is our present condition we have just carried an election on principles fairly stated to the people now we are told in advance the government shall be broken up unless we surrender to those we have beaten before we take the offices in this they are either attempting to play upon us or they are in dead earnest either way 
if we surrender it is the end of us and of the government they will repeat the experiment on us ad libitum a year will not pass till we shall have to take cuba as a condition upon which they will stay in the union they now have the constitution under which we have lived over seventy years and acts of congress of their own framing with no prospect of their being changed and they can never have a more shallow pretext for breaking up the government or extorting a compromise than now there is in my judgment but one compromise which would really settle the slavery question and that would be a prohibition against acquiring any more territory it was not the north and the republicans alone that appealed to mr lincoln the unionists of the south urged him for an explanation which they might present to the people as proof that there was nothing to fear from his election lincoln had no faith that any expression of his would be heeded yet he did confidentially express himself frankly to many southerners who came to him in springfield and there are two letters of his published by nicolay and hay which show how completely he grasped the essential difference between the north and the south and with what justice and kindness he put the case to those who disagreed with him the first of these letters was written to john a gilmer a member of congress from north carolina who desired earnestly to preserve the union but not unless the opinions of the south were considered mr gilmer had written to mr lincoln asking his position on certain questions lincoln replied carefully read pages eighteen nineteen seventy four seventy five eighty eight eighty nine and two sixty seven of the volume of joint debates between senator douglas and myself with the republican platform adopted at chicago and all your questions will be substantially answered i have no thought of recommending the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia nor the slave trade among the slave states even on the conditions indicated and if i were to make such recommendation it is quite clear congress would not follow it as to employing slaves in arsenals and dockyards it is a thing i never thought of in my life to my recollection till i saw your letter and i may say of it precisely as i have said of the two points above as to the use of patronage in the slave states where there are few or no republicans i do not expect to inquire for the politics of the appointee or whether he does or not own slaves i intend in that matter to accommodate the people in the several localities if they themselves will allow me to accommodate them in one word i have never been am not now and probably never shall be in a mood of harassing the people either north or south on the territorial question i am inflexible as you see my position in the book on that there is a difference between you and us and it is the only substantial difference you think slavery is right and ought to be extended we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted for this neither has any just occasion to be angry with the other as to the state laws mentioned in your sixth question i really know very little of them i never have read one if any of them are in conflict with the fugitive slave clause or any other part of the constitution i certainly shall be glad of their repeal but i could hardly be justified as a citizen of illinois or as president of the united states to recommend the repeal of a statute of vermont or south carolina a week later mr lincoln wrote to a h stevens of georgia in reply to a note in which stevens had said the country is certainly in great peril and no man ever had heavier or greater responsibilities resting upon him than you have in the present momentous crisis i fully appreciate the present peril the country is in and the weight of responsibility on me do the people of the south really entertain fears that a republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with the slaves or with them about the slaves if they do i wish to assure you as once a friend and still i hope not an enemy that there is no cause for such fears the south would be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of washington i suppose however this does not meet the case you think slavery is right and ought to be extended while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted that i suppose is the rub it certainly is the only substantial difference between us 
the uproar which raged about mr lincoln soon became quite as loud over coercion as over compromise each passing week made conciliation more difficult saw new elements of disunion realized what was to be done with the seceding states what was to be done about the forts and arsenals custom-houses and post-offices they were seizing if mr lincoln would not compromise was he going to let the states and the federal property go or was he going to compel them to return with it did he propose to coerce the south though the president-elect refused to give any expression of opinion on the subject to the country it was not because he was not perfectly clear in his own mind secession he considered impossible my opinion is he wrote thurlow weed on december seventeenth that no state can in any way lawfully get out of the union without the consent of the others and that it is the duty of the president and other government functionaries to run the machine as it is when horace greeley began a series of editorials in the tribune contending that if seven or eight states sent agents to washington saying we want to get out of the union he should feel constrained by his devotion to human liberty to say let them go lincoln said nothing publicly though in springfield it was believed that he considered the policy dangerous and illogical he certainly was only amused at fernando wood's scheme to take new york city out of the union and make it a free city another hamburg i reckon he said to a new yorker in february in discussing the subject that it will be some time before the front door sets up housekeeping on its own account as to the forts and other federal property seized by the outgoing states he seems to have felt from the first that they were to be retaken in this matter he sought guidance from andrew jackson less than a week after his election a correspondent of the evening post found him engaged in reading the history of the nullifiers of eighteen thirty two and eighteen thirty three and of the summary way in which old hickory dealt with them in december he wrote to his friend e b washburn who had just reported to him an interview with general scott the commander-in-chief of the army on the dangers of the situation please present my respects to the general and tell him confidentially that i shall be obliged to him to be as well prepared as he can to either hold or retake the forts as the case may require at and after the inauguration and the very next day he wrote to major david hunter the most we can do now is to watch events and be as well prepared as possible for any turn things may take if the forts fall my judgment is that they are to be retaken from the foregoing letters it will be seen that mr lincoln had stripped his opinions on the questions of the day of all verbiage and non-essentials and reduced them to the following simple propositions one slavery is wrong and must not be extended two entertain no proposition for a compromise in regard to the extension of slavery three no state can in any way lawfully get out of the union without the consent of the others it is the duty of the president and other government functionaries to run the machine as it is four if the forts fall my judgment is that they are to be retaken to these simple statements he stuck throughout this period of confusion and distress refusing to allow them to be obscured by words and passion and making them his guide in the work of preparation for his inauguration three things especially occupied him in this preparation one making the acquaintance of the men with whom he was to be associated in the administration two his cabinet three his inaugural address the first letter lincoln wrote after his election was to hannibal hamlin the vice-president-elect asking for an interview the two gentlemen met at the tremont house chicago on november twenty third mr hamlin once gave to a friend mr c j prescott of new york an account of this meeting which mr prescott has written out for this work mr hamlin was for many years a member of the board of trustees of waterville college now colby university waterville maine on one of the annual commencement occasions i found him one afternoon seated on the piazza of the elmwood for the moment alone and unoccupied taking a chair by his side i said mr hamlin when did you first meet mr lincoln 
well said he i very plainly recall the circumstances of our first meeting it was in chicago some time before the inauguration i received a letter from mr lincoln asking me to see him before i went to washington so i went to chicago where i was to meet mr lincoln sending my card to mr lincoln's room i received word to come right up i found the door open and mr lincoln approaching with extended hand with a hearty welcome he said i think i have never met you before mr hamlin but this is not the first time i have seen you i have just been recalling the time when in forty eight i went to the senate to hear you speak your subject was not new but the ideas were sound you were talking about slavery and i now take occasion to thank you for so well expressing what were my own sentiments at that time well mr president said i this is certainly quite a remarkable coincidence i myself have just been recalling the first time i ever saw you it must have been about the same time to which you allude i was passing through the house and was attracted by some remarks on the subject of slavery from one of the new members they told me it was lincoln of illinois i heard you through and i very well remember how heartily i endorsed every point you made and mr president i have no doubt we are still in perfect accord on the main question the result of the chicago interview was a cordial understanding between the two men which lasted throughout their administration this was to be expected for they were not unlike in character and experience the same kind of democratic feeling inspired their relations with others both marched with the boys both were eminently companionable hamlin liked a good story as well as lincoln and told almost as many he had too the same quaint way of putting things like lincoln hamlin had been born poor and had had a hand-to-hand -hand struggle to get up in the world he had worked on a farm chopped logs taught school studied law at night in short turned his hand cheerfully and eagerly to anything that would help him realize his ambitions like lincoln he had gone early into politics and like lincoln again he had revolted from his party in eighteen fifty six to join the republicans a great many men were summoned to springfield by lincoln in order that he might learn their views more perfectly among those who came either by his direct or indirect invitation were edward bates thurlow weed david wilmot a k mcclure george w julian e d baker william sweeney horace greeley and carl schurz with many of them lincoln did not hesitate to talk over his cabinet thurlow weed says that when he visited the president-elect in december the latter introduced the subject of the cabinet saying that he supposed i had some experience in cabinet-making that he had a job on hand and as he had never learned that trade he was disposed to avail himself of the suggestions of friends the making of a cabinet he continued now that he had it to do was by no means as easy as he had supposed that he had even before the result of the election was known assuming the probability of success fixed upon the two leading members of his cabinet but that in looking about for suitable men to fill the other departments he had been much embarrassed partly from his want of acquaintance with the prominent men of the day and partly he believed because that while the population had greatly increased really great men were scarcer than they used to be the two members of his cabinet on whom lincoln fixed so early were seward and chase he wrote seward on december eighth asking permission to nominate him as secretary of state and saying it has been my purpose from the day of the nomination at chicago to assign you by your leave this place in the administration i have delayed so long to communicate that purpose in deference to what appeared to me a proper caution in the case nothing has been developed to change my view in the premises and i now offer you the place in the hope that you will accept it and with the belief that your position in the public eye your integrity ability learning and great experience all combined to render it an appointment pre-eminently fit to be made seward took three weeks to consider and finally on december twenty eighth wrote that after due reflection and much self-distrust he had concluded it was his duty to accept 
lincoln did not approach chase on the subject of the cabinet until some three weeks after he had written seward then on december thirty first he wrote him this brief note in these troublous times i would much like a conference with you please visit me here at once chase reached springfield on the evening of january third and lincoln in his informal way went to the hotel to see him chase afterward described the interview in a letter to a friend he said he had felt bound to offer the position of secretary of state to mr seward as the generally recognized leader of the republican party intending if he declined it to offer it to me he did not wish that mr seward should decline it and was glad that he had accepted and now desired to have me take the place of secretary of the treasury chase did not promise to accept only to think it over and so the situation stood until the appointment was actually made in march it was pennsylvania and the south that gave lincoln the greatest trouble pennsylvania he told weed any more than new york or ohio cannot be overlooked her strong republican vote not less than her numerical importance entitles her to a representative in the cabinet after a careful balancing of matters as he called it he concluded to appoint simon cameron as the pennsylvania cabinet member and on december thirty first he gave cameron who had been for three days in springfield discussing the situation the following letter honorable simon cameron my dear sir i think fit to notify you now that by your permission i shall at the proper time nominate you to the united states senate for confirmation as secretary of the treasury or as secretary of war which of the two i have not yet definitely decided please answer at your earliest convenience your obedient servant a lincoln cameron had scarcely reached home with his letter before those opposed to him in pennsylvania had frightened lincoln into believing that the lack of trust in cameron's political honesty which existed throughout the country would destroy faith in the new cabinet lincoln immediately wrote cameron that things had developed which made it impossible to take him into the cabinet later he assured Cameron that the withdrawal did not spring from any change of view as to the ability or faithfulness with which he would discharge the duties of the place, and he promised not to make a cabinet appointment for Pennsylvania without consulting him and giving all the weight he consistently could to his views and wishes. There the matter remained until March. Among conciliatory Republicans, there was a strong desire that Lincoln find a member of his cabinet in the South. It was believed that such an act would be taken as proof that the new president intended to consider the claims of the South. Lincoln did not believe the idea practical, and he showed the difficulties in the way very shrewdly by causing to be inserted on December 12th in the illinois journal a paper popularly called his organ the following short editorial we hear such frequent allusions to a supposed purpose on the part of mr lincoln to call into his cabinet two or three southern gentlemen from the parties opposed to him politically that we are prompted to ask a few questions first is it known that any such gentleman of character would accept a place in the cabinet second if yea on what terms does he surrender to mr lincoln or mr lincoln to him on the political differences between them or do they enter upon the administration in open opposition to each other the demand continued however we told lincoln in december that in his opinion at least two of the members of the cabinet should be from the south lincoln was doubtful if they could be trusted there are men in maryland virginia north carolina and tennessee replied weed for whose loyalty under any circumstances and in any event i would vouch well said lincoln let me have the names of your white blackbirds weed gave him four names mr seward a little later suggested several and mr greeley likewise sent him a list of five southerners whom he declared it would be safe to take into the official family of all those named lincoln preferred john a gilmer of north carolina and he invited him to come to springfield for an interview as late as january twelfth he wrote to seward i still hope mr gilmer will on a fair understanding with us consent to take a place in the cabinet 
i fear if we could get we could not safely take more than one such man that is not more than one who opposed us in the election the danger being to lose the confidence of our own friends mr gilmer did not accept mr lincoln's invitation to springfield however and nothing ever came of the overture made him the nearest approach lincoln made to selecting a cabinet member from the south was in the appointment of edward bates of missouri he was one of the men whom lincoln had decided upon as soon as he knew of his election and he was the first after seward to be notified a representative from indiana was desirable and caleb smith was put on the slate provisionally it was necessary too that new england have a place in the cabinet mr lincoln had three candidates all of whom he thought well tuck of new hampshire banks of massachusetts gideon wells of connecticut but he made no decision until after he reached washington about the middle of january eighteen sixty one lincoln began to prepare his inaugural address a more desperate situation than existed at that moment it would be hard to imagine thus far every peace measure had failed and the endless discussions of press and senate chamber were daily increasing the anger and the bewilderment of the people four states had left the union and the south was rapidly accepting the idea of separate nationality the north was desperate and helpless all the bitterness and confusion centered about lincoln a hundred things told him how serious was the situation the averted faces of his townsmen of southern sympathies the warnings of good men who sought him from north and south letters threatening him with death sketches of gibbets and stilettos in every mail but in spite of all these distracting circumstances when he thought it time to write the inaugural address he calmly locked himself up in an upper room over a store across the street from the state house where he had his office and there with no books but a copy of the constitution henry clay's speech of eighteen fifty jackson's proclamation against nullification and webster's reply to hayne he prepared the document wishing to have several copies of it he went to the general manager of the illinois state journal major william n belache now of san diego california to arrange for them major belache has prepared for this work a statement of the incident in relation to the printing of the draft of his first inaugural address my recollection is very clear that his manner was as free from formality and affectation as it would have been had he been ordering the printing of a legal document he merely asked me one day early in january eighteen sixty one if i could print his address in a certain style without its contents becoming known and upon being assured that i could do so he remarked that he would give me the manuscript in a few days not long after this he placed the momentous paper in my hands i had the work done at once under my personal supervision in a private room in the journal building by a trusted employee sworn to secrecy when it was finished i returned the manuscript to mr lincoln together with the twenty printed copies ordered one of which he himself gave to me and it has been retained in my possession ever since i may remark in passing that the manuscript was all in his own handwriting and was almost entirely free from alterations or interlineations he did not ask to see a proof reposing entire confidence in my careful supervision neither the original draft nor the printed sheets were ever out of my immediate custody for an instant during the time occupied in the printing and i doubt whether any of the score or more of typos employed in the journal office had even the slightest suspicion that this important state paper was then being put in type under the same roof with them be this as it may the secret was well kept although the newspapers employed every conceivable means to obtain a hint of its tenor and the whole country was in a state of feverish anxiety to learn what the policy of the new president was to be although lincoln met the appalling events which preceded his inauguration with an outward calm which led many people to say that he did not realize the seriousness of the situation he was keenly alive to the dangers of the country and to the difficulty of his own position 
so full of threats and alarms had his life become by the time of his election that the mysticism of his nature was awakened and he was the victim of an hallucination which he afterwards described to different friends among them noah brooks who tells the story in lincoln's own words it was just after my election in eighteen sixty when the news had been coming in thick and fast all day and there had been a great hurrah boys so that i was well tired out and went home to rest throwing myself down on a lounge in my chamber opposite where i lay was a bureau with a swinging glass upon it and here he got up and placed furniture to illustrate the position and looking in that glass i saw myself reflected nearly at full length but my face i noticed had two separate and distinct images the tip of the nose of one being about three inches from the tip of the other i was a little bothered perhaps startled and got up and looked in the glass but the illusion vanished on lying down again i saw it a second time plainer if possible than before and then i noticed that one of the faces was a little paler say five shades than the other i got up and the thing melted away and i went off and in the excitement of the hour forgot all about it nearly but not quite for the thing would once in a while come up and give me a little pang as if something uncomfortable had happened when i went home again that night i told my wife about it and a few days afterward i made the experiment again when with a laugh sure enough the thing came again but i never succeeded in bringing the ghost back after that though i once tried very industriously to show it to my wife who was somewhat worried about it she thought it was a sign that i was to be elected to a second term of office and that the paleness of one of the faces was an omen that i should not see life through the last term a far deeper significance than this touch of superstition is a look into the man's heart which judge gillespie a lifelong friend of lincoln left and which his daughter mrs josephine gillespie prickett of edwardsville illinois has kindly put at my service early in january judge gillespie was in springfield and spent the night at mr lincoln's home it was late before the president-elect was free and then the two men seated themselves by the fire for a talk i attempted said judge gillespie to draw him into conversation relating to the past hoping to divert him from the thoughts which were evidently distracting him yes yes i remember he would say to my references to old scenes and associations but the old-time zest was not only lacking but in its place was a gloom and despondency entirely foreign to lincoln's character as i had learned to know it i attributed much of this to his changed surroundings he sat with his head lying upon his arms which were folded over the back of his chair as i had often seen him sit on our travels after an exciting day in court suddenly he roused himself gillespie said he i would willingly take out of my life a period in years equal to the two months which intervene between now and my inauguration to take the oath of office now why i asked because every hour adds to the difficulties i am called upon to meet and the present administration does nothing to check the tendency toward dissolution i who have been called to meet this awful responsibility am compelled to remain here doing nothing to avert it or lessen its force when it comes to me i said that the condition of which he spoke was such as had never risen before and that it might lead to the amendment of such an obvious defect in the federal constitution it is not of myself i complain he said with more bitterness than i ever heard him speak before or after but every day adds to the difficulty of the situation and makes the outlook more gloomy secession is being fostered rather than repressed and if the doctrine meets with a general acceptance in the border states it will be a great blow to the government our talk then turned upon the possibility of avoiding a war it is only possible said mr lincoln upon the consent of this government to the erection of a foreign slave government out of the present slave states i see the duty devolving upon me i have read upon my knees the story of gethsemane where the son of god prayed in vain that the cup of bitterness might pass from him 
i am in the garden of gethsemane now and my cup of bitterness is full and overflowing i then told him that as christ's prayer was not answered and his crucifixion had redeemed the great part of the world from paganism to christianity so the sacrifice demanded of him might be a great beneficence little did i then think how prophetic my words were to be or what a great sacrifice he was called to make i trust and believe that that night before i let him go i shed some rays of sunlight into that troubled heart ere long he came to talk of scenes and incidents in which he had taken part and to laugh over my reminders of some of our professional experiences when i retired it was the master of the house and chosen ruler of the country who saw me to my room joe he said as he was about to leave me i suppose you will never forget that trial down in montgomery county where the lawyer associated with you gave away the whole case in his opening speech i saw you signalling to him but you couldn't stop him now that's just the way with me and buchanan he is giving away the case and i have nothing to say and can't stop him good night end of section twenty four section twenty five of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one lincoln as president elect part two but the time for going to washington was drawing near there had been considerable discussion about when he had better go so many threats had been made and so many rumors were in the air that the party leaders had begun to feel as early as december that the president-elect might never get to washington alive even seward optimist as he was felt that precautions had better be taken and he wrote lincoln from washington on december twenty eighth there is a feverish excitement here which awakens all kinds of apprehensions of popular disturbance and disorders connected with your assumption of the government i do not entertain these apprehensions myself but it is worth consideration in our peculiar circumstances that accidents themselves may aggravate opinion here habit has accustomed the public to anticipate the arrival of a president-elect in this city about the middle of february and evil-minded persons would expect to organize the demonstrations for that time i beg leave to suggest whether it would not be well for you keeping your own counsel to be prepared to drop into the city a week or ten days earlier the effect would be probably reassuring and soothing mr lincoln replied i have been considering your suggestions as to my reaching washington somewhat earlier than is usual it seems to me the inauguration is not the most dangerous point for us our adversaries have us now clearly at disadvantage on the second wednesday of february when the votes should be officially counted if the two houses refuse to meet at all or meet without a quorum of each where shall we be i do not think that this counting is constitutionally essential to the election but how are we to proceed in absence of it in view of this i think it is best for me not to attempt appearing in washington till the result of that ceremony is known the peace of the capital was however in good hands general scott the commander-in-chief of the army had even before the election seen the trouble coming and had pleaded with the administration to dispose of the united states forces in such a way as to protect threatened property early in january he succeeded in securing a guard for washington the fear that the electoral vote would never be counted partially subsided then and lincoln announced that he would leave springfield on february eleventh the fortnight before his departure he gave to settling up all his private business and saying good-bye to his old friends his stepmother was still living near charleston in coles county and thither he went to spend a day with her and to visit his father's grave the comfort and happiness of his stepmother had been one of his cares from the time he began to be self-supporting and in this farewell visit he assured himself that her future was provided for mrs lincoln who was now a very old woman and might naturally doubt whether she would live to see her son again was not concerned about herself at this time the threats which pursued lincoln had reached her 
and in bidding him good-bye she sobbed out her belief that she would never see him again that his life would be taken the same fear was expressed by many of lincoln's early friends who came to springfield to say good-bye to him in the multitude of partings which took place in these last days none was more characteristic than that with his law partner herndon the day before his departure mr lincoln went to the office to settle some unfinished business after those things were all disposed of writes mr herndon he crossed to the opposite side of the room and threw himself down on the old office sofa which after many years of service had been moved against the wall for support he lay for some moments his face towards the ceiling without either of us speaking presently he inquired billy he always called me by that name how long have we been together over sixteen years i answered we've never had a cross word during all that time have we he gathered a bundle of papers and books he wished to take with him and started to go but before leaving he made the strange request that the signboard which swung on its rusty hinges at the foot of the stairway should remain let it hang there undisturbed he said with a significant lowering of the voice give our clients to understand that the election of a president makes no change in the firm of lincoln and herndon if i live i am coming back some time and then we'll go right on practicing law as if nothing had happened he lingered for a moment as if to take a last look at the old quarters and then passed through the door into the narrow hallway herndon says that he never saw lincoln more cheerful than on that day and judge gillespie who visited him a few days earlier found him in excellent spirits i told him that i believed it would do him good to get down to washington i know it will he replied i only wish i could have got there to lock the door before the horse was stolen but when i get to the spot i can find the tracks mr lincoln and his party were to leave springfield by a special train at eight o'clock on monday morning february eleventh and at precisely five minutes before eight o'clock he was summoned from the dingy waiting-room of the station slowly working his way through the crowd of friends and townspeople that had gathered to bid him good-bye he mounted the platform of the car and turning stood looking down into the multitude of sad friendly upturned faces for a moment a strong emotion shook him then removing his hat and lifting his hand to command silence he spoke my friends no one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting to this place and the kindness of these people i owe everything here i have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man here my children have been born and one is buried i now leave not knowing when or whether ever i may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon washington without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him i cannot succeed with that assistance i cannot fail trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good let us confidently hope that all will yet be well to his care commending you as i hope in your prayers you will commend me i bid you an affectionate farewell a sob went through the listening crowd as mr lincoln's broken voice asked their prayers and a choked exclamation we will do it we will do it rose as he ceased to speak upon all who listened to him that morning his words produced a deep impression i was only a lad of fourteen says mr lincoln dubois of springfield but to this day i can recall almost the exact language of that speech we have known mr lincoln for many years wrote the editor of the state journal we have heard him speak upon a hundred different occasions but we never saw him so profoundly affected nor did he ever utter an address which seemed to us so full of simple and touching eloquence so exactly adapted to the occasion so worthy of the man and the hour although it was raining fast when he began to speak every hat was lifted and every head bent forward to catch the last words of the departing chief when he said with the earnestness of a sudden inspiration of feeling that with god's help he should not fail there was an uncontrollable burst of applause 
the speech was of course telegraphed over the country and though politicians sneered at it the people were touched he had appealed to one of their deepest convictions the belief in a providence whose help was given to those who sought it in prayer the new president they said to one another was not only a man who had struggled with life like common people he was a man who believed as they did in god and was not ashamed to ask the prayers of good men the journey eastward through illinois which now began was full of incident no better description of it was ever given than that of thomas ross a brakeman on the presidential train the enthusiasm all along the line was intense as we whirled through the country villages we caught a cheer from the people and a glimpse of waving handkerchiefs and of hats tossed high into the air there was a great rush to shake hands with mr lincoln though of course only a few could reach him the crowds looked as if they included the whole population there were women and children there were young men and there were old men with gray beards it was soul-stirring to see these white-whiskered old fellows many of whom had known lincoln in his humbler days join in the cheering and hear them shout after him good-bye abe stick to the constitution and we will stick to you it was my good fortune to stand beside lincoln at each place at which he spoke at decatur tolano and danville at the state line the train stopped for dinner there was such a crowd that lincoln could scarcely reach the dining-room gentlemen said he as he surveyed the crowd if you will make me a little path so that i can get through and get something to eat i will make you a speech when i get back i never knew where all the people came from they were not only in the towns and villages but many were along the track in the country just to get a glimpse of the president's train i remember that after passing bement we crossed a trestle and i was greatly impressed to see a man standing there with a shotgun as the train passed he presented arms i have often thought he was there a volunteer to watch the trestle and see that the president's train got over it in safety as i have said the people everywhere were wild everybody wanted to shake hands with lincoln and he would have to say my friends i would like to shake hands with all of you but i can't do it at danville i well remember seeing him thrust his long arm over several heads to shake hands with george lawrence walter whitney the conductor who went on to indianapolis told me when he got back that after lincoln got into a carriage men got hold of the hubs and carried the vehicle for a whole block at the state line i left the train and returned to springfield having passed the biggest day in my whole life it was nearly five o'clock in the afternoon before the party reached indianapolis where they were to spend the night an elaborate reception had been prepared and here mr lincoln made his first speech it was not long but it contained a paragraph of vital importance the discussion over the right of the government to coerce the south was at its height lincoln had never publicly expressed himself on this point in the indianapolis speech he said the words coercion and invasion are much used in these days and often with some temper and hot blood let us make sure if we can that we do not misunderstand the meaning of those who use them let us get exact definitions of these words not from dictionaries but from the men themselves who certainly deprecate the things they would represent by the use of words what then is coercion what is invasion would the marching of an army into south carolina without the consent of her people and with hostile intent toward them be invasion i certainly think it would and it would be coercion also if the south carolinians were forced to submit but if the united states should merely hold and retake its own forts and other property and collect the duties on foreign importations or even withhold the mails from places where they were habitually violated would any or all of these things be invasion or coercion do our professed lovers of the union who but spitefully resolve that they will resist coercion and invasion understand that such things as these on the part of the united states would be coercion or invasion of a state if so their idea of means to preserve the object of their great affection would seem to be exceedingly thin and airy
if sick the little pills of the homeopathist would be much too large for them to swallow in their view the union as a family relation would seem to be no regular marriage but rather a sort of free love arrangement to be maintained only on passional attraction the speech was warmly applauded by the republican press it was the sign they had been seeking from mr lincoln but to the advocates of compromise it was a bitter message the bells of st germain lac have at length tolled forth the signal for massacre and bloodshed by the incoming administration said the new york herald a long public reception in the evening a breakfast the next morning with the governor of the state another reception at the hotel and then at ten o'clock on the morning of the twelfth mr lincoln's party left indianapolis for cincinnati several of the friends who had come from springfield left mr lincoln at indianapolis but others joined him and the train was as full of life and interest as it had been the day before there was too the same succession of decorated cheering towns the same desire to see and hear the president at every station at cincinnati where the second night was spent and where a magnificent reception was given him lincoln made two brief addresses in that to the mayor and citizens he was particularly happy i have spoken but once before this in cincinnati he said that was a year previous to the late presidential election on that occasion in a playful manner but with sincere words i addressed much of what i said to the kentuckians i gave my opinion that we as republicans would ultimately beat them as democrats but that they could postpone the result longer by nominating senator douglas for the presidency than they could in any other way they did not in any true sense of the word nominate mr douglas and the result has come certainly as soon as i ever expected i also told them how i expected they would be treated after they should have been beaten and i now wish to recall their attention to what i then said upon that subject i then said when we do as we say beat you you perhaps want to know what we will do with you i will tell you so far as i am authorized to speak for the opposition what we mean to do with you we mean to treat you as near as we possibly can as washington jefferson and madison treated you we mean to leave you alone and in no way interfere with your institutions to abide by all and every compromise of the constitution and in a word coming back to the original proposition to treat you so far as degenerate men if we have degenerated may according to the examples of those noble fathers washington jefferson and madison we mean to remember that you are as good as we that there is no difference between us other than the difference of circumstances we mean to recognize and bear in mind always that you have as good hearts in your bosoms as other people or as we claim to have and treat you accordingly fellow citizens of kentucky friends brethren may i call you in my new position i see no occasion and feel no inclination to retract a word of this if it shall not be made good be assured the fault shall not be mine these conciliatory remarks were received with great enthusiasm the crowd rushing at him as soon as he had finished patting him on the back and almost wrenching his arms off in their efforts at showing their approval on wednesday morning mr lincoln left cincinnati for columbus although few stops were made he was kept busy receiving the committees and politicians who boarded the train here and there and who were indefatigable in their efforts to draw from him some expression of his views mr lincoln felt that to answer their questions would be the gravest indiscretion and he resorted to stories and jests in his efforts not to commit himself or offend his visitors the reports of his levity as more than one felt this practice to be were telegraphed over the country and bitterly commented upon by a large part of the press so far however as the stories mr lincoln told on his journey have come to us they contain quite as much political wisdom as a sober dissertation could have contained thus there was a great deal of discussion en route about the possibility of reconciling the northern and southern democrats mr lincoln was appealed to well he said 
i once knew a good sound churchman called brown who was on a committee to erect a bridge over a very dangerous and rapid river several engineers had failed and at last brown said he had a friend jones who he believed could build the bridge jones was accordingly summoned can you build this bridge asked the committee yes replied jones i could build a bridge to the infernal regions if necessary the committee was horrified but after jones had retired brown said thoughtfully i know jones so well and he is so honest a man and so good a builder that if he says he can build a bridge to hades why i believe it but i have my doubts about the abutments on the infernal side so said lincoln when politicians say they can harmonize the northern and southern wings of the democracy why i believe them but i have my doubts about the abutments on the southern side at columbus the brilliant receptions of indianapolis and cincinnati were repeated and here mr lincoln addressed briefly the state legislature one clause of his remarks proved to be most unfortunate allusion has been made to the interest felt in relation to the policy of the new administration in this i have received from some a degree of credit for having kept silence and from others some depreciation i still think that i was right in the varying and repeatedly shifting scenes of the present and without a precedent which could enable me to judge by the past it has seemed fitting that before speaking upon the difficulties of the country i should have gained a view of the whole field being at liberty to modify and change the course of policy as future events may make a change necessary i have not maintained silence from any want of real anxiety it is a good thing that there is no more than anxiety for there is nothing going wrong it is a consoling circumstance that when we look out there is nothing that really hurts anybody we entertain different views upon political questions but nobody is suffering anything this is a most consoling circumstance and from it we may conclude that all we want is time patience and a reliance on that god who has never forsaken this people a hostile press took the phrases there is nothing going wrong there is nothing that really hurts anybody nobody is suffering anything and used them apart from the context to prove that the president-elect did not grasp the situation at newark new jersey a week later just before the presidential party passed through a poster appeared in the town quoting these sentences and calling on the unemployed to meet at the station when mr lincoln's train arrived and show the president that they emphatically differed from these sentiments nothing came of this attempt to create a disturbance on thursday morning february fourteenth the presidential party was again en route this time bound for pittsburgh lincoln must have made this journey with a lighter heart than that of the day before for the danger that the counting of the electoral vote would be interfered with was now over the night before at columbus he had received a telegram which read the votes have been peaceably counted you are elected the ceremony had passed off without incident at pittsburgh where the night of the fourteenth was spent the president spoke to an immense crowd and as the issue in pennsylvania had been so largely protection it was to that doctrine that he gave his chief attention nothing could have pleased the iron city better the people were so wild with enthusiasm that it took the combined efforts of the police and militia to get the presidential party on the train and out of town from the hour that lincoln's coercion remarks at indianapolis reached the country he had received telegraphic congratulations and remonstrances at every stop of the train the remarks at columbus produced a similar result and he seems to have concluded at this point to make his future speeches more general at cleveland buffalo albany and new york there was nothing in what he said that his enemies could fasten on his journey from pittsburgh eastward was in no way different from what it had been previously there were the same crowds of people at every station the same booming of cannon gifts of flowers receptions at hotels breakfasts dinners and lunches with local magnates all along the route in the east as in the west the people were out everywhere there were flags and banners and mottoes 
the party in the train continued to change as it had done committees and leading citizens replacing each other in rapid succession none of these accessions aroused more interest among other members of the party than horace greeley who appeared unexpectedly at gerard ohio bag and blankets in hand and after a ride of twenty miles with mr lincoln departed at buffalo where mr lincoln spoke on saturday the sixteenth a bit of variety was infused into the celebration by the fulfilment of an election wager the loser was to saw a cord of wood in front of the american house and present it to the poorest negro to be found he accordingly appeared with a wagon-load of cordwood just before mr lincoln began his speech from the hotel balcony and during the address sawed vigorously the journey through new york state with the elaborate ceremonies at albany and new york city occupied three days and it was not until the evening of february twenty first that lincoln reached philadelphia the day had been a hard one he had left new york early had replied to greetings at jersey city and again at newark had addressed both branches of the new jersey legislature at trenton and gone through a formal dinner there and now though it was dark and cold he was obliged to ride in state through the streets of philadelphia to his hotel where hundreds of visitors soon were surging in to shake his hand the hotel was still crowded with guests when he was summoned to the room of one of his party mr norman judd there he was introduced to mr allen pinkerton who as mr judd explained was a chicago detective and had a story to lay before him pinkerton informed me said mr lincoln afterwards in relating the affair to benson j lossing that a plan had been laid for my assassination the exact time when i expected to go through baltimore being publicly known he was well informed as to the plan but did not know that the conspirators would have pluck enough to execute it he urged me to go right through with him to washington that night i did not like that i had made engagements to visit harrisburg and to go from there to baltimore and i resolved to do so i could not believe that there was a plot to murder me i made arrangements however with mr judd for my return to philadelphia the next night if i should be convinced that there was danger in going through baltimore i told him that if i should meet at harrisburg as i had at other places a delegation to go with me to the next place then baltimore i should feel safe and go on mr lincoln left mr pinkerton and started to his room on the way he met ward layman also a member of his party who introduced frederick seward the son of the senator mr seward who relates this story in the life of his father told mr lincoln that he had a letter for him from his father the letter informed mr lincoln that general scott and colonel stone the latter the officer commanding the district of columbia militia had just received information which seemed to them convincing that a plot existed in baltimore to murder him on his way through the city mr seward besought the president to change his plan and go forward secretly mr lincoln read the note through twice slowly and thoughtfully then looked up and said to mr seward do you know anything about the way this information was obtained no mr seward knew nothing did you hear any names mentioned did you for instance ever hear anything said about such a name as pinkerton no mr seward had heard no names mentioned save those of general scott and colonel stone i may as well tell why i ask said mr lincoln there were stories and rumors some time ago before i left home about people who were intending to do me a mischief i never attached much importance to them never wanted to believe any such thing so i never would do anything about them in the way of taking precautions and the like some of my friends though thought differently judd and others and without my knowledge they employed a detective to look into the matter it seems he has occasionally reported what he found and only to-day since we arrived at this house he brought this story or something similar to it about an attempt on my life in the confusion and hurly-burly of the reception at baltimore surely mr lincoln said mr seward that is a strong corroboration of the news i bring you he smiled and shook his head that is exactly why i was asking you about names if different persons not knowing of each other's work have been pursuing separate clues that led to the same result why then it shows there must be something in it 
but if this is only the same story filtered through two channels and reaching me in two ways then that don't make it any stronger don't you see after a little further discussion on the subject mr lincoln rose and said well we haven't got to decide it to-night anyway and i see it is getting late you need not think i will not consider it well i shall think it over carefully and try to decide it right and i will let you know in the morning the next day was washington's birthday the hauling down of the stars and stripes in the south and the substituting of state flags had stirred the north deeply the day the first palmetto flag was raised in south carolina a new reverence for the national emblem was born in the north the flag began to appear at every window in every buttonhole on january twenty ninth kansas was admitted into the union without slavery thus adding a new star to the thirty-three then in the field and for raising the new flag thus made necessary washington's birthday became almost a universal choice in philadelphia it was arranged that the new flag for independence hall be raised by mr lincoln the ceremony took place at seven o'clock in the morning mr lincoln's brief speech was one of the best received of all he made on the journey i am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing in this place where were collected together the wisdom the patriotism the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live you have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to our distracted country i can say in return sir that all the political sentiments i entertain have been drawn so far as i have been able to draw them from the sentiments which originated in and were given to the world from this hall i have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the declaration of independence i have often pondered over the dangers which were incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that declaration i have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the army who achieved that independence i have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this confederacy so long together it was not the mere matter of separation of the colonies from the motherland but that sentiment in the declaration of independence which gave liberty not alone to the people of this country but hope to all the world for all future time it was that which gave promise that in due time the weights would be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have an equal chance this is the sentiment embodied in the declaration of independence now my friends can this country be saved on that basis if it can i will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if i can help to save it if it cannot be saved upon that principle it will be truly awful but if this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle i was about to say i would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender it now in my view of the present aspect of affairs there is no need of bloodshed and war there is no necessity for it i am not in favor of such a course and i may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it is forced upon the government the government will not use force unless force is used against it my friends this is wholly an unprepared speech i did not expect to be called on to say a word when i came here i supposed i was merely to do something toward raising a flag i may therefore have said something indiscreet cries of no no but i have said nothing but what i am willing to live by and if it be the pleasure of almighty god to die by it was after returning from the flag raising at philadelphia that lincoln told his friends that he had decided to go on to washington at whatever time they thought best after his only remaining engagement was filled viz to meet and address the pennsylvania legislature at harrisburg that afternoon the engagement was carried out and late in the afternoon he was free it had been arranged that he leave harrisburg secretly at six o'clock in the evening with colonel Lehman the rest of his party to know nothing of his departure but mr lincoln did not like to go without at least informing his companions and asked that they be called i reckon they'll laugh at us jud he said 
but you had better get them together. Several of the party, when told of the project, opposed it violently, arguing that it would expose Mr. Lincoln to ridicule and the charge of cowardice. He, however, answered that unless there was something besides ridicule to fear, he was disposed to carry out Mr. Judd's plan. At six o'clock he left his hotel by a back door, bareheaded, a soft hat in his pocket, and entering a carriage was driven to the station, where a car and engine, unlighted save for a headlight, awaited him. A few minutes after eleven o'clock he was in Philadelphia, where the night train for Washington was being held by order of the President of the Road for an important package. This package was delivered to the conductor as soon as it was known that Mr. Lincoln was on the train. At six o'clock the next morning, after an undisturbed night, he was in Washington, where Mr. Washburn and Mr. Seward met him, and with devout thanksgiving conducted him to Willard's Hotel, there to remain until after the inauguration. There were still nine days before the inauguration, and nine busier days Mr. Lincoln had not spent since his election. He was obliged to make visits to President Buchanan, Congress, and the Supreme Court, and under Mr. Seward's guidance this was done at once. He received, too, great numbers of visitors, including many delegations and committees. The Honorable James Harlan of Iowa, at that time United States Senator, called on Mr. Lincoln on February 23rd, the day of his arrival. He was overwhelmed with callers, says Mr. Harlan, the room in which he stood, the corridors and halls and stairs leading to it, were crowded full of people, each one apparently intent on obtaining an opportunity to say a few words to him privately. It was in these few days before his inauguration that the great fight over the future cabinet was made. As we have seen, Lincoln had made his selections, subject to events, before he left Springfield. When he reached Washington, he sought counsel on his proposed appointments from great numbers of the leading men of the country. If they did not come to him, he went to them. Thus, ex-Senator Harlan, in an unpublished manuscript, Recollections of Abraham Lincoln, tells how the president-elect sounded him on the cabinet. A page came to me at my desk in the Senate chamber, writes Mr. Harlan, and said, The president-elect is in the president's room and wishes to see you. I confess that I felt a little flurried by this announcement. I had not been accustomed to being called in by presidents of the United States. Hence, to gain a little time for self-composure, I said to the little page, How do you know that the president-elect wishes to see me? Oh, said he, his messenger came to the door of the Senate chamber and sent me to tell you. All right, said I, you may tell the president's messenger that I will call immediately, which of course I did without the least delay. I was received by the president in person, who, after the ordinary greetings, offered me a seat, and seated himself near me. No one else was in the room. He commenced the conversation, saying in a half-playful, half-serious tone and manner, I sent for you to tell me whom to appoint as members of my cabinet. I responded, saying, Mr. President, as that duty under the Constitution devolves, in the first instance, on the President, I have not given to the subject a serious thought. I have no names to suggest, and expect to be satisfied with your selections. He then said he had about concluded to nominate William H. Seward of New York as Secretary of State, Edward Bates of Missouri for Attorney General, Caleb B. Smith of Indiana for Secretary of the Interior, Gideon Wells of Connecticut for Secretary of the Navy, Montgomery Blair of Maryland for Postmaster General, and that he thought he ought to appoint Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania and Salmon P. Chase of Ohio for the remaining two places, but was in doubt which one to offer Mr. Cameron, and would like to have me express my opinion frankly on the point. Well, said I, Mr. President, if that is the only question involved, I have not the slightest doubt that Mr. Chase ought to be made Secretary of the Treasury. And then I proceeded to mention, without hesitation or reserve, my reasons for this opinion. He thanked me cordially for my frankness. I took my leave. This interview lasted probably about ten or fifteen minutes. Not all of those with whom Mr. Lincoln talked about his cabinet professed, like Senator Harlan, to be satisfied with his selections. Radical Republicans, mistrusting Seward's spirit of compromise, besought him to take chase and drop Seward altogether, 
conservatives on the contrary fearing chase's implacable no compromise spirit urged lincoln to omit him from the cabinet seward finally on march second probably thinking to force lincoln's hand withdrew his consent to take an appointment he said later that he feared a compound cabinet and did not wish to hazard himself in the experiment this action brought no immediate reply from mr lincoln he simply left seward's name where he had placed it at the head of the slate the struggle over cameron's appointment which had been going on for more than two months now culminated in a desperate encounter the appointment of blair was hotly contested caleb smith's seat was disputed by schuyler colfax in short it was a day and night battle of the factions of the republican party which raged around lincoln from the hour he appeared in washington until the hour of his inauguration in spite of all the arguments and threats from excited and earnest men to which he listened candidly and patiently lincoln found himself on the eve of his inauguration with the cabinet which he had selected four months before unchanged this fact had it been known might have modified somewhat the opinion expressed generally at the time that the new president would never be anything but the tool of chase or seward or of whoever proved to be the strong man of his cabinet that is if he was ever inaugurated of this last many had doubts and even at the last hour were betting in the hotel corridors and the streets of washington that abraham lincoln would never be president of the united states End of section twenty five. End of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. Read by Chufi Galeazzi, Rohnert Park, California.